Welcome to Ethical Hacking for Beginners. My name is Gary Dewey. I am a computer security and forensics consultant. I am sys administrator and blogger for the Triple Cities Makerspace. If you do not know what a makerspace is, it's also known as a hackerspace. And we are a nonprofit organization dedicated to learning and education for the general public and making things and seeing how things work. I encourage you to check out a makerspace near you. I'm also a member of the Southern Tier Linux User Group. This is a group that discusses all things Linux, and I encourage you as well to see if there are any groups near you. I gave a presentation at B-Sides in Rochester 2016 called Cluster Raspberry Pi for Distributed Password Cracking using MPI John the Ripper, a password cracker. I took sixth place in the New York State Cyber Aces Governor Cup competition in 2015. I attended the U.S. Cyber Challenge Cyber Camp at 2015 at Virginia Tech. And you can find more information in my blog at my website, www.garydewey.com. Welcome to Ethical Hacking for Beginners, the overview. We're going to split up this course into three sections, the first section being first steps. We're going to go over the basic terminologies used in ethical hacking and this course, and we will also cover operating systems and tools that we will use in this course. The second section, reconnaissance and scanning. In this section, we're going to go over what is reconnaissance, working with the tool Nmap, using the tool Shodan for scanning, and going over other types of reconnaissance. And finally, in our third step, we're going to exploit and sniff. In this section, we're going to go over some Metasploit basics for the tool Metasploit, exploiting a vulnerability, using the tool Armitage, using Aircrack NG Suite to crack Wi Fi, performing a man in the middle attack, using the social engineering toolkit, and finally working with Wireshark. Some prerequisites for this course are basic computer usage. And if you had some Linux familiarity, that would be great, although we will show you all the commands you need to use. You will also need VMware Player, and we will go over what operating systems and how to install them in our installation and setup videos. So I hope you join me, and we will learn the fun and fascinating world of ethical hacking. Welcome to Ethical Hacking for Beginners. In this section, we're going to take a look at some basic terminologies used in this course and also some operating systems that are used in this course. Basic terminologies. Data can be defined as the quantities, characters, or symbols on which operations are performed by a computer being stored and transmitted in the form of electrical signals. We can also call this information. Network. A network is multiple devices connected together to share resources or data. And a great example of a network is the internet. The internet is made of many devices connected together to share data. IP address. This stands for Internet Protocol Address. And version 4 is 32 bits with 4 octets starting at 0, .0, .0, 0.0.0.0 all the way up to 233.255.255.255. Since so many devices have started connecting to the internet, it was established that people were worried we were going to run out of addresses, and so a new standard was born, and it's 128-bit version 6. And this is four octets going from 000, 000 all the way to FFF. Now an example of an IP address, we can see in a Windows system, if I click on my uh, network box here, I click details right here, here we'll see my IP version 4 address, which is the 4 octets, 10.168.50.223, and I also have a version 6 address right down here for a local address. Right now, uh, IPv6 is not widely adopted as of yet into home systems but it's coming continuing on mac address this stands for media access control or physical address and this is six octets 
with the first three being an organization unique identifier. We can also see that in a Windows system by clicking on our network icon, clicking details, and this physical address right here. So the first three octets, 5C-AC-4C, I can look up online to see who the manufacturer of my network card is. Uh, MAC addresses can be important in ethical hacking because there are some systems that use MAC filtering and so if you do not have the right MAC address you cannot obtain a, an IP address and gain access to the network. Back to our terminology, malware is software intended to compromise, damage, or disable a computer, a program, or a system. And examples of these are a virus, some worms. Ports are interfaces or channels that are used to communicate between computers or devices. And ports range from 0 to 65,536, with 0 to 1024 being uh, the most popular port numbers for services, such as say for example port 22 SSH is commonly run on port 22. FTP is commonly run on port 21 and so on. Ethical hacking can be defined as testing computer and network security with permission and authorization to improve security of that system or network. A white hat hacker is an ethical hacker. A black hat hacker is an attacker with malicious intent and usually does not have permission to breach a system or a computer or a network. A penetration test, also commonly known as a pen test, is the evaluation of security of a computer or a system or its network by simulating an attack by a black hat hacker. Simulating meaning we are pretending to be a black hat hacker and gain access to these systems. A vulnerability is a flaw within a system or a network. You can think of this like a like it's a hole to get in. Exploit is a code or commands that take advantage of a weakness or a flaw within systems or networks to cause unexpected results, sometimes gaining unauthorized access. So this would be something that you put through the hole in order to get in to the system. In this course, we're going to go through a few phases of ethical hacking. Our first phase in section 1 is reconnaissance, which is gathering information of and on your target system, network, or devices. Scanning and enumeration. This is where we collect data, detailed information on the targets, and find vulnerabilities or weaknesses. And finally, we exploit those weaknesses and we penetrate in the system and or networks or devices. And once we're in, we can do something called sniffing. Sniffing is where we intercept network or host traffic. In our next video, we're going to be taking a look at operating systems used in this course. Operating systems and tools used. In this video, we're going to take a look at the operating systems we're going to use in this course and also some of the tools. The operating systems we're going to utilize in this course are Kali Linux, which is an open source Linux distribution tailored with tools for ethical hacking. You can visit www.kali.org for more information or to download it. We're also going to be using Metasploitable 2, which is an open source Linux distribution built intentionally vulnerable for ethical hacking practice purposes and to sharpen your hacking skills. You can visit the following website, sourceforge.net slash project slash metasploitable slash file slash metasploitable2 for more information. Some of the tools we're going to be using are Nmap, which is used for scanning open ports and identifying operating systems, Metasploit, which is used for injecting and launching exploits against targets to penetrate them, Armitage, which is a somewhat automated and a GUI version of Metasploit. Aircrack NG is a suite of tools used in wireless exploitation to break into wireless networks. It is a command line tool. The Social Engineering Toolkit, which is a suite of tools 
used for exploitation in various attack scenarios that involve a social vector of attack against the human element. And finally, Wireshark, which is used for inspecting network traffic or packets. In this video, we have gone over the basic terminologies used and we have also gone over the operating systems and tools that we are going to use in the course. In our next section, we're going to take a look at reconnaissance and scanning. Reconnaissance and scanning. In this section, we're going to take a look at what is reconnaissance, working with Nmap, Shodan for scanning, and other types of reconnaissance. What is reconnaissance? Reconnaissance is the gathering of information on targets to penetrate or exploit using various methods. In this course, we're going to break up ethical hacking into three phases. Reconnaissance being the first phase, scanning being the second phase, and finally, exploitation in the third phase. We're going to put reconnaissance and scanning in the same section. Reconnaissance can be further split into three separate sections. Passive footprinting, active footprinting, and vulnerability research. Passive footprinting is where we use public information to gain knowledge about our target. Usually going about with public information there's less likely of chance of you being picked up by your target that you're looking to gain access to them. So an example of this could be you can search the target website. Uh, for example for job listings let's say for example, there's a job listing for a certain uh, MySQL database engineer, and they list the version of MySQL. Now you know the version that the target uses of MySQL, and you can start to look for exploits based on that version of MySQL. Another example of passive footprinting is website mirroring or crawling. This is where you can download the target's entire website and find out a little bit more about how their website is structured perhaps. Look for vulnerabilities there or within their website. Another example of passive footprinting is email analysis. Uh, in this example we can take a look at the header information to gain some knowledge into our target. So website mirroring we can use HTTRAC website copier located at the following address www.htrack.com. This is an open source tool that you can see we can download an entire website and take a look at how it's structured. In email analysis we can take a look at the header information from an email that we may send to the target. In this example I have sent an email to Google and we can see in this example various IP addresses. We can see an MX record here and uh, we can see some, some DNS information here. Here's an ST, SMTP server here. It helps us gain information about topology perhaps. Active footprinting is where we take some more steps where we can actually get caught and we, we actually put a little more effort into pinging the target system. So examples of active footprinting are social engineering and human interaction. We can also do a DNS zone transfer uh, here. So social engineering and human interaction. An example of that would be calling to ask for information, calling the company up and pretending to be maybe perhaps a service employee or you know someone affiliated with that company to gain information. Another example of social engineering or human interaction is dumpster diving and that's where you actually go through the targets trash looking for documents with information on uh, you know network topology, passwords, that kind of thing. DNS zone transfer. So DNS stands for domain name server and uh, the domain name server on a network contains some valuable information, uh, contains records, and these records translate the names to IP addresses. This is handy information because it gives us a layout of the network's topology and we can see a little bit of how things are structured. And lastly, we'll go into vulnerability research. Vulnerability research is very important, and uh, this is where we actually look up the flaws that are within these systems that we can then attempt to penetrate. 
One great source is the National Vulnerability Database located at nvd.nist.gov. Here we can search for specific products that have known vulnerabilities. Another resource we can use for vulnerability research is CVE, located at the website www.cvedetails.com. And as you can see here, there are many different uh, vulnerabilities we can look up by vendors, by products. We can do a search for products. We can go by a score of the number of vulnerabilities and look up various information that way. Here's an example. Here's a Zen. Here's a vulnerability within the OS Zen. So we can look up these vulnerabilities and uh, attempt to find exploits to break in. And another great resource is Secure Team at http securiteam.com. You can see here we have featured articles on various products that have vulnerabilities. Cisco, Image Magic is a program that is listed here. Adobe Acrobat, Memory Overflow Vulnerability. Here we go, list what what systems are vulnerable. And I believe you can even sign on to a mailing list to get uh, emailed whenever a new vulnerability is listed. In our next video, we're going to be working with Nmap. Working with Nmap. In this video, we're going to take a look at what is Nmap, the TCP three-way handshake, ports, switches and options, and finally some demos. What is Nmap? Nmap is an open source tool that's free that we can use for port scanning. More information and to download the project can be found at nmap.org. There are downloads to a Windows program that also has a GUI called Zenmap. But we're going to be sticking to the command line version for now that's built into our Kali Linux distro. But I would highly recommend visiting the site and looking up the documentations. There are lots of valuable information here on what is scanning and uh, the various switches because there's a lot for this command. It's very powerful. So Nmap is a command line tool that we're going to use to tell whether or not targets are alive, which means they're connected to the network and we can talk to them, what ports they have open, which is another way of saying which services they're running. And this is important because we can find out if those services are vulnerable and we can use that to penetrate the system or the network. We can also use Nmap to sometimes find out what OS or operating system a target is running. Let's talk about the TCP three-way handshake. So TCP uses flags in the packets and some of these flags are the syn flag or synchronize which is used during initial communication, the acknowledge or ACK flag which is sent as an acknowledgement to the syn flag, the reset flag which forces a termination in communication, and a finish flag which is a graceful end to communication. So when two computers want to talk to each other they need to set up a communication channel. In TCP which is transmission control protocol this is done using sequence numbers. In this way, we can offer reliable connection-based communication. So how does this work? Well, the first computer sends out a packet with the SYN flag set and a sequence number to the receiving computer. The receiving computer sends back a packet with the SYN and the acknowledgement flag set and also its own sequence number. Finally, the sending computer sends back a packet with the acknowledgement set and both sequence numbers are updated. This sets up reliable communication-based communication with the sequence numbers being used. Let's talk about ports. Ports are network socket ports used for connections and go from numbers 1 to 65,535. Typically, services run commonly on used ports. Here is a list of commonly used ports 
and what services run on them. Once again, this is important because we can look up what port it is and usually find out what service and see if there's a vulnerable service that we can use to attack and gain access to the host or the network. So for example, port 22 is commonly used for secure shell. Port 21 commonly used for FTP service. And this goes all the way up to 1024 for commonly used ports. Let's talk about switches and options. So to use the command nmap, we're going to use the command line version. So we use the command nmap followed by options and or switches followed by the target. Now the target can be an IP address, a host name, it could even be a range of IP addresses. Let's look at some typical switches and options. So nmap-s capital A is an acknowledgement scan. So this is typically used to determine open ports on firewalls. Dash S capital P is a ping scan used to find live hosts. Dash S capital S is a SYN scan. So only the SYN flag is set, there is no three-way handshake. So it's a little less noisy of a scan. Dash S X capital X is a Christmas tree scan. It's known as this because all flags are set and it's said to be lit up like a Christmas tree. This scan might be allowed by stateless firewalls. Dash capital P capital T is a TCP ping scan and uh, this is important because it uses TCP instead of ICMP protocol which your host or target might be blocking. So let's go now and demo some of these commands. Go ahead and start up your virtual machine of Metasploitable 2 and your virtual machine of Kali Linux. Once you have those running we can take a look at Metasploitable 2 and we can log into Metasploitable 2 using msfadmin as the login and msfadmin as the password. Now if I type ifconfig I can get my IP address that I'm going to use to scan. Yours might be different from mine. Take note. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and get into our Kali Linux system. So boot up your Kali Linux VM if you have not already. And we're going to demo some of these commands. So go ahead and click on your applications. And we're looking for a terminal here. Actually, under information gathering, we have nmap, which opens up a terminal. And you'll see here, it shows the dash h or help file. So you can see here there's a lot of switches and options to use for this command. It's a very powerful command. And we can also see the man page like they request there. If I do man and map, then I get the manual, which shows us also how to use the command and map, your scan type, followed by your options and your target specification. And they also give examples in this man file. So you'll see here they're using a, another dash T. So the dash T stands for a timing template. And dash A is to enable OS and version detection. T4 is for faster execution. So the timing templates go from 0 to 5, which you can see here on my leaf pad down here. Timing templates 0 to 5, and the, the five different templates are paranoid, 0, which is the slowest, sneaky, 1, polite, 2. 3 is normal, so if you omit the option dash T, it will be the same as dash T3. Aggressive is a little bit faster, that's a T4. And insane assumes you have a excellent network connection and you're not worried about losing packets is uh, T5. You'll see we also have this option, dash capital O, to determine the OS. And we have some of our other scans that we talked about before. So the SYN scan, no three-way handshake. This is uh, sped up a little bit. ST scan, which is more reliable but also noisier. That's this guy, the ST. SS is a faster scan because it's half open. And there's our Christmas tree scan, SX. So let's go ahead back to our terminal here. And uh, I'm going to clear it out here. Make it a little bit bigger for you here. 
And let's go ahead and just run nmap with no options and see what we get with our host 192.168.111.128. You'll see it says starting nmap. So right now we didn't include a timing template, so you, this is the same as T3, and we don't have any, we're just using all default options. So it comes back saying that our host is up, and here are all the open ports and what services might be running on those ports. And here's the MAC address of our Metasploitable 2. And you'll see it took 12 seconds. Okay. So let's go ahead and try some of our other scan. So let's do a SYN scan. This one right here. So only the SYN flag set. There's no three-way handshake. So we're going to do NMAP. S, capital S. 192.168.111.128. And it's done. Okay, and you can see here we have the same information. Our target's up. These are the ports that are open and the services running on those ports, perhaps. We can also pipe out these commands to a file by using the greater than symbol. So I could look at these uh, results later on. So let's do a uh, TCP scan, and let's do OS and version detection. 192.168.111.128. And again, I don't have a uh, a dash T option or a timing template, so we're we're using the default. The reason why you might want to use a slower timing template is uh, if you slow down the traffic, perhaps there's less of a chance of if you're getting caught by uh, a security device that's on the network looking for stray or strange traffic, you might want to slow your scan down to avoid uh, being seen or heard. So right now we're scanning with TCP instead of ICMP, which might be blocked by a firewall or a device. And we also have this A option set, which is to determine OS and version type. So we should see that coming back. While that's running, let's go through our list again here of commands and options. So here it is. We're running this one, ST, which is the TCP scan with the three-way uh, handshake. It's the most reliable, but as I said before, it's noisy. In this case, if it's, it's our own system, so we don't really care about that. And we're doing dash A, which is also uh, determine OS and version. Alright, so looks like we're done here. And the reason why it took a little longer, as you can see, is it's determining the version of the services that are running. This is very handy for us because now we can go and look up vulnerabilities for, say, VSFTP version 2.3.4. We can look that up and try to find an exploit to use against this machine. Or OpenSSH version 4.7 P1. So this also gave us versions, right, of all these services that are running. Here you go, 5900 commonly used for VNC, VNC protocol 3.3 version. That's interesting information that could be useful for us. It also shows us that uh, Metasploitable 2 is Linux. That's the OS that's running. And it's kernel version 2.6.x. Kernel 2.6. So we could look up vulnerabilities for that as well. So if we wanted to do just straight OS and not version detection, that's when we would use the .o. So let's go ahead and use the .o. Let's make the scan a little fast, a little faster, and we'll do our SS scan. So if you remember, the .ss is faster because it's half open. Okay, so as you can see, that this was faster than the previous scan. It doesn't show us what versions are open on what services the ports are at, but it does just tell us that it's Linux 2.6 kernel, and uh, that's the OS. So in the interest of saving time, I'm not going to run a timing template uh, that's really slow. Um, except we could try this one a little faster with the timing template of uh, T6 here, or T5 rather. 
just to see if it's any faster. So this last one was 14 seconds. So let's see if this is any faster if we run with the, with the timing template of uh, 5, which is insane according to Nmap. Okay, and you can see it's 17 seconds. It was faster. And, uh, but we got a warning here, right? A retransmission cap hit. So we did get a warning, but, you know, we did get the scan back faster. So once again, I encourage you to look up Nmap's website, nmap.org, and to read the documentation there. You can also read further documentation on the manual pages, man and map, right, on different switches and options, because there are a lot. And it's a very, this is a very useful tool for us to use. So in our next video, we're going to be taking a look at Shodan for scanning. Welcome to Ethical Hacking for Beginners, Shodan for Scanning. In this video, we're going to take a look at what is Shodan and how to use Shodan. So what is Shodan? Shodan is an online database for internet connected devices and it's located at https www.shodan.io. So let's go there now. You can see that Shodan is listed as being a search engine for internet connected devices. This can be used in our scanning phase. So if you're new, you're gonna want to register with Shodan. That way you can get more results access to the developer API and new filters. So I already have a login. I'm going to go ahead and log in now. Now if I click getting started it will bring us to this explore page. So other people are using these search queries to find systems connected to the internet. We have different categories over here. Video games, databases, industrial control systems. So I'm going to click on industrial control systems. So you'll see here there's lots of different uh, industrial control system terms here. SCADA is a commonly used one, supervisory control and data acquisition, some common protocols that are used for these things. And if I click on explore, I can find hosts and uh, their IP addresses that are actually using these protocols and split out into this nice report here of what countries they're running in. I can filter it out by that by clicking on them. Here's all US ones. Tells me when they were added. Sometimes what state they're in. And if I click on their IP address, it tells me a little bit more information about them. What services they're running and what ports they're on. 5007, this one for instance. Let's go back to Explore and we can look up some other things here. So here's a common search for routers with the default password. So that's all what's coming up here and you'll see here it's almost using something called banner grabbing it looks like. So it grabs it, and this was in the banner, default password 1234, admin, and this is in Taiwan. So here's a router with an important banner message. See, it's doing a banner grabbing, and it says default and password are in here, and that's why this got selected, this system. Here, if I click on exploits, you can see it, it has 84, 84 exploits. Symantec messaging gateway. And this brings us right to uh, the report on Rapid7 of uh, the Symantec uh, vulnerability. If I click on maps, it will show us map all the things. You can get a map and it looks like this costs money. For $49, you can get all access to this to bring up a map of your searches. Let's go ahead and click on reports. And we don't have anything yet. It says we need to create a report. So let's go back to explore. 
we'll take a look at webcam. These are all webcams here. And here's where we can click create report title. I will put demo create report. Basically, I believe it will just bring up the same same report that we have here when we do a search. So your web server, so we click on it. Here it is, anytime, anywhere, web server. There's a username and password, not secure. We can go by ports here, go by ISPs. So this is handy for reconnaissance in our reconnaissance phase to find out more information about a target. So let's say server Google here. So I'm saying server Google. So perhaps these servers are Googles that we're looking up. This one says server Apache. So that's an important thing. I can find all the Apache web servers. Server Apache. There should be a bunch of these. There you go. Yeah, 22 million results. So 22 million from this uh, internet scanner are servers that are running Apache. And we can see there. Here's one from Amazon.com. So at this IP address, somebody is running a, looks like an Amazon Web Cloud uh, service. Was it on there? So once again, Shodan is handy that we can we can look up information about targets like server and Apache there. I think I can type Telenet and let's see what comes up for Telenet. 148,000 that have uh, Telenet in their banners or they might even be running Telenet as a service. And we can break this down, right? United States, there's 15,000. So once again, this is in the banner message. That's why it came up here. So it could be a Telenet server. It could be. It could also not be, and it's just in the banner message. But this is how Shodan works. It uh, it scans the internet for these various keywords and things, and then shows us that. Let's see if our report is in there. Here's our report from the demo. So our report shows the top countries, the top services, HTTP, there we go, and what ports they run on, the top organizations, right, or ISPs, the top domains. So it's just a simple report here for our, our SQ webcam report. There it is. So I could have made one for Apache. So once again, Shodan is used for scanning the internet for devices that are connected to the internet and uh, with keywords. So in our next video, we're going to be looking at some other types of reconnaissance. Welcome to Ethical Hacking for Beginners, Other Types of Reconnaissance. In this video, we're going to take a look at vulnerability scanning with a program called Nikto and vulnerability scanning with another program called Sparta. Let's talk a little bit about vulnerability scanning. So a vulnerability is a weakness that's in a computer, a system, or a network. This allows us to exploit that weakness and get into that computer or a system or network. So Nikto is a, a free program that is actually a web server vulnerability scanner. So it scans web servers and it finds vulnerabilities in the server itself. It finds cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. It also finds vulnerabilities in web applications like Gallery and various PHP applications. So if we go ahead and type nikto-h, that will list the help file. If we do a capital H, it will list the full help file. And then to run the command, we simply run nikto-h for host and then the IP address. This will run a scan on the default port of 80. So let's go ahead and do that in a demo right now. Go ahead and start up your virtual machines. And if you haven't already, log in to your Metasploitable 2 by typing msfadmin. And then if I do an ifconfig, I can find my IP address. Yours might be different from mine. Mine is this 192.168.111.128. 
Okay, now I'm going to go ahead, get into Kali Linux, if you haven't already booted it, and we simply open up a, a terminal window, just like this. And now if I go ahead and type nikto-h with nothing else, you'll see here's a simple help file. Again, our target host .h, and then this little plus sign means you need another variable, which is the, the host. We can output our results to a file that's important to use perhaps later. We can disable using SSL. There's a list of plugins we can use. Here we go for port, other, other than default 80, we can use a different port. And uh, there's some various other options here. So let's, as I said before, it says capital H for the full help text. So let's, let's go ahead and do a capital H and see what that looks like. So you can see you get a little bit more information here. It actually tells you a little bit more of uh, what variables you can use here. That's broken down a little further here. Displays. Show it on all displays. Save the output to a file and in this format. So we can output actually in different formats like an HTML file, a comma separated value file, for instance. Let's see, there's various other options here that we can use. All right, so we already ran Nmap earlier on uh, Metasploitable 2, and it was running a, a web server on the default port of 80. So let's go ahead and run Nikto against that, that web server. So Nikto.h and that IP address, 192.168.111.128, or whatever your IP address is for Metasploitable 2. You'll see a little banner, our Nikto version 2.1.6, as it starts the scan. So right now it is scanning that web server that's running on Metasploitable 2, and it's looking for vulnerabilities in that web server. It's looking for perhaps possible login pages. It, it will find those. It's looking for problems with PHP. As we said earlier, it's looking for cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, which is a common way to penetrate a network or a system. So you'll see it found a, a web server on port 80 and here it's, it's listing what web server it is. It's Apache 2.2.8 running on it thinks Ubuntu which is a Linux operating system. It gives us the version of PHP. This could be helpful. We could look that up for vulnerabilities. All right and it's telling us here cross-site scripting protection header is not defined. That means we might find some cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. Ooh, and now we have all kinds of information coming up. Okay, Apache 2.2.8 appears to be outdated. So it's a different, it's a, an older version of Apache. That's good news for us, probably. The doc directory is browsable. This may be USR slash doc. That's important info. We could probably get somewhere with that. Okay, here we have an OSVB 3092. This might be interesting. So again, it's looking for some PHP uh, vulnerabilities. The scan is still running. Okay, and our scan has finally finished. And you'll see it was, it was scanning PHP. It says here, PHP my admin directory has been found. And uh, it's for managing MySQL databases and should be protected or limited to authorized hosts. So that's something we can check out and see if it really is limited to authorized hosts. So that is Nikto. And uh, now we're going to go ahead and use a tool for vulnerability scanning called Sparta. Sparta is interesting because Sparta groups several tools together in one convenient user interface. And it has a GUI. And these are tools such as Nmap, Nikto is in there, Hydra, and a few others. So let's get back into our virtual machine, Kali, and I'm going to go ahead and type Sparta. And this will open up this nice GUI. So you'll see we have some options here to try blank passwords, try logging in as password, try login, loop around users. And we can even, we can have, uh, we can load a password list and a username list within this tool. 
to try to brute force various services, which will show up in this tab here, services. And we have an information tab on your host and some notes. Again, services will show up here and our various tools. So let's go ahead and click here to add our host. In this case, mine was 192.168.111.128. Okay, we're going to add it to the scope. And you'll see we get a little progress bar down here. That's showing that it's running Nmap right now on our host. And what time it started. And it says here our status is running. This is stage one. Okay, and now we're starting to get some results. Now it's running a stage two. And it's also running Nikto on port 80. And you can see port 80 is open, right? It's running Apache. We saw that earlier, uh, version 2.2.8. So we can click on various things here. Services, we see some other services that are running on Metasploitable 2. MySQL. Nikto earlier told us MySQL was, was a possibility. And here it is showing up on here. Oh, we're starting to get some more services on Metasploitable 2. FTP is open and running, it looks like. SSH is an open port and running. Telenet is open and running. So there's more services showing up now. And map stage four is running. You can see it's also trying uh, default passwords for our for FTP. So FTP default. Here we go. And uh, this is handy. So we click on here and we click this this tool here, FTP default, and it's running Hydra. And Hydra is trying these passwords. It's trying to log in with anonymous with the password Sparta.com. One valid password found. It says, okay. MySQL default is also running from Hydra. They log in root. And this also says one password found successful. Okay. Nikto. Here's, here's all our output from Nikto, like uh, from that other, you know, command terminal that we ran before. This is everything that, that output. It's now in this nice GUI right here. It's also running some other database stuff. Here's Screen Shooter. So, here we go. This is Metasploitable's web servers page and what it looks like a screenshot of it on port 80. Looks like SMTP is also running as a service on Metasploitable 2. So we're running another tool to try to crack that. So if we click on information, it gives us our MAC address, shows us that 12 ports are open. It's a Linux system. Kernel 2.6.9 and uh, notes, nothing in there, but we could type things in there if we wanted, right? I could type Metasploitable 2 just so that, you know, we have that information, any kind of note we want to put in there. Here's the uh, the results of Dicto from port 80. Here's a screenshot of port 80, so we don't have to type it in a browser. We just get it right here, what it looks like. Hydro running on SMTP. Zero results. MySQL, one valid password found from Hydra. There we go. That's probably useful information. Postgres, another database that Hydra is running, has found. FTP, another guy running and has been found. Okay. And now we're running Nmap stage four. So another cool feature is within these services here, and uh, there's our host detection, it's a penguin, so it's Linux. Well, we can right click on these and we can try to open them with Telnet, Netcat, open with an FTP client. We can send it to brute to try to brute force it. We can grab its banner, which is uh, another reconnaissance technique to try to see what version that program is and find vulnerabilities for that. So that's very interesting. SSH, we can do the same thing. We right click on it. We can we have a lot of options come up. Here's for our web server. We can right click that and there's all kinds of options that come up for that. SMTP. We get some options there and uh, to run various different tools. Here's MySQL. We get various tools for that. And uh cool thing is here we can we can save this information. We can save this as a Sparta project scan. 
and later on then we can go back and refer to it and look up vulnerabilities that were listed here or found. This is a, a very handy tool for reconnaissance and scanning. So here it's just a different view but we get kind of the same thing SSH we get the services here and, uh, and then we can right click over here and do various things there. Here's Telenet. You can open that with Netcat. Let's try that. You'll see it opens up a terminal. We can we can open that up with Telenet. There you go. So we're just trying to Telenet in. And there you go. You you see the Metasploitable 2 login here. And uh obviously this system is made to be, you know, hacked. So it gives us our login information right here. Normally a system probably wouldn't do that. So, but we can go ahead and, and log in the Telenet. And look, there we are. We're, we got a shell. We're in here. So it's running the last stage now. Nmap stage four. Yeah, once again, this is a very powerful tool. Very handy. Lists all these services and ports and combines, you know, Nmap and Nikto and, you know, Hydra and these various other programs so that we can scan for vulnerabilities. We can banner grab. course we can we can save our results save metasploitable 2 there we go let's save it right there on our desktop I'm going to replace it that file so now if I go ahead and, and exit out of here now if, if I start up Sparta again You'll see we're blank, but I can open up that file that I just created, Sparta 2. Here we go. My exploitable 2. And there's all our results from earlier. So say I didn't get a chance to research something. I, I have it all right here for when I have time to do it. In this section, reconnaissance and scanning, we went over what is reconnaissance. We worked with the tool and map. We worked over and showed how to use the tool Shodan for scanning. And we also went over other types of reconnaissance. I hope you'll join me for Section 3, Exploit and Sniffing. Very handy tool. Alright, in our next video we're going to be taking a look at Metasploit Basics. Welcome to Ethical Hacking for Beginners, Exploit and Sniffing. In this section, we're going to take a look at Metasploit Basics, Exploiting a Vulnerability, Armitage, Aircrack NG, Man in the Middle Attack, Social Engineering Toolkit, and finally, Working with Wireshark, Metasploit Basics. In this video, we're going to take a look at what is Metasploit and some basic commands to use for Metasploit. So first of all, what is Metasploit? Metasploit is an open source framework for exploits. What is an exploit? Usually it's code to take advantage of a flaw in a system or a program. This is what happens during a pen test when you try to penetrate a network or a host. And you can get more information by going to this website www.metasploit.com where you'll find a free download. It runs on Windows as well as Linux. And there's lots of information I encourage you to check out here. So let's look at some basic commands. Slash at C slash init.d slash post gresql start starts the database msf console will start up metasploit in any terminal window once you're in metasploit question mark can be used to show commands help or help command will show help or detailed help for a command search and then a value can use to search for payloads or modules use Module name will load a module to use for an exploit. Info module name will show information about a module. 
check is pretty useful. It will check if the target is vulnerable for that module. It's almost like a vulnerability scan sort of built into Metasploit. Show options will show the options that you may need to set for a module. Set and then the option that you want to set and then the value to set it to. Show payloads will display payload. A payload is code to run after an exploit is ran. In many cases it's code to run to open a shell from our target. Exploit which runs the exploit that you have chosen for a particular module and sessions will display active sessions. Let's go ahead and look at some of these commands. So if you go to your Kali Linux VM, start it up if you haven't already done so, and you can also start up your Metasploitable virtual machine. So we'll begin with etc init d and we will start up the database. Good. Now we will type msf console to start Metasploit. You can start Metasploit without starting the database, but it's handy to have the database there in case you want to save your results. And here we are. We are into Metasploit, which has these fun banners. This one happens to be that session one died of dysentery. It looks like it's the Oregon Trail. I could type banner, which is a fun command, and I'll get different banners to come up. There's a ninja. Okay, so let's go ahead and type our question mark and enter. And this gives you a list of commands. So we have our core commands here. Question mark, which we just used as a help menu. Banner, which I already showed you, displays an awesome Metasploit banner. CD, change current working directory. Communicate with the host for connect. Exit. Some pretty self-explanatory commands here. And I encourage you to read the help on any commands you are not familiar with or would like to become more familiar with. Sessions, we mentioned that before. Set. Set the context specific variable to a valuable to a value. And then we have some module commands on this way. Search, search is modules, there you go. Use a module, then we have job commands. Basically, you can start an exploit and run it as a job in the background while you issue other commands, which is very handy and useful. Then we have some database backend commands. That's what I was talking about earlier when we started the uh, SQL database service. We can import scan results from a vulnerability scanner. This is handy. Along with vari various other handy commands. All right, so let me go ahead and type help. We get that same, same screen. So let's go ahead and type help and a specific command. So we'll say sessions. And here is the help for the sessions command, which it lists out all the options to use for sessions. Sessions.l lists all active sessions. This is a command I use a lot of times. And various other commands in here that we can use. And here's an example of a, of a command here. Sessions-s, run a script. Check if it's a VM. That's their script they're using. Dash I. 1, 3, or 5, or sessions K, 1, 2, 5, and 5, and 6. Okay, so we can use search. Search, and this is for, to search various modules or exploits. So let's say FTP, for example. So here is a listing of exploits that are in the FTP directory. So the way this is mapped out is exploits are in directories in a directory structure according to OS and then programs after that and then it tells you the date, the rank, a little description of it. So you can see there's quite a few modules that have FTP in them. So this is where our reconnaissance comes in where we want to see what program if we can find out what specific program a target is using then we can look in here for an exploit to use to launch against 
that particular target. Very handy. So that's search. We can do info and just grab one of these uh, modules. So I'm just going to grab a module for... First let me do a search for VSFTP. That's a specific FTP program. There you go and we have an exploit right there. Here's the exploit listed for VSFTP, which stands for Very Secure FTP, which ironically it is not. So now if I type info and the module name, which is this, we'll get a little more information about this exploit. The name, the module, what platform it runs on, which is Unix. And here's some of the options we can set. Our host, which is the target address or remote host, our port, remote port, the target port. Here's a little description of this module, very handy, and its number and listing in the OSB database. Very handy to use. Once again, this is where reconnaissance and scanning comes into play to be very important. You don't want to attack a target with uh, multiple exploits. It's very noisy and you're not guaranteed to get in. So you need to investigate for specific programs and their vulnerabilities. Okay, so let's go ahead and type use and we're going to use this module. Whoop, not that. Use this guy, which if I highlight and I middle mouse click, it will paste it in there for me. And you'll see now that our command prompt has changed to this module, BS FTP module. So we're in there. So now if I type show options, we see the options for this particular module, which we saw in the info for that module. And I can set options in here. So I can set our host. And then the value, which is for me, 192.168.111.128.111.128. It would be whatever your Metasploitable 2 address is. Then I hit enter. And now, if I do show options, it will show me the current setting, which is what I just set it to, our Metasploitable 2 host. Very handy. So let's do show payloads. Okay, and our compatible payload with this module is a normal Unix command shell. It looks like sometimes if you're if you're attacking a a Windows host, there'll be different options here. Okay, and then let's just type sessions to show. Now, of course, we have no active sessions because we have not exploited anything. And uh, that will be coming up in our in our second video. So now we can type that check command. There you go. And see if our host is vulnerable. Apparently not all modules do not support the check. And this is one of them. Interesting. We can also run a, a scan inside Metasploit and add it to the database, the results. So let's go ahead and run scan against our host right now. I'll just run a quick one with the default options 192.168.111.128. You'll see we can run that. Blocking the probe, so we'll try this 192.168.111.128. Wanted to make sure I had the right host address. Let's see, this command is taking a little bit longer. Okay, I apologize. My VM was set to a different network. So once I fixed that, I ran nmap inside of Metasploit. And you can see here showing me the open ports for Metasploitable 2. And here's where we see FTP. And when we ran nmap earlier, in our reconnaissance phase, we found it was VSFTP. So in our next video, we're gonna go ahead and exploit a vulnerability.
Welcome to Ethical Hacking for Beginners, Exploiting a Vulnerability. In this video, we're going to take a look at exploiting a vulnerability and interacting with the target. So reconnaissance and scanning are an essential and important stage to finding the weaknesses or the flaws within a system, program, or network. Once we find those vulnerabilities, then we go ahead and we launch an exploit with a, a payload to penetrate those targets. So let's go ahead and do that now. If you haven't already started, start your virtual machines for Metasploitable 2 and Kali Linux. Once you're in Kali Linux, we're going to go ahead and start Metasploit. First, we need to start the database. Okay, then we're going to go ahead and type MSF console to start Metasploit. Okay, once we have Metasploit started up, we can go ahead and run nmap within Metasploit and we'll do an A here for OS and version detection on 192, 168, 111, 128 or whatever the IP address is for your virtual machine of Metasploitable 2. So what this is doing is the dash A is the switch to do OS and version identification of our target. This can help us find vulnerabilities and then we can select an appropriate exploit for that vulnerability. You can think of a vulnerability as like a hole, let's say a hole in a puzzle and the exploit is a piece designed to fit inside that hole. Alright, you'll see our nmap scan is done now and if we scroll up here we can see one of the first things here, FTP, is open and it gives us this version right here, VSFTP 2.3.4. So what we're going to do now is we're going to type search VSFTP. And you'll see we do have an exploit for VSFTP and our version matches, version 2.3.4, which is what our scan set up here from Nmap, version 2.3.4. So this exploit should work. So let's scroll down and we're going to type use exploit Unix FTP VS FTP and if I just start typing something and I hit tab it auto completes for me. Okay so now you can see our prompt change we're inside this module for VS FTP backdoor exploit. So we're going to go ahead and type show options. And you can see this particular exploit requires a few different variables. Our host, which is our remote host, and our port. You can see the current setting here for our port is 21, which is correct. We are seeing VSFTP on port 21 in, the, in our Nmap scan up above. We just need to fill out our, our host. So we're going to type set our host and our IP address, in my case, 192.168.111.128 or whatever your Metasploitable 2 IP address is. Okay, now if I type show options again, you'll notice in our current setting it has been changed to our IP address for Metasploitable 2. You'll also see we have this exploit target ID, which is automatic. We don't need to change anything there. We're good to go. Now if we type show payloads, we'll see what kind of payloads we have to launch after we exploit the target. So you see this particular payload is a command shell for Linux, pretty standard for, for a Linux operating system. We might have a few more options here for payloads if we were exploiting a Windows system. Some of those options could be a, you, maybe a command prompt shell back. Uh, we could get a, a meterpreter shell back, which is, you know, a, another way to interact with, with hosts. So we only have one payload here. That's going to be our default. We don't have to do anything there. So we're all set. Now we're going to go ahead and type exploit and run our exploit. And I'll do a dash J to make it a background job. So it's running it in the background. And you'll see we get a banner here confirming once again that the target's running VS FTP 2.3.4 and you'll see here our backdoor service has been spawned. Alright, and we did gain a shell, 
All right, so let's go ahead and type sessions L for list. And you'll see we do have we have one shell. All right, let's try to exploit this again. We'll we'll run it one more time here. Exploit J. So let's type sessions list. See we still have just the one session. And it looks like we can't run this again since we already have the the backdoor bind listener is already open and running. So let's go ahead and, and interact with this this shell. So we're going to type sessions i for interact and then the number or id which is one in this case. Okay, it says starting an interaction with one. We are now in a shell with our metasploitable two. So let's go ahead and type who am I. You'll see it comes back as root. Now just to make sure we're in our metasploitable two and not Kali Linux, let's do an if config to see what our, our IP address is. And you'll see mine came up with 192.168.111.128, which is our remote host or my metasploitable two IP address. So I'm I'm in that system right now. I can do an ls and I can see all the files and the directories. I can go to you know the uh, the web server here. www. Here we go. I'm now in the web server files. I can upload files here if I wanted to. I could you know download specific files or or read specific files. Right. There you go. If I do a cat php dot info php info dot php is a php file. You can see we're we're in this uh, other system here in Metasploitable two. See if I type users, you get msf admin and root. Those are the two users that are in this system. Now we can do you know various things here and try to capture data or whatever is our goal for the penetration of the system. Maybe you want to capture specific data, you know, maybe you were asked to gain access to specific data or something like that. Now we could go ahead and do it. So I'll type exit here. You'll see our command session has closed and it died from end of file error. Now if I type sessions L for list, you'll see we have no active sessions. We closed that shell. But I could go ahead again and exploit FTP again and open another shell. But this is just one example of of how to run an exploit. I mean, there were other services that we could try to go after and look for exploits on, and we'd go about that the same way. We'd search for for the exploit and search for the version, try to match it up, and try to try to gain access to the box. So some of those commands we use were sessions.l to list our active sessions or our shells and uh, sessions.i which we use to interact with the shell or sessions once we uh, got into them. In our next video we're going to be looking at Armitage. Armitage. In this video we're going to take a look at what is Armitage and how to use Armitage. So what is Armitage? Armitage is a graphical user interface for Metasploit. Go ahead and start up your virtual machines of Kali Linux and Metasploitable 2 if you haven't already. And we'll go over how to use Armitage. We can start it from any terminal window by first issuing the command slash etc slash init dot d slash P O S T G R E S Q L space start and then Armitage. Let's go ahead and try that now. This starts the database server required for Armitage to use. Next, I can type in Armitage. Then we get this box that says connect. Just go ahead and click connect and go ahead and hit yes here. Now we wait for Armitage to start up and connect to the server. You'll see we get some warnings, but the program finally starts up. I highly recommend going to help and clicking on the tutorial 
this should open up a web page that gives a nice tutorial on Armitage fast and easy hacking which explains some of what it is and how it works. Let's do a simple run through now with Metasploitable 2. So let's go ahead and click on our hosts and we're going to click add hosts 192.168.111.128 or whatever your IP address is for Metasploitable 2. Then click add. You get the message added one host. There it is. It shows up in this screen here. So I'm going to go ahead and right click it and click scan. We're now using auxiliary modules for Nmap to scan for ports. We can also ha add from an Nmap scan in this drop down right here. And in this case, we'll do a quick OS detection scan. So I'll type my host. You'll see here we could do this as a range as well and get multiple machines. So there you go. Nmap found these open ports on Metasploitable 2. And we get this box that says scan complete. And you'll see OS detection worked. And there's a picture of a penguin because it's a Linux operating system. Okay. So now we're going to go ahead and click under attacks and find attacks. So now Armitage is querying for exploits to run against these services that it scanned on our Metasploitable 2. You'll notice from our previous enumeration and scanning in the reconnaissance phase shows a lot of these same ports that are open and their versions. Okay, now we have the message, the attack analysis is complete. You will now see an attack menu attached to each host in the target window. So if we right click on our target, we now have an attack list. And we can attack these services. This is what it found for Metasploitable 2. So let's go ahead and look at FTP and let's see version 234 backdoor. I think that's what we have installed there. So I'll go ahead and click that. And you'll see this box pop up. L host stands for local host. L port is the port we're going to use to connect back on. You'll see here it provides some text up here about this exploit. Our host is our remote host, which is Metasploitable 2, and it's the port that it's on. We can also show advanced options here, and we can use a reverse connection, meaning we will get the target to open up a connection back to us. Let's go ahead and click launch and see if this exploit is successful. So a new tab opens up. It turns out our version was 234. That's what the banner came up with. And we are now successful. You'll see the picture here is, has showed lightning bolts around the computer. This means that we have successfully attacked and exploited Metasploitable 2 with this exploit. We also see here command shell session one opened we now have a session open so if I right click on here I can go to shell one and if I click interact I'm now in a shell in that machine so I can type ls to list what is in the directories that I'm in which looks like it's the root directory if I type in who am I that's the command I'm root I have root access to metasploitable 2 I'm in I can now do as I will with the system as root. So if I right click on here, I can also I can upload files to here to that machine. 
I have some post there's post modules I can use in here let's see what what that's all about I can make give give our uh, exploit persistence here there's all these modules I can use So let's go ahead and I want to show you we also have this Hail Mary now the Hail Mary is not is going to go ahead and launch all those vulnerabilities that it found on this one host and it says here as it says here there's nothing stealthy about this action so hundreds of exploits could be launched against one machine and you know maybe that's the only option you have left when you are penetrating a system but just know that this may not be the sneakiest way to do it so I'm gonna go ahead and click yes let's see how many shells we can get on this system so it is now querying the payloads for those exploits for Metasploitable 2 we have this new tab Hail Mary finding exploits for Metasploitable 2 to use I had paused the video briefly while we were going through all these exploits to save some time looks like it's just about finished okay we have found 447 exploits against Metasploitable 2 and now the Hail Mary is going to go ahead and launch all these exploits this is definitely not a quiet or a sneaky action as you can see it looks like many exploits are on port 80 against the web server almost done okay and now we're gonna list those sessions in 25 seconds that have been opened since launching all these exploits so if I right click now you'll see we have shell one we only have one one shell which I'll go ahead and disconnect from that was from our earlier attack sessions B P back door is still there. It looks like so far all we got is the one the one session from FTP. We launched all those exploits, and so far we don't have any any shells coming back from them yet. This would be the time that in this system I would try to gain credentials to maybe other systems and try to do something called pivoting, where I move laterally within the network that I'm trying to penetrate and gain other information and assets. Well, I encourage you to go ahead and play around with Armitage, read that tutorial. There are scripts you can use within Armitage. It's a very useful program and uh, it makes Metasploit easy, a lot easier to use. So as I said, when we laterally move, we would use these post modules here. There's various modules here that we we can use to gain credentials. Here's a here's one for pretty good privacy password credentials, SSH credentials. We can try to gain. Oh, there we go. There's another shell. So another shell open. So now if I type sessions dash v. We'll get some information about that shell shell 2 that was opened which exploit it was okay looks like shell 2 came from a PHP argument injection exploit that's right here excellent it just takes some time sometimes it takes time and I can go ahead and interact with this shell
Oop. Command shell four. We got some more. Some more opening up. Three, four. More shells are coming in from these exploits. Excellent. Here's shell two. So if I type in here, who am I? Okay, and shell two. I have penetrated as the user www data, and it looks like I'm in the directory for their web server. Makes sense since that was a PHP exploit. Let me type in sessions dash v. What these other shells are. Here's a miscellaneous shell. Shell three. Let's go ahead and see what kind of privileges we have on shell three. So I'll click interact. Type in who am I? Looks like I'm a demon. So let's type ls. Not really sure what directory we're in there. But essentially, I have system access. So yeah, I encourage you to go ahead and play around with Armitage. It's a it's a great program, and uh, along with Metasploitable 2, you can learn a lot running exploits against that. And in our next video, we're going to be looking at Aircrack NG. Welcome to Ethical Hacking for Beginners, Aircrack NG. In this video. We're going to take a look at what is Aircrack NG and using Aircrack NG to crack web encrypted Wi Fi. So, what is Aircrack NG? Aircrack NG is a command line tool that is used to inject or collect wireless packets. Now, an important note here is that we need real tech drivers in order for this to work to inject wireless packets. So, we need an alpha Wi Fi card. Now, since this is for beginners, we do have a simplified GUI to make things a little easier called Fern Wi-Fi Cracker. So let's go ahead and fire up our Kali Linux. And I have a demo router set up that's running web that we can try to crack. So we're going to go to wireless attacks here in applications, 8211, wireless tools, and right here to Fern Wi-Fi Cracker. Okay, we get a little pop-up, a professional version is available. I don't want to visit the website, and there is no new update available. And you can see here it is using Aircrack NG in the background. So we're going to go ahead and select our WLAN 0 interface, which is my alpha card. What this is doing right now is it's setting up a monitor mode interface, an interface there you go, named WLAN 0 MON in order to inject packets. Next we're going to hit scan for access points. And you'll notice now that we have one network that's WEP protected, detected, and one that's WPA detected. For this demo we're not going to be cracking WPA, but it's important to know that to, in order to crack WPA, you need to capture the handshake for one and number two in your password list you need to already have the password for that network in your list so let's go ahead and, and select our web and here you'll see ethical hacking demo this is my access point I'm gonna click automate here and you'll see down here it lists the details the the BSSID which is the MAC address of the access point what channel it's on is using WEP. We're going to do a regular attack and down here we're going to do an ARP request replay attack. Okay. Okay, so let's go ahead and hit this button up here, attack. So you'll see where thing, different things are lighting up here as it goes through different settings. We're associating with the access point. We've done that already. Now we're gathering packets and now we're injecting ARP packets. And this number here is uh, injection vectors. Usually this number needs to get to 10,000 before we can crack WEP. So this is going to take a little while. In the interest of saving time, I'm going to pause the video. But let's take a look behind the scenes at what's happening. So behind the scenes, that first button that we pressed was probably using Aircrack NG Start WLAN. This sets up your monitor mode interface. 
and probably in a separate process we use aerodump ng to start capturing packets for that specific access point. And then when we inject packets, we're using this command, this airplay ng command. Actually, it's this one down here with the uh, MAC address of our uh, access point and a MAC address of a client that's connected to the access point. And then finally, aircrack ng is the command that actually cracks the, the web or the PCAP file. So let's go back to our Kali Linux. You can see here we've, we've collected 700 packets. I'm going to open up a terminal here and try to speed things up perhaps. So using this command airplay ng and uh, 3 is the interval here and we're going to use this access point MAC address. This H is the host or the, uh, the client that's connecting that we're going to spoof our request from and our interface wlan 0 mon so I go ahead and hit enter there. You'll see now we are we are now injecting packets. And this number should be going a little faster now. Yes, it does appear to be going faster. But so this is a, a waiting game here now. Could take rather anywhere between five to ten minutes, maybe longer, depending on the access point and your packets and how complex your web encryption is that you're trying to break. I'm going to go ahead and pause. All right, so this took a little bit of time, but as you can see here, Fern Wi-Fi Cracker finally cracked it, the encryption, the web key. This is in fact my web key for the ethical hacking demo access point. So there you go. And now we have this key database. So in this database, we have our access point encryption web, and here's the key that has been saved. Alright, so in our next video, we're going to be looking at the man in the middle attack. Welcome to Ethical Hacking for Beginners, man in the middle attack. In this video, we're going to take a look at what is the man in the middle attack and how to run a man in the middle attack. So what is the man in the middle attack? In this version, we're going to be using something called ARP poisoning. ARP stands for Address Resolution Protocol. This is the protocol that matches MAC addresses with IP addresses or physical addresses with network addresses. So for instance, a computer might say, who has IP address 1.1.1.1? And your router will answer back, hey, MAC address or physical address, this has 1.1.1.1. Why don't you send your message there? So when we do ARP poisoning, essentially we're telling the devices that we are a different device and allowing that traffic to flow through us like an imposter. So man in the middle, we, we become a, a middleman passing off the packets, but also looking at them before we pass them off. Essentially like monkey in the middle, except we the, the monkey gets the ball first before it goes to the other side. So first, how to run a man in the middle attack, we're gonna wanna make sure our forwarding bit is turned on. And uh, then we're going to open up our, our EtherCap configuration file. We're going to set these two variables to zero. We're going to uncomment IP table commands. And finally, we're going to run EtherCap. So let's go ahead and, and open up a terminal here. And you can see I, I already have a... Uh, I already have a file here called IP forward. There you go. So I'm just going to run this script. Turn on forwarding. There you go. So if I cat proc sys net IPv4 IP forward, you'll see the value there is one. Okay, so we are forwarding packets. Essentially, this is telling the system, hey, if I get packets that aren't for me, why don't you send them on? Okay, so now let's let's type a G edit and our Etsy uh, eater cap and eater.conf. Okay, okay, here we go. So we set these variables to zero, which they already are. Excellent. 
then we're going to want to uncomment out the section on IP tables because that's what we are using. So here it is. If you use IP tables, which is right here, you want to delete the pound sign, which we already have. Okay, we have done. Good deal. We'd save. And now it's time to run editor cap. Oop, editor cap uh, G for GUI. There we go. Okay. Now we're going to want to sniff unified sniffing. We pick our proper interface that we're going to sniff on. In this case, we're going to sniff on the Ethernet. Okay. And now we're going to go ahead and scan for hosts. Okay. Down here it says we have four hosts added. So let's take a look at our hosts. You can see our Metasploitable 2 is on here. A virtual router is on here. Okay, now here's where we could have a target one and a target two if we wanted to look for a specific machine. But we're just going to sniff everything. So we're going to go to man in the middle, art poisoning, sniff remote connections. Okay, start start sniffing. You can see we're already started sniffing. Okay, and now we're we're seeing some activity down here. We can also view our connections here. Okay, and now we're capturing traffic in between. So now, if I go to my Windows machine here, buddy, there we go, buddy, and I'm gonna pick Telenet, and I'm gonna pick our 192.168.111.128. Opens up. There it is, okay. So we're gonna type in our MFS admin, MFS admin. And you'll see here, this is from the Windows computer that uh, we, just, we just captured those creds, those credentials right down here. So EaterCap was the man in the middle and it said, hey, I just captured a packet in clear text that says username MFS admin, password MFS admin. And now we have the creds for Metasploitable 2. Let's see what happens if we go to a web page on Metasploitable 2. 111, 128. Here we go. PHP my admin. Okay. Let's type in a, a username there and say user password, let's say, just for fun. Okay. Let's see if we pick the, anything up there. Uh, not seeing it there. MFS admin. MFS admin. See that? That didn't load either. But we could also get uh, clear text username and password from things on port 80 from the web server as well. So this is why it's important to use encryption between your devices because in order for us to be the man in the middle with encryption we would need the encryption key as well so that's one way to avoid a man in the middle attack is to use encryption another way is uh, to use Mac filtering and you want to filter out Mac addresses that makes it a little bit harder I mean we can spoof Mac addresses to match whatever your router is but it, it would make it a little bit harder to pull off a man in the middle attack. But this attack can be used on wireless gateways as well. Uh, so that could be quite dangerous if you're out at, say, a coffee shop or something like that. So you al always want to make sure if you're putting in password information that you're using encryption or HTTPS, you know. All right, so let's go ahead and stop our attack. Okay. You can also see these connections listed here. Here's port 80. View details. We can see all the all the connections listed there. And look, here's here's our session. If we double click on that, I can actually see what got sent and received here. So this is interesting, right? So I I can see that password that I put in right it's in here so that's that's very interesting p 
PHP admin. Here it is, password, password, username, user, right there. So there you go. If we just double click on it in connections, we can we can see what I typed in because we were in the middle. Once again, if, if this was HTTPS, we wouldn't be able to read that. In our next video, we're going to be taking a look at the Social Engineering Toolkit. Welcome to Ethical Hacking for Beginners, Social Engineering Toolkit. In this video, we're going to take a look at what is social engineering and the Social Engineering Toolkit, and then we're going to do a demo of using the Social Engineering Toolkit. Social engineering is when we exploit a human vulnerability. Humans generally want to help people, so we take this vulnerability into account and exploit it. You can have thousands of dollars worth of network equipment, but at the end of the day, humans are the weakest link in any network. Some of the attacks that take place are phishing and spear phishing. This is where we send a, an email to someone in hopes that they click a link. And spear phishing is where we make that email a little more pointed towards who we're sending it to. In other words, we send an accounting email to somebody that works in accounting, let's say, for example. Another social engineering attack is called credential harvesting. This is where we can set up a fake website in the hopes that someone will enter in their username and password, and then we collect that and we can use it later. And another vector for social engineering is the creation of infectious media. This is where we can create a file on a thumb drive and drop it in a parking lot in hopes that someone will take that thumb drive, put it in their computer, and then we run a program that connects back to our server and we're in. So let's go ahead now and open up our VMware workstation. And for this demo, we're going to click edit our virtual machine settings. We're going to go on our network adapter and we're going to change this to our bridged network connection. This way we can use our Windows machine to talk to our VMware operating system. So I'm going to go ahead and let this boot up. Okay, once your virtual machine has booted up, we're going to go ahead and open up a terminal window. Then we type SE Toolkit and enter. This will bring up our social engineering toolkit. Now, this also brings up the following menu we have social engineering attacks, penetration testing fast track, third party modules, update the social engineering toolkit, update social engineering toolkit configuration. Then we have help, credits, and about. So we're going to go ahead and type 1 and look at the social engineering attacks. This brings up another menu. In this menu, we have these options, spear phishing attack vectors, which as we said before is an email attack vector where we attempt to get our target to click on a link in an email, which opens up a connection back to our Kali Linux server. We have website attack vectors which examples of that various examples are we can collect credentials we can perform some java attacks and some various other attacks we also have infectious media generator this is where we create that usb drive with a program that connects back to our kali linux server once the target inserts the usb drive into their machine we can create a payload and a listener. We can do a mass mailer attack. We can do some Arduino based attack vectors. We can do some wireless access point attack vectors. We can do a QR code generator attack vector. This is used for uh, mobile phones primarily. We have an option for PowerShell attack vectors. We have an option for SMS spoofing attack vectors. This is where we can send text messages to targets and seem like it's coming from somewhere else. 
and then we have third-party modules. So for this demo, we're going to go ahead and do website attack vector. So we'll type 2 and hit enter. This brings up another menu, and you can see the various attacks that are somewhat explained up here at the top. We have a Java applet attack where we spoof a Java certificate and develop, uh, de deliver a Metasploit-based payload using that Java applet. We have a Metasploit browser exploit that uses select Metasploit browser exploits through an iframe and delivers a payload that way. We have the credential harvester method. So this is where we clone a website that has a username and a password field and when users type that in, we collect it. There is a tab nabbing method which waits for a user to move to a different tab then refreshes a page to something different. There's a web jacking attack method introduced by White Sheep. This utilizes iframe replacements to make the highlighted URL link appear legitimate. However, when clicked, a window pops up that is then replaced with a malicious link. There's a multi attack method which is a combination of these attacks. And finally, there's a PowerShell injection attack. So, for this demo, we're going to go ahead and do the credential harvester attack method. Uh, method. So type 3 and press enter. Now this brings up a menu where we can have web templates that are already built in for certain websites. Option 2 allows us to go clone any website. And 3 allows us to import our own website. So I'm going to go ahead and do one web, web templates. Okay, and now it's asking for our IP address that uh, you're going to get back in your harvester, meaning this, this computer, the Kali Linux host. So I open up another terminal and I type ifconfig, and here is the address I'm going to use, 192.168.108.160. So I type that in here, 192.168.108.160. You type in whatever you address you bring up for your demo then hit enter and now it asks us to pick a website template that we want to attack I'm gonna go ahead and say Twitter for this example okay and now social engineering toolkit is going out and cloning twitter.com and you can see here it's setting up a server that's running on port 80 so it's going to look like twitter.com but it's actually going to be our server that we are collecting login information. This may take a few minutes. And now we see here information will be displayed as it arrives below. So now in addition to this attack, if we got into the target's DNS and changed host records of twitter.com to point to our malicious IP address, it would appear to the user that they are going to the real site. However, since this is just a demo, we're going to type in 192.168.108.160. And if you see here, it looks like the Twitter sign in webpage. So I'll go ahead and type in my username here. And I'll type in my password for Twitter here. And then I click sign in. And here's an interesting thing. It actually takes us to the real Twitter website. So if that was indeed my username and password for, for Twitter, it does pass along those credentials to the real website. And it would appear to the user that nothing malicious happened. Now let's go back to our virtual machine. And you'll see here that we got a hit that's what it says here and here's our username that I typed in username and the password that I typed in to that field password which obviously is fake in this instance but this is just an example and you'll see here I also got a, a, a token so it does pass along that token to the real website after being logged in okay so this says when you're finished go ahead and hit control C to generate a report so we'll do that and now a report has been generated for our reading pleasure in the following directory so we'll hit enter here let's go take a look at that report so we'll go to places 
computer then we will go to root for dot set then we go to reports and you can see here is our report and here are our credentials for Twitter username password password all right within this XML file so it has indeed been saved we also have an HTML file so let's go ahead and open that and see what that looks like so here is a, a little bit fancier report and you can see here twitter.com was our URL that we spoofed here's the username username and password if we had more users that would show up here as well so it's just a little fancier looking report than our XML file so there are many other attack methods here that we can try in social engineering toolkit and I would encourage you to go ahead and experiment with them if you'd like to see more of the the method of generating an infectious media generator I have that on my website at www.garydewey.com and you can see how that works there that is with the old operating system backtrack though however it works the same way with Kali Linux that will conclude our demo of social engineering toolkit in our next video we're going to be looking at working with Wireshark welcome to ethical hacking for beginners working with Wireshark. In this video, we're going to take a look at what is Wireshark and how to use Wireshark. So what is Wireshark? Wireshark is an open source program that we use to capture packets and analyze them, Wi-Fi packets or Ethernet packets. You can download Wireshark from https www.wireshark.org slash pound download. It can be installed for Windows, and it's also built into our Kali Linux. I encourage you to take a look at the documentation on the website. Once again, this is a powerful tool with many options and can be used for many different things. Very handy. It can be complex, and uh, the documentation is the way to go. They even list some examples. Okay, so let's go ahead and fire up our Kali Linux VM if you haven't already and your Metasploitable 2 VM so I'm gonna go ahead and open up a terminal and I'm going to type Wireshark start the program and you'll see a nice GUI come up here and down here we got a little error here I'm running Wireshark as a super user okay that's okay and you'll see here is a list of our interfaces and some activity on those interfaces. Let's go ahead and capture any. You'll see we're starting to capture some packets here. Now let's go ahead and go back up to favorites and up a terminal. And here we're going to type telnet, our Metasploitable 2 address, mine in this case, 192.168.111.128. Okay, and there's our Metasploitable 2 login. So we go ahead and log in with MFS admin, MSF admin, and we're in. Okay, I can traverse to different places here. And it's just like a shell, just like I have a shell. Now I'm going to type exit, exit here. Now we'll stop our capture, and let's take a look at what we got. So you'll notice we have numbers here. We have a timestamp here, source, a destination, protocol, the length of the packet, and some info about the packets. Let's scroll down. One powerful thing about Wireshark is the ability to filter out certain packets. So we can click this little guy here, and this will help us with our filters. So we can display TCP only. We can display no ARP traffic. So let's go ahead and pick no ARP traffic. And then we hit this arrow here, and you'll see it, it filtered out. There are no more packets that say ARP on them. Very handy. We can use this filter to filter out only ports 
specific ports or only specific hosts or only a specific uh, source or destination. Very, very powerful. So let's just go through real quick. Uh, we can open up previous packets, capture packets here. We can save our file here. So let's go ahead and do that on our desktop. I'm just going to name it demo. And I'm going to save it to our desktop. Now you'll see I can I can quit out. And if you look on my desktop here in Kali Linux, you'll see I have a, a PCAP, e, uh, PCAP NG file. And I can click right click it and open it with Wireshark. Here we go. It's parsing through the file right now. Just hit OK here. And there we go. Everything we just captured is, is here. This can be very handy if you uh, are out somewhere and you capture traffic and then save it and you want to analyze it later or parse it later. Very, very handy. Okay, so we have save as. We can es export only specific packets if we wanted. Like we could apply one of those filters and, and export just those. Once again, this is a very powerful program. Lots of options, kind of complex. So we're just going to go through basics here. So our view, our go, we can go to a numbered packet here. We have different capture options here. We can set a time limit, let's say. You could say do it only for this amount of time or for this amount of packets. Here's our, our analyze. Okay, we can get uh, statistics. We can sniff Bluetooth with this. We have firewall ACL rules in here. Once again, we have the manual pages, which I would highly recommend to read and the wiki and uh, frequently asked questions along with the help contents I would very much recommend reading all that that you can so let's go ahead and, and click on our telenet packet here though and uh, if I right click that and I go to follow TCP stream well look at that hey uh, that looks just like our terminal right metasploitable too that's what it says here our login and look at that hey here's our our login right here information so we just captured the username and the password in clear text so this is handy so if say we're inside of a network and we're we're running Wireshark to capture traffic and sniff if there's anything that's clear text protocol such as you know telenet or HTTP, we're going to be able to read that in here when we reconstruct those packets. And essentially, that's what follow the stream does. It reconstructs those packets as something we can read here. So all that information comes up. Look, it's exactly what we did. Here's our LS. You'll see that there's a, a red and a blue character. And that's because Telenet is a, it echoes back what the user typed in. So the client and the server have the same thing there so that's why that happened but you can see I typed ls you can see I typed mail you can even see the directories that I listed out pretty neat so that's why you want to use encrypted things even inside your network you don't want to use clear text because otherwise if we if an attacker breaks in and sniffs your traffic they can they can get your password this way okay so let's go ahead and uh, and we're gonna we're gonna capture again here. So let me just uh, let me close this file. There we go. We're gonna capture on any any filter, okay, from any interface. All right. Now let's go ahead and try SSHing Metasploitable 2. 192, 168, 111, 128. Here we go. We type yes here. Okay. Root. What is root's password? Uh, is it root? I don't know. No. Is it blank? No. Is it password? Denied. Okay. Well, let's try SSH MF, MSF admin at 192.168.111.128. There we go. And msadmin is the password. 
There you go, we're in again. Now I can list stuff. I'll go back out to the main directory here and you can see that. And then I'll just type exit here. We're gonna stop this capture. And now we're gonna look and see our SSH version two. Look, there it is. So now if I try to follow this stream, let's see what that looks like. Okay, we got some stuff going on here, some, some Diffie-Hillman encryption going on. And as you can see, SSH is an encrypted protocol and it's not human readable. We, we can't tell what the login or the password was according to this, which is why it's a good idea to use SSH or encryption within your network. Then if we're sniffing, we can't, can't see it. So that's why it's a good idea, right, to use to use that encryption. We can't see what is being passed without the encryption key, which we don't have. But yeah, that whole conversation traversing the uh, the, the directories that's all in here, and and we can't read it. It's not readable. Okay, so I'm going to quit out of there. And I'm not going to save that. Once again, for more information, you can visit https www.wireshark.org slash pound learn Wireshark. I highly recommend this. This is a great uh, resource with uh, some papers, some uh, Wireshark questions and answers, frequently asked questions, online command line manual pages, good stuff. Section three summary, exploit and sniffing. In this section, we went over the tool Metasploit Basics and then we demoed it used, uh, by exploiting a vulnerability. We also went over the tool Armitage and performed a demo of that. We went over the tool Aircrack NG and demoed that. We went over a man in the middle attack and we also performed a demonstration of that as well. We used the tool Social Engineering Toolkit and provided a demo of that. And finally, we worked with the packet capture software Wireshark and we also demonstrated that as well. I hope you have enjoyed this course and I hope you have learned something and continue to learn things in this field and enjoy it. Thank you. Hello everyone and welcome to the Mastering Ethical Hacking course. My name is Alexis and I'm going to be your instructor. All right, so you might be wondering or thinking to yourself, why should I take this course? And why should I trust you, Alexis, to teach me ethical hacking and penetration testing? Well, let's get started. In this video, this is going to be a basic uh, course overview in terms of what we'll be looking at and I'll be giving you information about me. All right, so let's get started with who I am. All right, so my name is Alexis Ahmed and I've been an ethical hacker and a penetration tester for about six years and I've had numerous uh, or a lot of experience in the security field. All right, so I currently run a YouTube channel with over 43,000 subscribers as of recording this video uh, on ethical hacking, Linux and programming. So, uh, you know, my skill set does or is exposed out online and you can definitely tell I know what I'm doing. All right, so when it comes down to what I do professionally, I am a penetration tester and my job is to test or to find vulnerabilities in companies, uh, company networks, uh, company websites, more specifically payment systems. That's what my speciality is. I find vulnerabilities and I help companies mitigate these risks uh, and in a way that is convenient for them. 
All right, so that's what I currently do. Uh, in terms of my other skills, I have been a Linux system administrator for three years and uh, that involved me maintaining, uh, running and maintaining Linux servers. So I'm pretty good with Linux. I was actually Linux Plus certified, so I am quite good with Linux. Uh, when it comes down to my full stack web de development experience, I've been a full stack web developer for about six years now and I started my web development career back when I was 15 and uh, Essentially, again, my skill set revolves around creating uh, payment websites and finance websites, or for that matter, e-commerce websites. So I'm really a special, I'm really, really a specialist in terms of integrating payment systems and so on and so forth. All right. So I've created about 200 websites for clients, you know, all around the world. Uh, what I do in my free time, I'm an Android app developer and game developer. So, you know, I'm good with uh, programming languages like Java, XML, C Sharp for uh, you know, Xamarin for, you know, multi-platform development and Kotlin. Kotlin was my latest acquired programming skill. So I've been a seasoned Android app developer for eight years ever since I was 13. So I'm quite good with Android, you can say. And one of my latest uh, skills that I've picked up is uh, I'm essentially a cryptocurrency expert in the sense that I've uh, been with cryptocurrency since 2014 and I've uh, invested in a few cryptocurrencies and now I am a blockchain developer, so I actually focus on the Solidity programming language and the development of decentralized applications. All right, so let's get started with the first section. The first section will be looking at how to install and configure Kali Linux. All right, so Kali Linux is going to be our penetration testing operating system for this course. And it's really recommended that we go through this course with Kali Linux. All right. We'll then move on to working with Kali Linux, where I'll make you comfortable with using Kali Linux. I'll show you how to update Kali Linux. I'll show you how to use, uh, you know, how to tunnel traffic. I'll show you a plethora of other uh, cool little uh, tips and tricks around uh, that involve working with Kali Linux to increase your productivity and to also get familiar with the user interface and uh, the operating system itself. All right. We'll then get started with our first phase in ethical hacking or penetration testing, if you want to consider it that. And that is the information gathering section. We will be looking at the uh, information gathering techniques and tools used. All right. So this is where I'll be showing you how to gather information about your target using the latest and industry standard tools. All right. We'll then be moving on to our fourth section in the ethical hacking uh, process, which is vulnerability assessment. Again, this is a very, very important section that not a lot of the other ethical hacking courses cover. And that's because this is very, very important when you apply penetration testing into the real world or the field, as we call it. So in this section, we'll be learning how to install and use the industry standard vulnerability assessment tools and how to obviously analyze a target and its vulnerabilities. All right, we'll then be moving to one of the most exciting phases, which is the phase of exploitation. So section five, we'll be focusing on learning the techniques and tools used in the exploitation process. Now we'll be focusing on uh, the exploitation process on a web server and also on clients. All right, so we'll be looking at web, uh, we'll be looking at server side exploitation and client side exploitation. All right, moving along. We then move on to password cracking. All right. So password cracking, this is pretty much self-explanatory. You'll be looking at the uh, techniques and tools used in password cracking. So we'll be looking at how to crack encrypted files, the different password cracking tools, word lists. I will be looking at how to crack online logins, et cetera, et cetera. All right. And finally, we'll wrap up the course with network sniffing and spoofing. We'll be learning again the techniques and tools used for sniffing and spoofing on your network and how to uh, really, really master the whole concept of sniffing traffic on your network. All right. So that is what we'll be looking at in this course. And uh, now for the prerequisites, because again, like any other course, uh, this course will need uh, you to come with some information uh, before we you get started. All right. So uh, one of the prerequisites in terms of knowledge and skills is that you just need to be really familiar with the operating system that you're using. So you could be using Mac, you could be using Windows, or you could be using Linux. Uh, you know, they're all good and you just need to be familiar with how to use a computer. All right. The next thing you need to know is the basics of networking or the fundamentals of networking. Now, when I say this, what I mean is, you know, you know, simple things like TCP, that is your transmission control protocol, your IP, which is your internet uh, your protocol address, your IP address, you know, just knowing the basics of networking so that you you're not completely lost when I'll be talking about networking in the course. All right. And finally, you just need to have a basic understanding of Linux in the sense that you should know the basic Linux commands. But regardless of that, I'll be going through them with you in the course. All right. You don't find yourself lost at all. 
All right, so you just need a basic understanding of the commands that we use in Linux to create directories, to go back a directory, to look up your wireless or your network interfaces, etc., etc. All right, and finally, let's look at our system requirements. All right, our system requirements are really very simple. You can be using any operating system. You could be running Windows, Linux, or Mac. And in terms of the uh, your hard drive space or the disk space required, I would recommend about 65 gigabytes to 100 gigabytes of free space. And that's because we'll be setting up our virtual lab that will include us downloading and installing an operating system, obviously, and we'll be working with a lot of files. But I would recommend a minimum of about 50 gigabytes, but a recommended size of about 65 to 100 gigabytes. Whatever you can spare, it'll work just fine. All right. As for your memory, I would recommend a minimum memory of about 4 gigabytes, and that's your RAM, for those of you a bit confused. Uh, so you need about a minimum of 4 gigabytes of RAM, and that's because we're going to be using virtualization to virtualize Kali Linux. Now, again, you could be running 2 gigabytes. That really won't affect the learning process. It just means that your operating system will be a little bit slower. But irregardless of that, uh, a minimum of 4 gigabytes is recommended and a maximum of whatever your system is currently running. So you could be running a 12, 16 gigabytes or even 64 gigabytes of RAM. The more, the better. All right. And finally, your CPU or your processor must support virtualization. All right. Now, this is pretty much going to be if you're running any computer that is newer than 2011, then you pretty much should be OK and your processor should support virtualization. All right. So those are the prerequisites for the course. And now let's look at the course goals and what you should be able to do or what you should have learned by the end of the course. All right. So we'll learn how to install and can configure Kali Linux. You learn how to set up a virtual penetration testing lab. You learn the process of information gathering on your target. You learn how to use the industry standard vulnerability scanners for vulnerability assessment so you can find vulnerabilities on your target. You'll then learn how to exploit your target, whether it be a client side target or a web server. You'll then be moving on to how to crack passwords. So you learn how to crack uh, encrypted file passwords. You learn how to use word lists. You learn how to generate word lists. You learn how to crack online logins, etc., etc. You'll then move on to how to perform network sniffing and spoofing where you should learn the network sniffing process, the different tools used in network sniffing, how to start spoofing and you know how to use the man in the middle attacks to uh, intercept traffic between a target and your router or your portal. All right. So that is what you should be able to do after the course. You should be fairly competent after this course, uh, you know, to go into the field and to put your skills into real practice. All right. So that is a course overview for the course, obviously. And uh, I hope you're ready to learn and uh, I'll see you in the first section. Goodbye. Hello, everyone, and welcome to section one of the course installing and configuring Kali Linux. Now let's look at what we'll be learning in this section. So the first thing that we'll be going through in this section is a we'll be learning about how to download Kali Linux and more specifically how to select the correct version of Kali Linux according to your computer's architecture and the way your computer is set up in terms of hardware and software. The next thing we're going to be looking at is installing uh, the virtualization software. So I'm going to show you how to download it and install the different uh, pieces of virtualization software that we have, uh, some of them being VirtualBox and VMware. All right. So I'm going to be showing you how to do that. The third thing we're going to be doing is I'm going to be showing you how to install Kali Linux on these virtualization softwares and how to get them up and running on any of the virtualization softwares that you choose to use. All right. And lastly, we'll be setting up the services in Kali Linux and I'll be showing you how to get uh, up to speed with Kali Linux and how to use it. So that's what we're going to be learning in this section. And I hope you're excited to get started. Hello everyone and welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to get started with downloading Kali Linux. More specifically, we're going to be looking at how to select the correct version of Kali Linux according to your system or your computer's architecture and operating system. Now, the first thing you want to do is just open up any favorite browser that you have or any browser that you use. I'm going to be using Mozilla Firefox and this will work on any operating system. It really, really doesn't matter whether you're running Windows, Linux or Mac OS. All right. So you just want to perform a Google search for Kali Linux. All right. It's as simple as that. And it's going to be the first link right here. So it's going to say Kali Linux penetration testing and ethical hacking Linux distribution. So yes, Kali Linux is Linux. We already know that. 
So just click on the link and it should take you to the website, which is pretty, pretty awesome. And it's going to give you the fantastic headline here saying our most advanced penetration testing distribution ever. Now Kali Linux is fantastic for penetration testing and it'll give you a good sense uh, to understand what we're going to be doing, how we're going to perform attacks and how to prevent the attacks with Kali Linux. All right. So the first thing you need to do is you just want to go straight into downloads. All right. So make sure you click on downloads. And uh, now on this page, it'll give you all the downloads that you can basically download. But you're going to notice something is that there are a lot of options here. And this is what I was talking about. It's very, very important that you select the correct version that is in accordance or that relates to your operating system. And furthermore, uh, your computer's system architecture or your processor architecture. Now, it's really, really very easy to find out uh, what architecture your computer is running. Uh, and the two architectures that we have are 32-bit and 64-bit, right? So you might have heard of them. If you have, there's no need to watch this part. But if you haven't, I'm going to explain to you what this means. So if you're running a Windows computer, uh, all you have to do is just open up your file explorer and you want to go into this PC and right click on it and go to the properties section and it's going to show you your system. All right. Now in your system, you're going to find something here uh, that comes to your system type, right? So in your system type, as you can see, mine is showing up as 64 bit operating system with a 64 bit based processor. So if um, your system does correspond to mine, then the option you want to go with is the Kali 64 bit. All right. If yours is a 32 bit, uh, you want to make sure you select that one. Right, that's very, very important for the purposes of the video. Don't worry about uh, the other versions right here that have the light or the Mate or XFCE. These are just different customized versions of Kali Linux running different desktop environments. So that's something you really don't want to touch right now, but we can look into that maybe in the future. All right, so the light versions are just light versions of the ISO that are made to run on the bare minimums. They don't contain any extra tools or all the important tools that you'll need. So everything is kind of added on as you want. All right. So it's a very good place to start if you're trying to build or respin the Linux, the Kali Linux distribution. But for now, we just want to um, go ahead and download it. So there are two options for the download section. As you can see, you can download it directly or you can download it uh, through a torrent client. For example, you have uTorrent or BitTorrent, or we have other Bit torrent clients like uh, Deluge that's on Linux or you have your Qubit torrent which is multi-platform and great. So if you want to go, go ahead and download it directly just hit on the HTTP link all right and once you hit that it's going to start the download automatically and the download prompt should open up. There we are. So it's going to say you have chosen to open and you can save the file. So one of the most important things you need to see is that the fact that the file type is going to be an ISO file all right. So it's very important to understand that the format of any Kali Linux uh, distribution, for that matter, ISO is in a virtual disk image. We'll be looking at that uh, when we try and install it on uh, our virtualization softwares. Or you can go ahead and download it through your torrent, all right? So if I click torrent, it's going to prompt me to download the torrent and I can launch it and download it. The size is going to be 2.8 gigabytes, as you can see for the 64 bit version and 2.9 for the 32 bit version, all right? And the latest version. And when as of recording this video is 27.3 and any updates that are needed to be made uh, in accordance to the version of Kali Linux will be made and updated to the course. All right. So once it's downloaded, we'll be moving on to the next video. In the next video, we'll be looking at installing our virtualization softwares, which are VirtualBox and or VMware. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to be downloading and installing our virtualization software, which in this case is going to be VMware. All right. Next, we'll be looking at uh, installing VirtualBox under specific circumstances. But first, let's get started. Right. So just open up uh, your favorite browser. I have a uh, Firefox opened up here and you can just use your favorite search engine as well. Uh, and uh, what you want to do is just search for VMware. All right. So that is very, very simple. It is VMware. So VMware, all right? And uh, just search for that. And it's going to be the first link right there. So you want to click on that link. And it's going to open up the website for VMware. And uh, before we get started with downloading the files, 
I just want to point out that VMware is a free option, but it does have a paid version. The paid version and the free version are very, very similar. They, the paid version just offers uh, additional functionality, more on the professional side. Uh, now, in this course, we're going to be using uh, VMware, the, the free version, which is Workstation Player, and uh, it'll work perfectly fine with everything that we're going to be doing in the course. If you feel like uh, buying the paid version, which is Workstation Pro, or VMware Pro, you can go ahead and do that as well. But if you're a beginner, just start off with the free version. And if this is something that you're interested in, if virtualization is something that you're interested in, you can go ahead and try out the paid version. And then if you like it, you can buy it right now. Uh, I did mention that we're going to be uh, downloading these pieces of software under certain circumstances. Now, if your computer is a 64 bit computer, I would recommend that you stick with VMware. All right. Now, if your computer is a 32 bit operating system and uh, your processor is 32 bit in terms of its architecture, I will be showing you in the next lecture how to download and install VirtualBox. Right. So uh, let's get started with VMware. So you just want to scroll over to the left here to this toolbar and you want to hit downloads right now it's going to open up this large menu and it's very very easy to get confused but don't worry what you want to look for is the free product downloads right here very very simple and you want to look for workstation player now this will work on all operating systems if you are running a mac operating system which uh, mac os x for that matter what you want to click on is fusion all right fusion is the uh, is the Mac equivalent of, of this software and it works just as well, right? Uh, this is the pro version right here. So as you can see, these are free product trials and demos. So they do give you evaluation periods where you can try the product out uh, before you decide to buy it. Now, uh, going back to the free product downloads, this is what we're going to be using workstation player. So just click on that right here. Fantastic. All right. Now, uh, what I want to show you is it's going to give you this nice download page. Uh, here and it's going to be divided into two versions. You have your Windows operating system version and your Linux operating system version, all with the latest one being 14.1.0. All right, so that is the latest version as of this recording. Now you can choose to select the versions right here. I suggest that you run the latest versions. And uh, again, moving on to the downloads. As I've told you, these will work with a 64 bit operating system. So again, if you're not running a 64 bit operating system, no need to worry. I'm going to be showing you how to download and install the other piece of virtualization software, which is an alternative and it's called VirtualBox. So don't worry about that. Right. So select your operating system. As I said, you can be running uh, Mac OS, uh, Linux or Windows. In my case, I'm running Windows. So I'm just going to hit download. Now I already have the file downloaded on my desktop. Here it is. It is a simple setup. So I'm just going to run it. Just double click to run it and it should pop up in a few seconds. There we are. We're going to hit yes. And there we are. That's the setup VMware Workstation Player 14. This is the latest version as of this recording and it's going to start the installer. All right. Now uh, I already have it installed. So it's going to tell me that uh, it cannot install it alongside the current installation. So I'm just going to cancel the installation. The installation is very, very simple. Just hit next at a very, very simple uh, setup wizard. And once you're done, you should be uh, left with a piece of software like this. The icon is here. So VMware. So if I just search for it, if you're running Windows, you can easily just search for it. And this is the one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just uh, create a shortcut on my desktop. Uh, yours will probably already be on the desktop. I like to keep my desktop clean. There we are. So that's the piece of software that we're going to be using. So you can just open it up for yourself. And uh, you probably won't be greeted with this screen. And that's because I already have a, a virtual machine already created. In the next videos, we're going to be looking at how to install Kali Linux on our virtual machine and how to navigate it. Anyway, that's going to be it for this video. Uh, I hope you found value in this video and I'll be seeing you in the next video. Downloading and installing our second piece of virtualization software, which in this case is VirtualBox. Hello everyone, welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to be downloading and installing our second piece of virtualization software, which in this case is VirtualBox. And this will prove to be a very, very good replacement or alternative to VMware. 
right so let's get started just open up your favorite browser i'm uh, using firefox and you want to go to the website www.virtualbox.com or you can just google virtualbox it's very very simple and uh, once you click on the website it's going to take you to the website which is a very very simple website and it's going to directly prompt you to download virtualbox now before we get started i just want to point out something that uh, if you are running a 32-bit uh, operating system and computer for that matter where, where the processor is a 32-bit architecture then this is perfect for you because virtualbox works on both 32-bit and 64-bit so this is a good uh, alternative that you can check out in my opinion in my personal opinion and experience uh, virtualbox works great on linux and mac os all right so for those of you running mac os uh, this is a very very good alternative to vmware or fusion should i say just click on the download virtualbox button and it's going to take you to the downloads page and as you can see it's sorted really really nicely here into the four categories uh, depending on operating system so you have your windows hosts your mac os x hosts your linux distributions and your solaris hosts so uh, i'm running windows and i'm just going to click on that now i already have the setup uh, downloaded so i'm just going to go to my desktop right here and here's the file right and uh, i haven't installed it so i'm going to install this with you so i'm just going to hit uh, install right and um, there we are it's going to start the setup process there we are let's hit next all right uh, it's going to prompt you to select the modules and uh, the the dependencies that it comes with in terms of uh, the features that it comes with so you have your virtual box networking so don't touch any of this just hit next and it's going to ask you for some uh, customization options in terms of where you want the application shortcuts to be so you have your start menu entries, your desktop, uh, your quick launch bar, and your register, uh, whether you want to register file associations with this uh, program. So I'm just going to leave these all checked, and I'm going to hit next. And it's going to say proceed with installation now. There we are. And I'm going to hit install, and it's going to start the installation process. It shouldn't take too much time, but again, depending on your computer's performance, it may be a bit slower, or uh, it could be very fast. Uh, depending on whether or not you're running an SSD uh, or you're running an old hard drive. Nonetheless, it really doesn't matter because uh, either way, we're going to uh, need this installed if this is the option that you choose to go with uh, throughout the course. One more thing I wanted to point out is that the options, once we've set it, uh, we've set both these pieces of virtualization software up and we've installed our penetration testing distribution, which is Kali Linux. Uh, there will be no differences at all. It doesn't matter whether you continue using uh, VMware or v VirtualBox. The content of the videos or of the course will still work on either one of them nonetheless. All right, so it is installing and it's almost done. So there we are, and it's almost done. And it's uh, just finishing with the shortcuts and creating the file associations with the program so that we can have a good uh, support when we are going to be opening virtual box files and likewise with the VMware files or the virtual disk image files uh, where the pieces of virtualization software will actually create uh, their own virtual hard drives and that can be a very very good way of importing different types of operating systems and vulnerable operating systems for that matter as we'll be looking at or looking upon in the future videos so just let this finish up and it shouldn't take too much time now at all it shouldn't take uh, anything more than five minutes again it's really very 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 simple so we're going to let this finish and i'll be back when it's done all right all right so once it's done it's going to prompt you to run it so we can just hit yes and i'm going to finish the installation and it's going to start up and there we are fantastic we have virtual box set up and we're ready to install Kali Linux now. That's going to be it for this video. I'll be seeing you in the next video. Installing Kali Linux on our virtualization software. Hello everyone and welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to be installing Kali Linux on our virtualization software, more specifically VMware. All right, now depending on the version that you downloaded and installed, whether you chose to go with the free version or the paid version, it'll work exactly the same. And if you're using VirtualBox, the installation process is pretty much the same thing. 
and uh, we're going to be using VMware for the entire the entirety of the course now. Or if you've chosen to install Linux on your uh, on your physical machine, that will work as well. All right, so let's get started, and uh, I'll guide you through the installation steps with VMware. All right, so uh, I'm going to be using VMware Workstation Player because that's what I would assume most of you have chosen. If you're using the professional version, as I do have installed right here, the installation process is pretty much the same. So let's get started. Open up your workstation player. All right, and it'll take a few seconds. There we are. And I already have created a virtual machine, but don't worry about that. Yours will be empty here. And uh, all we have to do to create a new virtual machine is just click on create a new virtual machine. All right, really simple. There we are. And uh, now it's going to ask you uh, to select your installer disk image or your ISO file that we downloaded in the previous video where we were downloading Kali Linux. So I hope you guys have got the file. So just make sure you select installer disk image file and you want to specify where that file is saved. I saved mine on my desktop. So I'm just going to go to the folder and click on it. There we are. So make sure you select the ISO that you downloaded that is appropriate depending on the system or your computer's uh, architecture. All right, so I'm going to hit open. And uh, it's going to give you this little error here saying could not detect which operating system is in the disk image. Don't worry about that. Hit on next. And now you want to specify the guest operating system. All right, so the guest operating system is simply what operating system this is and the kernel that it is running. All right, so make sure you select Linux because Kali Linux is based off Linux. And now uh, for the version, I want you to select, you want to go ahead and select version three or later. All right, so Linux version three or later. If you're running a 64 bit computer, then you want to select the one that says 64 bit. And if you have the 32 bit, make sure you select the, the one that is simply plain and that does not contain a 64 bit specification. All right. So I have the 64 bit ISO and my computer is 64 bit. So I'm just going to click on that and hit next. And now it's going to ask you to give your virtual machine a name. I'm going to call it Kali Linux Mastering Ethical hacking all right i'm just going to give it any name i'm um, giving it a specific name but you guys can call it whatever you want and now it's going to ask you to specify your storage location for the virtual machine so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to browse and uh, you can store it wherever you feel is comfortable i have an os folder right here so i'm just going to open it up and i'm going to create a new folder in there and i'm just going to call it i'm just going to call it Kalinux hacking really really simple and i'm going to save it in that folder i'm going to hit ok and it's going to save my virtual machine in there again you can specify whatever storage uh, location you feel is comfortable i'm going to hit next and now it's going to ask me to specify the disk capacity that i want my virtual disk uh, or my virtual hard drive to be in i like uh, selecting mine as 20 gigabytes if you're a beginner to this i would recommend just using 20 gigabytes but if your computer does not have a lot of storage to spare, uh, 10 gigabytes would work okay. But I would recommend 20 gigabytes because we're going to be installing a few files here and there. And it may eat up quite uh, a bit of space. All right. Now, uh, the option that is going to specify here as well is whether or not you want to store your virtual disk as a single file or you want whether or not you want to split it into multiple files. Make sure you select store it as a single disk file and that's because it'll make your virtual machine a whole lot faster and you won't run into any lags or slowdowns. All right. So I'm going to hit next now and uh, we can customize the hardware. And this is very, very dependent on what computer you're running and what you like uh, to have your system and how you want it customized in terms of its hardware. Now, for the memory, uh, this is your RAM and how much RAM you want to specify to your virtual machine. Now, I have a 8 gigabytes of RAM installed on my computer. Uh, and what I would recommend for Kali Linux for this course is 1 gigabyte. If you have more to spare, you can use it very, very uh, liberally and also, you know, go up to 2 or 4 gigabytes. If your computer is running 2 gigabytes of RAM, uh, you can also use the recommended, which is 768 or take it down to 512. But if you do that, your system will be really, really slow. So I recommend about one gigabyte. That works great for me. Next, 
in terms of processes, again, this is highly dependent on what you have uh, running in your system. For example, I have a quad core uh, CPU, which means it has four uh, processor cores. And that means I can specify up to four or for this matter, I like to use about two. If you have a dual core CPU or a processor, make sure you select one because yeah, it's always good to keep a balance between your host operating system and your guest operating system. All right. Uh, now uh, we want to move on to the network adapter. And this is very, very important. Uh, I need to just show you this. Uh, we're going to be working with a, a few other virtual machines. And what I would recommend is to bridge your, you know, I want you to bridge your connection directly to your physical uh, adapter, your physical network adapter, whether you're running Wi-Fi or Ethernet. So just click on bridge and I want you to click on replicate physical network connection state. Now, what this means is that you will be able to communicate with other computers on your network uh, and it will be based on your network as a valid computer uh, and they'll be given an IP address uh, to match that. All right. The next thing is your display, which is again, very dependent on you. Now I have a dedicated graphics card, so I'm going to make sure I hit accelerate 3D graphics. And uh, again, if you do not have a dedicated gra graphics card, you can leave that unchecked. I like having it because it makes Kali Linux a whole lot smoother in its interface. All right. Now, as for the graphics memory, uh, depending on how much memory you have dedicated to your system, I have about two gigabytes. So it recommends about 768 megabytes and I'll leave it at that. You can specify what is comfortable for you from 32 bit, from 32 megabytes to about two gigabytes. Uh, I'm just going to go with the recommended and I'm going to hit close. And there we are. We want to hit finish and we're ready to install Kali Linux. All right. So make sure you click on your virtual machine now and the one that we created and just hit play virtual machine and it's going to start up and give it a few seconds shouldn't take too much time at all there we are the vmware bios has started up and it's going to lead you to this uh, installation screen all right so it's going to ask you to select a, an option here so what we're going to do is we're going to go for the graphical install i'm going to click hit on that and uh, now it's going to start up the setup and it's going to start loading everything up so give this a few seconds, as you can see here. Don't worry if it gives you a few errors here. Uh, it should start uh, up anyway. All right, there we are. So now it's going to ask you to select your language. All right, so welcome to Kali Linux. And you can go ahead and select the language that you wish to use. I'm going to be using English and I'm going to hit OK. And now you want to select your version of uh, English. And again, depending on your location or your the country or territory in which you live, I'm just going to hit United States and hit continue. Now you want to configure the keyboard. This is very, very important. A lot of people make mistakes here. Make sure you select the keyboard layout that you are used to. So I'm used to the American English keyboard uh, format or the layout. So I'm going to hit continue. Now it's going to uh, scan for all the files and it's going to load all the files onto your virtual disk image for installation. So give that a few seconds as well. Overall, the installation shouldn't take too much time at all. All right, so once it, it has loaded all the files, it's going to ask you to configure your network. And this is very, very important. It's going to ask you for a host name. All right, a host name is essentially, uh, this is going to be the name of your system or your computer on your network. And this would be a very good way of identifying your computers. For example, if you had a network of computers, whether you're running this at home, on your home network or you're running this in your office. Especially this will be a unique identifier for you to uniquely identify your virtual machine. So I have two Kali workstations on my network. So I'm just going to call this Kali 2. All right. And I'm going to hit continue. If you don't have any other computer running Kali Linux, you can just leave it uh, as the default, which is Kali. I'm going to hit continue. Now for the domain name, you can specify a domain name if you're running this on your school network or your company network. Uh, this is really, really dependent on you. But if you're running this on your home network, uh, you can just go ahead and hit continue. You don't need to do that. All right. So now it's going to ask you for your users and your passwords. All right. So this is setting up your users and passwords. The first thing it's going to ask you is for your root password. This is very, very important. Your root password is essentially going to give you or will be used to grant you administrative privileges or give you the super user mode in the Linux, uh, in the Linux operating system. So it's very important that you remember this password. So I'm going to create the password here. All right. And I'm going to repeat it again. 
you can give it uh, as anything that you feel is necessary uh, you can give a very secure system if that's what you require or you can just give it um, some very uh, normal password it really doesn't matter because this is a virtual lab and there'll be not a lot of important stuff saved but it's very important that you remember the password that you're using all right i'm going to hit continue and now it's going to ask you to configure your clock all right now this is very very simple depending on the area that you live in you want to just select your time zone so uh, i'm just going to select eastern uh, you can go with whatever you want it really doesn't matter for me i'm just going to eastern i'm going to hit continue and now it's going to detect your disk and open the partitioner that comes in built with Kali Linux. all right so this is very important now so uh, it's going to ask you now to select the disk in which you want to install Kali Linux. And so what, what I would recommend is just go for guided, use the entire disk, just hit continue. And it's going to show you the virtual disk that we created. In my case, it is the 21.5 gigabytes VMware virtual disk. So I'm going to hit that and it's going to prompt me to uh, confirm uh, how I want my disk partitioned. All right, so the Linux installation has three partitions. Uh, it saves the system files in the home, var, and temp partitions. So I would recommend as a beginner to save everything in one partition, all right? As it says over here, recommended for new users. And that's because you do not have to tinker around with the partitions and select specific swap space, etc., etc. So just hit continue. And you want to hit finish partitioning and write changes to disk. Hit continue. And it's going to ask you uh, to confirm whether you want to write changes to the disk. Uh, just hit yes and hit continue. And it should start uh, partitioning the disk. And once it's done, it should start installing the system. It could take a while depending on your hard drive on your computer. Or if you have an SSD running on your computer, it could go a whole lot faster. So I'll get back to you when the installation is done. So I'll see you then. All right, so once the installation is complete, it's going to ask you uh, to configure the package manager. All right, and it's going to ask you to select a whether or not you want to select a network mirror uh, that can be used uh, to uh, download additional software and updates. All right, so I don't want to use a network mirror and I'm going to continue. All right, and uh, it's going to get uh, started to configure the package manager. So give it a few seconds as well. Shouldn't take too much time at all. All right, it's going to start installing the Grub bootloader. And essentially what this is, it's a bootloader that is used to start up Kali Linux. All right, so that's just uh, in case you're wondering what it is and how it affects the installation. All right, now it's going to ask you whether or not you want to install the Grub bootloader on your hard disk. And yes, we do. Uh, the reason being is if you install it on another hard drive, you had to specify that hard drive to get booted up first. And that really deals with installing it on a physical drive. But for the, for the purpose of this video, just make sure you hit yes and hit continue. And uh, it's going to ask you to select the storage device. Now we already, we only created one virtual disk. So we're going to select the uh, device and the storage device A and hit continue. And it's going to install the grub bootloader. And uh, again, just give it a few seconds. It shouldn't take uh, too much time at all. There we are. And now it's going to finish the installation. It's going to set up the clock and just run any of the other update services that are required uh, for the installation. So I'll get back to you when it's done. All right. So once the installation is complete, it's going to ask you to hit continue to complete the installation. And uh, it shouldn't, uh, it, now it's going to get rid of the packages, the installation packages that were left over during the installation. And uh, just give it a few seconds. There we are. Uh, and once it's done, it's going to automatically reboot and uh, it'll reboot you directly into Kali Linux. So just give it a few seconds. This whole process shouldn't take any more than 20 minutes uh, along with the uh, installation of the files on your virtual disk image. Again, as I said, it really depends uh, on your computer and the system that you're trying to do this on and whether or not your disk uh, is a fast hard drive or you're using an SSD. So that is really dependent on what system you're running. So just get rid of the live packages and I'll get back to you when it's ready. All right. So once it's done, it's going to start up and uh, this is the start, the grub bootloader and it's going to start Kali Linux up. Once it restarts, there we are. 
and the system is starting up now so just give it a few seconds to load everything up and it should give us the login screen where i'll give you the instructions as to uh, what to use for the username and obviously the password that you set which was the root password which will be the default password because we're going to be logging in uh, using the root account that's because we didn't create any user all right which i'll also be showing you how to do uh, so there we are the system has started up and we can already see that we can use the kali linux pointer so again it's just a matter of time before it starts up there we are and here we have kali linux so uh, let's hopefully we can log in so the username that you want to use is going to be root and the password is going to be the password that we set during the installation and hit enter and there we are it's going to start Kali Linux up give it a few seconds to start up the desktop environment it should be up anytime now and uh, in the next videos we're going to be looking at how to customize Kali Linux uh, you know making making sure it, it's working all right and it, it works to your advantage rather than working against you and I'm just going to show you how to get comfortable with Kali Linux all right so again, uh, the first startup uh, shouldn't take too much time. And, you know, this is going to be, uh, this this slow procedure is going to happen only once. And that's because it's starting up for the first time. It's just configuring everything. So just have a bit of patience and it should start up. All right. Once it's started up, welcome to Kali Linux. And as you can see, uh, don't worry if the screen resolution is very, very slow. It's really simple to sort that out. And that's what we'll be looking at in the next section. And uh, in section one, we looked at installing and configuring Kali Linux and our environment that we're going to be using for penetration testing. All right. So uh, looking at the summary of what we have done so far in this section, we first looked at downloading and installing uh, the appropriate virtualization softwares. Uh, in this case, we were working with VMware and we also looked at downloading and installing VirtualBox. All right. We then moved along to downloading Kali Linux. Now, when I say downloading Kali Linux, we looked at downloading the appropriate version of Kali Linux depending on our system architecture. All right, from then onwards, we moved on to installing Kali Linux on our one VMware, which is the virtualization software of choice. Once we installed Kali Linux, we were able then to download and install our Metasploitable 2 operating system, which is going to act as our target for most of the course and will act as a fantastic way of practicing your skills. In the next section, we're gonna get started working with Kali Linux. So I'll be seeing you in the next section. Hello everyone and welcome to section two, working with Kali Linux. All right. So in this section, what we're going to learn is firstly, we'll be learning how to install the VMware tools. All right. So VMware tools are going to be our virtualization tools that will allow us to run Kali Linux much better and, and give us awesome features in the days, uh, like a drag and dropping from the host to guest operating system, running the virtual machine in full screen mode, et cetera, et cetera. All right, we will then move on to learning how to update Kali Linux. Now, more specifically, we'll be looking at the correct way of updating the repositories, updating the packages, and then furthermore, updating the distribution. After we're done with the updating Kali Linux, we'll then move on to setting up proxy chains. All right, so proxy chains is going to be our anonymity uh, provider in the sense that we will be configuring it to work with Tor, and we're going to be tunneling our traffic through the Tor relay using proxy chains. Okay. We will then move on to starting the different network services. Uh, so we're going to learn how to start these uh, services on Kali Linux, more specifically the most important services like SSH or the Apache 2 web server. Uh, all right. Then once we're done with that, we will then move into our quick win section where I'm going to be showing you how to hack a WordPress installation. So, so we're going to be looking at some basic exploitation of WordPress, and this is going to hopefully introduce you into the world of hacking. All right, so that is what we're going to look at in section two, and uh, let's get started. In this video, we're going to be installing VMware tools on Kali Linux. All right, so again, as you pretty much guessed it, this is going to be involving the VMware workstation, and it's going to allow you to use Kali Linux to its fullest potential while uh, in a virtualized environment. So for example, after we've installed VMware tools, we will be able to use the full screen mode, which will allow you to use uh, the multiple resolutions that Kali Linux has to offer. Because right now, as you can see, we can increase the resolution, but uh, the quality and uh, the smoothness of the user interface will be really, really slow. So VMware tools essentially give you a much better optimized version of Kali Linux. All right, so let's get started. It's really very simple, but for some reason, a lot of people find it very, very complicated. And I'm going to try and make it as simple as possible. 
So what you want to do is uh, hopefully you have your virtual machine running. If you're not, just start it up and log in. All right. So what we're going to do is very, very simply just go to the option here that says player and you want to go into manage. And as you can see, there's going to be an option here. It's going to say install VMware tools. So we're going to hit install VMware tools. All right. Give it a few seconds. It should start up right away. All right. And it should give you a very, very interesting prompt. So again, a few seconds just for it to load all the files into the virtual machine or in this case, Kali Linux. And it should give you a uh, little disk image right over here. It should mount a disk image, uh, but let's check if it doesn't give you that. Uh, there we are. It's already mounted it. I just couldn't see it. So if it does not mount it to the desktop, what you want to do is just go into your file explorer, which is this little blue file I'm right here. It's very, very similar to Windows. Uh, but before that, I just want to increase the resolution of my virtual machine. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to search for settings for displays. All right. And I'm just going to increase the resolution. Uh, again, give it a few seconds. As you can see, the virtual machine is really, it's not that fast. And this is where uh, VMware tools will come in really, really handy because it uh, essentially optimizes uh, the virtual machine for Kali Linux. All right. For some reason, that's not opening up as well. So I pretty much there we are. It has opened up. Let me just increase the resolution here to something a bit more appropriate so that we can see what's going on. There we are. Let me apply that. And as you can see, it's really, really laggy. It's taking a lot of time to keep or save the changes. There we are. All right. So once that's done, I'm just going to minimize that and we're going to go back to our file explorer and I'm just going to expand that like so. And as you can see, we have the VMware tools here, right over here. So there we are. That's the disk image. Now, once you open it up, uh, you can just double click it from the desktop or open it up in your file explorer. There's going to be a lot of files in here. There's going to be about five files. And the file you want to be paying attention to is the VMware tools extractable or archive. All right. So uh, what you want to do is I would recommend that you copy this to your desktop. All right. Because we just need to install what's inside. And once we have done that, uh, it's really, uh, we can pretty much get rid of it. So once it's copied to the desktop, what you want to do is uh, just drag it wherever you feel is comfortable for you and right click it. And uh, I want you to just extract it here. All right. Just click on extract it here. There we are. It's extracted the folder and uh, you want to open up this folder. Uh, again, it's, and it shouldn't take too much time as well because the, the virtual machine is not very snappy at this moment. Let me just resize that. There we are. So it's going to be a single folder and you want to open that as well. And in here, what you want to do is, uh, as you can see, there's a little install executable there or a shell file for that matter. But in this case, it is uh, that we need to install it using the terminal. So I want you to right click anywhere in this folder and just open in terminal. All right. Now it's going to open up the Linux terminal. And I don't want you to be overwhelmed at all. Just follow the steps that I show you here. Let me increase the size of the font so you can see what I'm doing exactly. All right. So I'm going to minimize all of that. So make sure you've opened the folder. You've opened the terminal in the folder. As you can see, uh, the desktop VMware tools and furthermore VMware tools distribution. All right. Now I'm going to be using a few Linux commands. Do not be overwhelmed at all. Just follow my steps. We'll be looking at what all of these commands do. Now, the first command I'm going to be using is the ls command. And what this will do is it's going to list all the files in the directory so we can have a good idea of what is in and how we can use it. All right. So I'm going to hit enter. And as you can see, it's going to list all the files. So the one that we really want to pay attention to is the VMware install.pl, which is a Perl file. So if you've heard of the Perl programming language, this is uh, an extension. And as you can see, it's highlighted in green. And you might be asking, well, what do we do now? Well, what we have to do is install this file. How do we install it? We use the Perl command. So P E R L. And then we, uh, fill in. So VM where we give the file name. And, uh, at this stage, what you want to do is you just want to use the tab button. All right. Now what, what happens when you hit the tab button is it's going to auto complete it for you, as you can see, and just hit enter now. And it's going to say, uh, installing VMware tools and it's going to ask you uh, in which directory do you want to install the binary files? Just hit enter. All right. It's going to ask you what is the directory that contains the initial uh, directories? Just hit enter. Uh, initial scripts, just hit enter. 
enter, enter, and it's going to ask you uh, the path of VMware tools does not exist. Uh, the program is going to create it. Do I want to install it? Just hit yes, type in yes, and hit enter. All right, give it a few seconds as well. All right, now it's going to ask you uh, in which directory you want to install the common agent files. Uh, just hit enter. Don't worry about that. Enter again. Uh, the documentation, enter. Now it's going to ask you the, the, the directory does not exist. Do you want to create it? Yes, I do. Uh, again, yes. We want to hit yes. Uh, just uh, always just use the option yes because we really don't want to change anything. Otherwise, it would complicate the entire process and you would probably end up getting an error. Okay. This is probably the best way of installing the VMware tools. There may be other ways of installing it, but those ways have, uh, it's really been proven that they do not work. Uh, or they work only like 50% of the time for half uh, the amount of people. I can guarantee you that this will work on your system as well. We have, we've been prompted with an option here. The VMware host guest file system allows for shared folders. Uh, now this is really up to you and uh, it essentially allows you to share folders from your host to your guest operating system. I'm just going to hit yes because I like that feature. Uh, do I want? Yes, I'm just going to hit yes again. VMware automatic kernel modules. Yes again. Do I want to enable common agent? Uh, yes. Make sure everything is just yes. All right. Uh, the next, what it's essentially doing now is it's uh, looking for the display drivers which it'll get uh, depending on what uh, whether or not you've selected your 3D graphic acceleration. So don't worry about this, uh, it really doesn't matter. This is all about it's installing it and it'll give you a perfect optim optimization for your system. And uh, essentially just make your virtual machine run a lot faster and more efficient, all right? So as you can see, it's started creating a new boot image for the kernel. So it's essentially writing uh, changes to the kernel headers for Kali Linux and just again, as I said, optimizing it for the virtual machine and for it's optimizing the virtual machine for Kali Linux, etc, uh, etc. Et okay, there we are. It's done. And it's going to say, um, enjoy the VMware team. Uh, all right, there we are. It's done and it's going to automatically unmount the VMware the VMware disk file, as you can see on the desktop, it's, it doesn't exist anymore. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to close this out. And uh, what you need to do is you need to restart your system, or you can just log out and log back in. And one of the ways to test whether or not it's worked, firstly, let me just get rid of these files because we don't need them anymore. Uh, one way to check whether it's worked is to use the full screen option uh, that does come with uh, VMware. So what we're going to do is we're just going to log out like so. Uh, again, there we are. It's going to prompt me to log out. All right, now we want to just log back in. So root, I'm going to enter in my password. And it should start up quicker now, because this is the second time we're logging back in. Or it could be a third time depending on whether or not you restarted your virtual machine or your operating system for that matter. Okay. So again, a few seconds. All right, and you should be good to go. The VMware tools should be installed now. And as I said, the easiest way to know if everything is working as it should, what you want to do is you just want to go into uh, the toolbar up here and just go to the enter full screen mode. And if everything worked, it should scale uh, the resolution completely to the resolution of your monitor. It should scale the display uh, to, to the absolute resolution of your monitor. And there we are looks really really beautiful and uh, everything should be snappy again if it's taking if it's still really really slow don't worry about that it usually happens for the first few minutes or hours of your installation it's just that the files are building up uh, essentially and don't worry if it's really really slow uh, it should work perfectly once the vmware tools are installed so there we are that's working perfectly and uh, that's going to be it for this video I'll be seeing you in the next video. Update Kali Linux and how to update the packages within Kali Linux. Hello everyone and welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to be looking at how to update Kali Linux and how to update the packages within Kali Linux. So let's get started. Now uh, we've already installed VMware tools, so we should have a full screen and it should be fully scaled up and the virtual machine should be working perfectly. Right, so now uh, with Kali Linux, uh, there are different types of updating 
processes or ways you can update the packages or the distribution itself. And everything can be done from the terminal relatively easily. All right. So uh, if I just open up the terminal and uh, let me just zoom in here so we can see what's going on. Now, to update the local package index, all right, with the latest, uh, you know, changes made to the repositories. So this is essentially how to update the repository list and uh, get all the latest versions of the packages that can currently be updated. All right. So to do this, we just hit apt. All right. So uh, make sure you're in root. Uh, otherwise, you would have to use sudo apt get all right so sudo apt get update all right so it's really very simple that's the syntax uh, and just hit enter and it's going to start working and connecting and getting the latest repositories and obviously from that it's going to index the latest packages but it will not install them for you to upgrade the packages i'm going to show you the other command that you can use all right so let this complete again depending on the frequency in which you update it could take longer to update because the package size could be larger or again depending on the speed of your internet it could uh, do it really really quickly or take some time so as you can see mine has fetched uh, the repository list and it has uh, checked for the latest versions of the packages that i can update and uh, once it's done it's uh, just going to say there we are uh, it's done now to upgrade the packages to actually upgrade you know packages like the burp suite package to the latest version or the Mozilla Firefox browser to the latest version, what we would use is apt, all right, get, or if you're not in root, you can use the sudo apt, get, and we can say upgrade. And once I hit enter, it's going to start upgrading the packages. Now, as you can see, it's going to give me some information here on the terminal, and don't worry about this. You need to just focus on the last four to five lines here. So it's saying 430 upgraded, zero newly installed, zero to remove, and 58 not upgraded. So it needs to upgrade 58 of the packages. And it will tell you here, need to get 112 megabytes uh, of the archives. After this operation, 21.4 megabytes of additional disk space will be used. And you can choose to upgrade the packages or not. Now, again, for you, I would recommend that you do this. But I'm not going to do it because I do not want to take uh, any more time that it needs to. So I'm going to hit no. All right. Now, you might be asking, how do I upgrade the Kali Linux? How, how do I upgrade the version of Kali Linux that I'm running? Let's say uh, a new version is released. Uh, do I have to install the ISO again? No, you don't. If you have a if you have Kali Linux running, all you need to do is you need to just say sudo if you're not in root. All right, and apt get dist. All right, so dist is a short form for distribution. Let me just clear the screen so we can see what we're doing. So apt get all right dist, and after that you use your dash and you say upgrade. All right, so it's really very simple. So I'm doing this in root, so I don't have to use the sudo or I don't have to enter root to do this. So it will understand what I mean and uh, it'll obviously grant me the privileges that I need to do this. And once I hit enter, it's going to get all the packages and there we are. Again, it's going to tell you 488 upgraded, 33 newly installed, 5 to remove and 0 not upgraded. Uh, need to get 138 megabytes and after this operation 312 megabytes of additional disk space will be used so essentially it's upgrading the entire distribution to the latest version if available what do i mean by this if you're running the latest version then you're probably not going to get uh, any updates to be made and you know that you're running the latest version but it's always good to be running on the latest version but again i'm just going to hit no and i'm, I'm going to update it later because i don't want to take your time and for you, just hit yes if there are any packages that need to be updated. As you can see, the size may vary depending on how old an, a version you're running. So uh, yeah, just hit a yes or no depending on what you want to do. Again, I would recommend that you hit yes. And there we are. And once you're done, you are pretty much good to go with Kali Linux. And yeah, that's going to be it for this video. In the next video, we'll be looking at how to set up and configure proxy chains for anonymity. All right, so I'll be seeing you in the next video. Hello everyone, and welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to be looking at how to set up proxy chains. Now you might be asking yourself, what is proxy chains and how can I use it to my advantage? Well, proxy chains, simply put, is essentially uh, the process of breaking the direct connection between a receiver and a sender, all right? So breaking the connection between you and a server uh, by forcing 
applications or different programs to pass your traffic through a user-defined list of proxies, all right? So essentially, proxy chains allows you to tunnel your traffic through a set of proxies that obviously changes your IP address and uh, it makes it harder to find out who you really are. Now, again, this is all down to anonymity, down to anonymity, and this is how one would go about achieving this uh, while performing different tasks. And I'm going to show you how to set it up. All right, so with Kali Linux, proxy chains comes pre-installed and you just need to configure it. Now, again, I'm not going to recommend any proxies that you can use. What I'm going to use is I'm going to use the Tor proxies. So if you're not familiar with Tor, Tor is essentially the Onion router and you might have heard about it uh, being used for anonymity. And uh, essentially what we're going to do is we're going to harness the power of the Tor proxies or the Tor nodes and we're going to use it to tunnel our traffic through it. Uh, so that gives us uh, anonymity. All right. So uh, essentially what you need to do first is we need to make sure that the Tor uh, is installed on our Kali Linux machine and the Tor service more specifically, not the Tor browser. So to do this, we would use the apt get install and we would hit Tor. All right. Now, again, for me, I already have it installed, but it's as you can see, it's upgrading it. And uh, once it's done, you should be good to go. And we can move to the next step, which is configuring we're essentially configuring the proxy chains file, the configuration file, and then moving on to starting the Tor service and then tunneling different speci or specific programs through the Tor proxies. So let this installation of Tor complete and uh, we'll move on to starting the Tor service and I'll show you how to start, uh, restart and stop services uh, accordingly. All right, so there we are, it's installed and now we can move on to configuring the proxy chains uh, configuration file. Now, there are different ways you can do this. And one of the ways I'm going to do it now is I'm going to use an editor, a text editor called uh, Nano, all right? Now, Nano is a terminal or a command line text editor, not a graphical user interface text editor. And uh, again, I'm not going to introduce you to Vim, which is one of the most advanced editors for Linux, especially the terminal, uh, because that deserves probably its own course because it's very, very comprehensive tool to use and to understand. So I'm just going to show you how to do this with Nano because it is the most easiest editor, especially in the terminal, right? So what we want to do is we want to hit Nano, all right? And now essentially we are configuring the proxy chains configuration file, which can be found in the directory etc proxy chains, simple as that, dot conf, all right? So dot configuration file and just hit enter. And there we are. It's going to open the configuration file. And now we have this editor. Now again, it's going to give you some information. So it's going to say proxy chains version 3.1. It's a HTTP SOX4, SOX5 tunneling proxy fire with DNS. Excellent. Now I already have configured it, but what you will find is you will find the dynamic chain has a hash at the beginning, which means it is commented. So I want you to delete the hash. So yours will be like this. I just want you to go, uh, just use your keyboard to scroll to the hash and just get it deleted and that means we've activated the dynamic chain. So I just want you to activate that. Next, what do we need to do next? Well, just leave everything as it is and you want to go to this uh, setting right here, proxy DNS requests. All right, now what this means is, uh, this is essentially asking you, do you want to leak your DNS information? And obviously we do not want to leak our DNS information because uh, again, DNS servers can reveal your true IP address. Right, so yours will be also commented, so just get rid of the comment and you should be good. Now leave every other setting and just scroll down with your mouse wheel. Uh, you can also use that as well. And there are going to be some examples here as to how you can configure the proxies. Uh, what we want to do is go to the very end and go to the proxy list right here. And as you can see, there's a SOX4 proxy added and I've added a SOX5 proxy. So we want to do that together, all right? So we're adding a SOX5 proxy that will allow traffic uh, you know, so that will allow us to pass our traffic through Tor at a, a, a much faster speed because SOX5 is much better than SOX4. All right, so SOX5, we just type in SOX5 and you can just use your space or your tab. All right, so make sure you're consistent with this. Now, the default IP address and port that the uh, that, that Tor is configured to run on Kali Linux is 127.0.0.1 with the port 9050. So we want to essentially use Tor as our proxy. So all we have to do is just hit 127.0.0.1 and same 9050, all right? So we're essentially passing all our tra traffic through Tor. 
And once we're done, we just need to hit control. So the on your keyboard, the control key and you want to hit O. All right. And this will save. It will prompt you to save. Just hit enter. And uh, to exit the editor, just hit control plus X. Fantastic. Now we have we have installed Tor. We have configured the proxy chains file. Now we need to start the Tor service. All right. To start the Tor service, like with any other service in Linux, we use the service command. So service Tor start. All right. So service Tor start, and that will start this uh, this Tor service. Excellent. Now, if you're having issues, you can restart the Tor service. So service store restart all right so restart like so and just hit enter and it'll restart the service and you can stop it as well so service tor stop now i don't want to stop it because it's uh, it's very essential that we use it all right so once you have started the tor service we can now start our proxy chains so let's say we wanted to use firefox with proxy chain so we wanted to anonymize everything that we do in the firefox browser so what we would do is we would start by saying proxy chains uh, this is the syntax of so proxy chains. Now you select the program or the command or the tool that you want to pass the traffic through. So for example, you can use proxy chains with nmap. You can use proxy chains with the Metasploit console. You can use proxy chains with Armitage, etc, etc. Right, so we can say proxy chains and since we're using Firefox, I'm just going to hit Firefox and after this you can select a website that you want to open. So I'm going to open a site that will check for my IP address and it's going to check whether or not I have leaked any DNS information. So that site is www.dnsleaktest.com. I'm going to hit enter and it's going to start the proxy chains. And uh, again, it's going to wait for, to, for the Mozilla Firefox to start up. Give it a few seconds. There we are and the proxy chains have started. And uh, there we are, Firefox has started as well. Let me just close my previous session there. And again, give it a few seconds. Now, one thing I do have to point out is that the proxy chains will be slow depending on the proxies that you choose. Now, I do not recommend you going out there and Google searching for free proxies because you cannot trust them, right? You, you're essentially passing your traffic through a proxy that you cannot trust and that is essentially leaking your information. So there we are. It's opened the site and uh, www.dnsleaktest.com and it's saying, hello, uh, you're from Bucharest, Romania, and uh, I can confirm that I'm not in Romania. And we can see that it's working. It has anonymized all my activity. Next, we can run the standard test button right here that will test our DNS information to see what DNS servers that we're currently using. And if we have gone, if everything has been configured correctly, we should be uh, using DNS servers that are not related to my location. All right. So just give this a few seconds. Uh, it shouldn't take too much time at all. Now, let me just minimize this. Now, as you can see, some activity is happening in the terminal in which we started our proxy chains. And you can see it is essentially connecting your the Tor proxy port right here and the uh, the IP and the port to a new IP address, which pretty much uh, the IP that we saw over there, which is the, the one at Bucharest and the site's IP. So you can see uh, all the activity passing through the terminal. Now, again, just give it a few seconds here. Again, I'm going to really, really pass, uh, you know, a little disclaimer that the connection will not be the fastest connection that you can use. All right, so again, just let this run and it should show that, that the DNS servers are using are in another geographical location. All right, so that's going to be it for this video. In the next video, we're going to be looking at starting the different network services. Hello everyone, welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to be looking at starting the different network services in Kali Linux. And you might be sitting there asking yourself, why do we need to do this? Well, essentially, Kali Linux comes bundled with several network services that are very, very useful in different situations. All right, they're going to be disabled by default. Now, looking at some of these services, we have the Apache 2 service, which allows us to run a local web server, which is awesome. We then have the SSH service, which essentially is the secure shell that allows us to communicate between two computers uh, securely, which is, again, very, very important. And we're going to be looking at how to start these services. All right, so let's get started, really. Now, again, we looked at this previously in the previous video when we we're talking about proxy chains and how to start the Tor service. So the syntax is very, very simple to start a service. We essentially go with service Apache 2, which is the service name and what we want to do. So in this case, we want to start it. But remember, we can restart it. We can stop it. 
All right, so once we hit start, it's going to start the Apache 2 service. And there we are. Now, if I copied files or I actually uh, moved web applications into the local host uh, files, into the local host directory, I would be able to actually access them through my browser with the local host, which is awesome. All right, now let's look at the secure shell, which is very, very important. And I'm going to elaborate on this a little bit more. So to start the SSH service, we essentially use service SSH and start. And once that's started, that's awesome. We already have a good starting point here. Now you might be asking, uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on why SSH is so important? Well, SSH allows you to connect between two computers, right? And you can perform commands and you essentially have full control over that computer remotely and securely. All right. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and connect uh, to this Kali Linux machine from my Windows operating system. And I'm going to do this using a tool called Putty. So if you're not familiar with Putty, Putty is, a, is essentially an SSH client that allows you to connect to different client servers all around the world. All right. But before we start, we need to know the IP address for the Kali Linux machine. This is very, very important. Uh, since we're on local layer network, we already know the local address is going to be uh, an IP on the network. So that is 192.168.1.106. All right. Now, since we already know that, we need to remember what the SSH port is. Now, again, I'm going to ask you uh, if you do not know what the SSH port is. Uh, the SSH port is uh, really the, the port through which the connection is made. And... Uh, if you've gone through the SSH port, you will know that the SSH port is at port 22. All right. Now that is very, very important because as I'm going to show you, I'm going to connect to the Scalinux uh, machine via Putty. All right. So I'm going to minimize VMware and I'm just going to open up Putty here. I already have it on my taskbar because I use it a lot. And as you can see, by default, the port is set to port 22. And uh, now you can select the different connection type. We're using SSH. And I'm going to just enter the IP address 192.168.1.106. That's the IP address of the Kali Linux virtual machine. And I'm going to hit open. And it's going to open up this terminal and it's going to ask me, it's going to say that the server's host key is not cached. That's because we have not created the SSH keys, which we'll be looking at in future videos. So I'm just going to hit yes. And it's going to say login as. Now it's essentially asking me for my username. So I'm logging in as root. And it's going to ask me for the password and I'm going to say, I'm going to enter my password. Uh, I think that's the password. That should be the password now. Hmm, for some reason, that's not working. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, exit the connection. I'm going to try that again and log in from my other username, which is uh, Alexis. All right. So 106, like so. And I'm just going to open connection and I'm just going to say Alexis and the password. There we are. All right. So uh, we essentially we, we, we have got connection now. Uh, and uh, as you can see, we can now perform Linux commands uh, and we have access to the uh, to the Kali Linux virtual machine. So if I list the files, you can see that we have uh, the default directory. So I'm just going to go backwards to the home directory and I'm just going to go back and uh, list all the files. And there we are. You essentially have connection to the uh, Kali Linux virtual machine. And that's why SSH is so important because uh, you can actually connect and use your virtual machine remotely or on your local air network. So it's really, really awesome. And that is how to start up the different services like Apache 2 and SSH, which are going to be very, very important as we move on. All right. So that is section two in a wrap where we looked at working with Kali Linux. All right. So now let's look at a summary of what we've gone through in this section all right so we started off with installing our virtualization tools in this case we went on and installed vmware tools on Kali linux and we were able to get full access of the virtual machine all right we then moved on to updating Kali linux where we looked at updating the repositories the packages and then finally the entire distribution we then moved on to setting up proxy chains and configuring the proxy chains file and after that we moved on to installing Tor and finally starting the Tor service and proxy chains giving us anonymity as we were passing or tunneling our traffic through the Tor relay. Right after that we looked at starting our different network services for example SSH and Apache that were very very essential and we also learned how to start the different services on Kali Linux. Right to wrap up the section, we looked at a quick win where we were looking at WordPress hacking with WordPress scan. So we used WordPress scan to brute force a login uh, on WordPress. All right. So that was section two in a wrap. And uh, in the next section, we will be looking at information gathering. So I'll be seeing you in the next section. 
Hello everyone and welcome to section 3, information gathering. So in this section, we're going to be performing information gathering on our target. Alright, so let's look at what we'll be looking at in this section. So we'll start off with gathering DNS enumeration. So we're going to be using a tool called DNS enum to gather DNS information on our target. Alright, we will then move to a more classic way of searching for information or information gathering. We will be performing a whois lookup and a subdomain enumeration on our target. Alright, so we will use whois uh, lookup tools and we will get information about our target and we'll, we'll then look at how to enumerate subdomains belonging to a target using a tool called knockpy. Alright, after doing that we will then uh, be looking at how to find open ports on our target with nmap. Alright, so we're going to be using nmap as our network scanner to find open ports on our target. Uh, that way giving us uh, the ability to see what services we can exploit. Alright, we will then move on very very closely to OS and service fingerprinting, essentially using nmap to detect what operating system and services that are running on our target. Alright, so that is called OS and service fingerprinting. So we'll also be using nmap for that. And finally, we'll be looking at Multigo. Uh, more specifically, we'll be gathering information on our target using a tool called Multigo, which is a graphical user interface, a very, very good tool, one of the best tools in information gathering. All right, so that is what we'll be looking at in section three, looking at information gathering. So uh, I'll see you in the first video. In this video, we're going to be looking at DNS enumeration. Alright, so DNS enumeration is the process of locating all DNS servers and the entries for the organization or the target that you're trying to perform uh, the enumeration on. Now you might be wondering what exactly does DNS mean? Well, DNS is the domain name servers and these are the servers in which uh, an IP address and a host name are resolved. Okay, so uh, DNS enumeration will allow us to gather information, uh, really, really cr critical information about the organization that we're trying to target, such as the usernames, the computer names, and the IP addresses, you know, and so on. Now, to achieve this, we'll be using a tool called DNS Enum, or uh, DNS Enumeration, but it's shortened up, and it's called DNS Enum or enum for that matter. So let's get started. Now it comes pre-installed and pre-configured in Kali Linux and uh, let's see how we can use it. All right, so I'm just going to open up my terminal and it's really very simple. Now I'm just going to expand it so we have a good idea of what's going on here. Okay, interesting. Now let's get started. Now the syntax is really very simple and uh, the, uh, the command is very, very simple. It is DNS enum. All right, so DNS enum and uh, that is the command. And that is the tool. Now, if we use the help command, which is followed by the double dash and help, this will display all the options that you have available that you can use with DNS enum. Now, the very, very important thing I want to show you guys is this help menu is really, really useful if you're new to a tool or a technique and can be really, really interesting if you just perform some research. Uh, now, we'll be looking at uh, quite a few of these options, but uh, let's look at how to perform a basic uh, enumeration on a website, all right, for example. So I'm going to be using my website in this demonstration, and I just want to point out that I'm going to blur out the uh, critical information about my website, uh, you know, just for privacy uh, protection and, uh, you know, so on and so forth. Now, again, I do have to pass out caution. You know, I wouldn't recommend you actively engaging with your target uh, if you do not have written permission in the sense that if you're performing a penetration test on a company, uh, you know, you better have written permission to do so. Otherwise, you can test your own sites or sites that you own, or you can build your own virtual lab and test them from there. As I'm doing right now, I'm going to be using my website, all right, which is hackersploit or hsploit.com. So to use the tool, we use the DNS enum tool. And after that, I specify my website. So my website is hsploit.com. And let's see what information it gives us about my uh, website what DNS information gives on my website. So uh, let me just hit enter and uh, it's going to start the process. And as you can see, we're getting some information here. And now let's look at the results because it's very, very important. So it's going to get the host address. All right. So it's got the host address and it's got the IP address right here. Very, very interesting information as we've got there. Now, uh, looking at the results, we have uh, name servers, which is very, very important. And it can give you more information about the servers in which it is being resolved at and their IP addresses. And from then on, you get an idea of how the target is communicating with the DNS servers. 
Uh, furthermore, it prints out the mail servers. Interesting, very, very interesting. Mail servers are a great uh, attack vector and can provide a very, very uh, good entry level, you know, for performing an attack. Now, uh, as I said, I'm going to cover the IP information just for privacy purposes uh, so that uh, we have a good info. We you know we can have some good privacy. Otherwise, that is the information that it did get. And uh, this information is really useful because we were able to resolve the domain name servers that are currently being used and we have got the IP addresses. Furthermore, we were able to get the IP addresses that belong to the mail servers. OK, now let's look at some more options that we can use with DNS enum. All right. So some of them include. Uh, so let me just bring up the help menu here. So DNS enum help. All right. And uh, one of the options that we can look at is how to use the output location, which is simply printing out output, which is the O right here. So this allows us to output the information in XML format. Very, very useful if you're performing a penetration test uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, as you're performing a penetration test, and I'm talking about this in on a professional level, it is very, very important to document all the scans that you're doing on the target. All right, so this would be a very, very interesting thing to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to browse to my desktop. So change directory desktop, and I'm going to create a folder there called uh, results, right? So results, and I'm going to change my directory into that folder. Excellent. Now I'm going to save my results uh, in this folder. So I'm going to perform the scan again. So DNS enum, right? And we simply put the output and uh, we specify the file. Now, if we look at the help menu before we do this, uh, we're going to see something very, very important. It's going to give you the syntax. So it's going to say O, or you can use the double dash and use output and you specify the file and the output should be in XML format. All right. Very, very uh, important to note that. So let's perform the scan here now. So I'm going to say DNS uh, enum and I'm going to specify uh, the website. So hsploit.com and I'm going to specify the output and I want to save it in a file called hsploit.xml. Uh, All right. This would be the standard way of doing so. And I did enter and uh, there we are. It's going to uh, get the information and indeed it is going to save it in a uh, XML file. So let me just check whether it's created the file. So let me just list what files we have there. So uh, there we are. We do have the hsploy.xml file. So let me clear this out and I'm going to just see whether or not we can access it. And there we are on my desktop. If I open up the results folder, uh, there we are hsploy.xml. And if I open it up with the text editor, we can see that it gives us information about the website that we've just performed the scan on, which in this case is hsploit.com. Awesome. So now we have information and we have saved the information, which is very, very crucial uh, when performing any type of enumeration or uh, scanning for that matter. All right. Um, now let's look at some of the more important commands. All right. So uh, if we look at the DNS enum help menu, help. We can see that we have options regarding who is requests, all right? And that is denoted by the W command right here, all right? So this allows you to perform who is queries uh, on the network ranges, as it says, all right? So what this uh, essentially does, is going to perform who is uh, queries on the website to get more information about the website or for an organization in a larger scale, all right? So let's see if we can do that. So I'm going to uh, use the same command DNS enum specify the site. I'm not going to output the information this time. I'm just going to hit the W command and or you can enter this command before you enter the website uh, or you can do it after. It really doesn't matter. So I'm just going to hit enter and let's see what information we get. All right. So not a lot of uh, additional information was found. As you can see, warning cannot load the who is IP module who is queries are disabled. So that means my website is disabled who is queries. And that is a security feature that I did implement. But regardless of uh, whether or not I have implemented this, if the site is less secure, which is what we're trying to find out, this would be a great uh, place uh, to perform a who is uh, attack or a who is query for that matter. It's not really an attack. Sorry about that. All right, so that is how to perform DNS enumeration on a target. Now you can do this on an IP address as well as, uh, you know, doing this on, uh, for example, a website as we just did. And it's a fantastic way of gathering information about the domain name servers and the mail servers, as you have seen. And that can hopefully give you insight or give you a bit of more information about the target and how the target is set up. 
All right, so I'll be seeing you in the next video. We're going to be performing some information gathering. And more specifically, we're going to be looking at how to get some who is information about your target. Hello everyone and welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to be performing some information gathering. And more specifically, we're going to be looking at how to get some who is information about your target. And furthermore, we'll be looking at how to enumerate subdomains uh, that belong to a target website. And obviously from that, uh, that can help you understand the threat that your website uh, or the target website has or poses to itself. All right, so let's get started. Now, as I said, we're going to be looking at how to gather who is information. Now, who is information is very, very important and is essentially uh, basically put is information that is very crucial to the target and that can be easily found online. Uh, and, you know, it's just general information about the target that you're dealing with. For example, if I use my website, which is what we're going to be using, uh, performing a who is lookup will give me all information that is related to the website. For example, it'll give me the owner information. It will give me uh, the web host information. It will give me the location of the servers, uh, whether or not the length of the domain purchase, a lot of information that we can look at. So let's get started with gathering who is information. Now, uh, it's really very simple. And one of the best websites for this is who is dot domain tools dot com. I will uh, add this link uh, to the resources and you can check it out for yourself. Now, again, looking at the website, it is very, very simple. Let me just zoom in there. All you have to do is enter a domain or IP address, as it says here, and it's going to give you all information that it can gather about the target that you've selected. So I'm going to enter my website, which is hsploit.com. And there we are. It has got the results. Uh, hsploit.com and as you can see uh, it is registered to my name and if you go down it is sorted the information is sorted really really well so it has the registrant country uh, you have your your registrar status the dates as to how old the website is depending on when it was created updated and hosted you then have the name servers which is also awesome you know uh, we, we looked at in the previous video how to enumerate dns information but here it just gives you the exact servers uh, in which it is being hosted with much more information for example the amount of domains that these servers are hosting furthermore it will give you the technology contact uh, which is essentially contact details to the target uh, followed by the IP address for the web server, which is also very, very important. And as you can see, if you look closely to the IP address section, it's going to give you more information about the other sites that could be hosted on the server. In this case, we have 5,230 other websites hosted on the server. When it comes down to IP location, it'll give you the IP location uh, for the web server, the domain status, depending on whether or not it's been registered and active, who is history, uh, the IP history and a lot of information, right? So you can then uh, go ahead and check the who is record and you know, you can enter the capture here and hopefully that gives you the information. There we are and it gives you all the information right here. So uh, as you can see with the who is lookup, we're getting a lot of information about the target. And as I've said, you can use an IP address or a domain name or a domain for that matter, in which case uh, you choose uh, depending on what target you're performing the scan on or you're gathering information for. All right. So that is how to perform a who is lookup for your target. And this will give you great insight as to who your target is. And from this way onwards, you can focus on how to target the attack or how to protect yourself, uh, depending on which side of the spectrum that you're on. All right. Uh, now let us look at how to enumerate subdomains. All right. So uh, the tool that we're going to be using now is a tool that is not pre-installed on Kali Linux, but it is a tool called Knock. Now I here have the link of the GitHub repository uh, in which you can, you know, download it from and use it. All right. So a NOCPY is essentially a subdomain scanner that uh, is used to enumerate subdomains on a target domain through a word list. All right. So as you can see, it gives you information about what it does here. Now this will essentially uh, enumerate any subdomains connected to your domain. Now, again, with big companies or with most companies that are performing testing on their websites, they usually create subdomains in which you can say they're testing a specific product or they have a member exclusive web page. For example, uh, you know, some sites have login reg registration or also have premium memberships, a subdomain to a premium membership. You know, if one is able to scan 
uh, they can actually get access through this because with a tool like NotPy, it'll enumerate the subdomains connected to the domain. And you know, those subdomains may not be secure and you know, they could be confidential. So uh, this is a fantastic way of understanding what subdomains exist. And again, uh, depending on whether or not you're a penetration tester or you're looking to protect the website, uh, this is a fantastic tool to get information about what subdomains uh, you have on your website and how they can be accessed. All right, so uh, as I've said, it does not come pre-installed on Kali Linux, so we're gonna be doing this together. So what you wanna do on GitHub is, hopefully you're running this on Kali Linux, I would hope so. What you want to do is go uh, to the clone or download section on GitHub and you want to click on it and just go to this uh, copy to clipboard section and just copy it right there. All right, so once you've hit that, we've copied the link. Now we need to clone the repository on our desktop or in any other directory you feel is comfortable for you. So open up the terminal. It's really very simple. Uh, we're gonna be using Git. So I'm just gonna zoom in so we can see what's going on here. And I'm gonna change my directory to my desktop. All right, so once I've changed my directory to my desktop, I'm going to hit Git clone. All right, so this is the command that we use to clone GitHub repositories to a specific directory. In this case, we're specifying the desktop as our directory. And then I'm just going to paste in the link that we copied. You can also right click and paste it. And uh, once you've uh, pasted it, just hit enter and it's going to start downloading the files or in uh, layman's terms, it's going to be uh, cloning the files to your desktop. And uh, once it's done, if we just open it up, you can see we have a lot of files and there's no need to get worried here. What we need to do is we need to head back to the GitHub repository. Now this is if you're a beginner. If you're a beginner, I would recommend that you go through the readme file right here. So as you can see, it gives you the uh, information on how you can uh, initiate the scan. But more importantly, we need to look at the prerequisites that are required. Now the dependencies, as you can see here, it requires DNS Python. All right, so it gives you the command here to install it. So let's do that. So you want to copy this command right here. And uh, we want to go into a terminal and we want to paste it in here. And uh, if you're not in root, it's going to prompt you for your root password. So enter that. Uh, I'm already in root. Uh, so I'm going to hit enter and it's going to download the dependencies. And as you can see, it is already installed for me and uh, I don't need to do it again. So we've already cloned the repository. Now what we need to do is we need to, uh, to install uh, the setup.py file, which is a Python file. So we need to do this from the terminal. So I'm going to change the directory into the knock file, which is on the desktop, like so. And I'm going to list what's inside. And as you can see, we have the setup.py or .py, which is an extension for a Python file. So it is a Python file. All right, to in so to install this, we need to execute the Python file. But before that, we need to understand that uh, the Python file, the setup.python file is not executable. So we have to change the permissions. To do this, we use the chmod uh, plus x, all right? So we're changing permissions to executable and we select the file, so setup.py. And once that's done, we list the files. You can see that it is turned to green, which means we can execute it. So to, to execute it, I'm just going to say Python setup.py. And once I hit enter, it's going to start the setup process. So give it a few seconds to start it. Oh, actually, if it gives you this error, don't worry about that. What we want to do is we want to change directory into the NockPy directory. So cd NockPy. All right. So I'm, I'm going to list what files are in here. And uh, it's going to give you the NockPy.py uh, file. Uh, th that was actually uh, since the setup is unnecessary. Uh, so uh, again, we have to change the permissions for the knockpy.py file. So chmod plus x and we select knockpy.py. And once that's done, if we list the files again, as you can see, it is able to be executed now. So we say Python and knockpy.py. And once we start that, we know that it's working because it's going to give us the usage arguments. All right. So the usage arguments are simple. It's essentially telling you how to use it and to use it. It's really very simple. If we go back here. The usage is really, really simple. We just select NockPy and after that we specify the domain. So let's do that right now and I'm going to be performing this on my website. All right, so I'm going to specify Python. Uh, so NockPy.py and I'm going to select the domain. So hsploit.com and I'm going to hit enter and it's going to start the scan. There we are. All right, so it's going to check for all the information it can gather. It's going to start looking for any subdomains or performing the subdomain scan. 
Now this can take a while depending on the size of the website and again, uh, you know, depending on the connection of your internet. Uh, so give it a while and uh, I'll get back to you guys when it's done. All right, so the subdomain scan has finished or the subdomain enumeration has finished and we've got some results. Now, very, very interesting. We've got a lot of subdomains that are linked to my domain. And as you can see, these can be quite useful. We have the FTP subdomain. We have the all the mail subdomains. So these give you a better idea of who your target is and how to structure an attack. So, you know, gathering information is the uh, most critical stage. And, you know, using NOCPY, uh, gathering subdomain information and obviously enumerating the subdomains is a very, very good resource that you should have at your disposal. And this can help you in structuring uh, your attacks uh, or your attack vectors for that matter. All right, uh, so that's going to be it for this video. I'll be seeing you in the next video where we'll be looking at uh, how to scan for open ports with Nmap. And yeah, I'll see you in the next video. Hello everyone and welcome to this video. In this video we're going to be performing an Nmap scan to find open ports on our target network. Alright, so let's get started. So I've, as I've mentioned, we're going to be using Nmap. Now if you don't know what Nmap is, Nmap is essentially a network scanning tool that allows you to scan a network and obviously it'll give you results depending on what parameters uh, or variables that you set the scan to be scanned with. All right, uh, now we have already got information about our IP address, all right? As we have already looked in previous videos, uh, you know, re regarding the who is uh, information and subdomains. So we know an IP address and we know our target uh, or we know our domain. And now we need to get some more information regarding what ports are open on our target or on our target network. Now for this demonstration, we're going to start using Metasploitable 2. The reason being is Metasploitable 2 is a fantastic uh, demonstration or a way of demonstrating how ports can be exploited. All right, so I have Metasploitable 2 uh, open and running here and I'm just going to log in. So the default credentials are MSF admin. All right, so once you're logged into MSF admin, what you need to do is you need to get your uh, local IP address on your local network. So we have already looked at how to build our virtual lab and now more specifically, we're going to be finding we're going to be looking at how to uh, check for our IP address. All right. So um, there we are. And now looking at the IP address, we use the command IF config and uh, we have the INET address right here. And that is the local IP address that we're going to be using to scan. So it's 192.168.1.106. Yours could be different depending on the router or the network configuration that you're using. So let's get started with Nmap. So you can launch Nmap from your terminal, which is really very simple. So let me just clear this up. Fantastic. All right, now we can get started. So the syntax is very, very simple. All right, but first I want to look at the Nmap help menu. So we can do this by typing in Nmap and followed by the two dashes and help that will enumerate the help menu. So if we click at the help menu, this is a fantastic starting point or a reference that you know you can keep on looking at uh, you know if you're still a beginner to Nmap and it has all the commands and what these commands will do respectively. Uh, so there's a lot to look in here and we'll be using this as a guideline or as a template as to how we're going to be performing our scans. So we know the IP address of the Metasploitable 2 virtual machine which in this case is acting as a web server so it is fantastic for simulating a real world attack. And again, I do not recommend you doing this on a network in which you do not have permission to do this on. So I would recommend that you have written permission before doing this on any actual physical network. But in this case, we have already created our virtual lab and you know, it's fantastic. So uh, let's get started here. So uh, to use Nmap, it's very simple. As we've seen, we use the Nmap command. And after this, to, to perform a basic scan, we just enter the IP address. So we know it is 192.168.1.106. All right, that is the IP address. Now, if we hit enter, this is going to perform a basic scan, essentially scan all the ports uh, that are currently open. And we'll be looking at more information depending on what is returned to us. So I'm going to hit enter and immediately it scans for the ports. Now, I want to just give you some more information about Nmap. Nmap by default will scan for a thousand ports. That is by default. You can, however, configure this to your liking. And this is where you get more advanced with Nmap. Now, as you can see, it's returned ports. Fantastic. We have an actual result 
And this is great because we can understand how this is all working out. Now, given for the results, as you can see, it's going to tell you the host is up, which means it performed a ping scan to check whether the host was up. It gives you the latency information. It will then show you the amount of ports that it did scan and information about the ports that were closed. So 977 closed ports, and these are the ports that are currently open. Okay, so let's look at how the ports are, or how the information is displayed to us. So first you have your port and you have your state and the service. So the port is simply the port number. If you've learned about TCP, IP and ports, you will already know pretty much all of the ports and what services are running on these ports. The state is essentially whether or not the port is open. Now the state could alternate between open, closed or filtered. All right, so when the port is closed, that means that the port is closed. When the port is filtered, it means that Nmap is unable to determine whether the port is open or closed. When it's open, it means it's open. It's pretty self-explanatory. Again, so we, as we have here, we have port 21, which we all don't know is the FTP port. Port 22 is the SSH port. Uh, port 23 is the Telnet port, etc., etc. All right, so we have a good idea of what ports are running here and what services are running behind them. Awesome, this is exactly what we wanted to look at uh, in this video. We wanted to look at what ports we could, looking at how to scan for ports on a target, and indeed, we have uh, found the ports on the target. All right, now, let's look at one more command that is very, very important. As I've said during a penetration test, one of the most important steps is documenting your scan. So, uh, and that is done by uh, essentially outputting your scan results and saving it so that you have some accountability behind your scan and you can date your scans and actually it acts as a proof of work uh, in terms of definition. So it's essentially acting as documentation. So this is always good practice if you're a penetration tester. All right, so we're gonna perform the scan again. So Nmap, we're just performing a basic scan. So we'll list the IP address. And now we use the parameter or the command uh, O G. All right. So we use the dash and a capital G to output. And now we want to output uh, it onto the root onto my desktop. And I want to save it as a TXT file. So I'm just going to call it nmap uh, underscore results dot txt and it's going to perform the scan and it's going to scan it and it's going to save it to the TXT file on my desktop. There we are nmap uh, results dot txt and let it just open up there we are and it has scanned and it has returned all the results it may not have returned them in a appropriate format but it can always be uh, reformatted and this acts as a fantastic way uh, of documentation because as you can see it gives you timestamps and that is again a fantastic way of documentation uh, so that's going to be it for this video we looked at how to perform some port scanning in the next video, we're going to be looking at OS and service fingerprinting, which is also very, very important uh, in terms of information gathering. So I'll be seeing you in the next video. Hello everyone and welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to be looking at OS and service fingerprinting. So we've gone through information gathering and we have gathered some very, very important information. So uh, we have gathered DNS information. We have gathered the IP addresses that we have required about the target or IP addresses that belong to the target. We have found the open ports and identified them to the network or the target, uh, as you have seen in the previous video when we did it to our Metasploitable 2 uh, virtual machine, which is acting as our web server. So we've gathered DNS information, we've got IP addresses, we've got the open ports. Now we need to find or determine what operating systems and services are running on these systems so that we know what type of systems we're penetration testing or we're performing the penetration test against. So again, it is really about gathering as much information as possible about a target. And this time we need to find out uh, what operating system the server or our target is running and what services are also running, what versions of the services are running. And we're going to be using Nmap for this. All right, so again, we're going to be utilizing Metasploitable 2, and this is what we're going to be using because it is, acts as a fantastic representation of how a web server can be exploited. Uh, so let's get started. So we already know the IP address of the Metasploitable 2 virtual machine. As you can see, it may be different for you, and that really doesn't matter. All you need to do is get the local IP address uh, because we are doing this locally on our virtual lab. All right, so we're just going to open up our terminal, and this was the previous uh, scan result, so I'm just going to clear this up. All right, now we can get started. So as I've mentioned, we are performing 
OS and service fingerprinting, which is essentially operating system and service fingerprinting. Now, Nmap has a feature that is able to scan and it will scan for operating systems on your target. So let's do this. So we use the Nmap command. Now we're using the O parameter, but it's going to be a capital O. All right. So uh, it is the O parameter. We then specify the IP address. So 192.168.1. 106 and once we hit enter it's going to perform the nmap scan all right it's going to give us the timestamp and now we have additional information all right so in the previous video when we performed the basic scan it's going to scan for all the open ports no doubt about that but in this case since we have added the o parameter right here that scans for operating systems or uh, actually detects the operating system running on the server or the target it's going to return some more information at the bottom here so it's going to give you information here. So running, it is running Linux 2.6. So it's running a Linux 2.6 kernel. The operating system is Linux. Uh, it's running the Linux kernel. There we are. So 2.6 and the OS details is Linux 0.9 and it gives you more information. Now this information is vitally important, especially when you're looking at it from a penetration tester, from a penetration testing standpoint and also from an attacker's standpoint because you can find specific vulnerabilities that are in line or are in tune with this version of Linux, you know, given the fact that it's, it is quite an outdated version. But uh, that aside, we have been able to gather information about the operating system, which is vitally important. So we're gathering a lot of information now, and we're really, really moving on. Okay, now uh, I just want to show you that this does exist in the help menu. All right, so if I just open up the Nmap help menu, and we look for the O command, uh, which uh, there we are, OS detection, it has its own section. When we use the O command, this enables the operating system detection. Right, so we've detected the operating system that is running and we know it's Linux, all right? And more specifically, it's running uh, the Linux 2.6 kernel. Right, now, uh, what we need to do now is we need to uh, perform service fingerprinting, which is equally as important, all right? So this will determine the services running on specific ports, all right? And this will really, really determine how good your penetration test, your success rate is going to be. All right, so uh, let's get started now. To perform service fingerprinting, we use the Nmap command and we use the S and capital V parameter, which we'll be looking at in the Nmap help menu in a few seconds. All right, so 192.168.1.106. Fantastic. Now, once we hit enter, it's going to perform the scan. Uh, it's going to take relatively longer than the other scans because this is now, you're really focusing the scan down. Fantastic. There we are. We have information now. This is critically important because these all act as an attack vector and i'm going to explain how as we'll be moving along in it through the course we're going to be looking at exploiting a system all right and these are going to be very very useful attack vectors now for example if we look at the results it's given us we have a whole new table here uh the version table all right so this is essentially the version of the software of the service that is running on the port so let's take an example Let's say uh, we have the uh, port 21, which is an FTP port. It is running VSFTPD 2.3.4. Let me just copy this and open this uh, in my browser. And I'm just going to paste this and I'm going to say VSFTPD 2.3.4 exploits. All right. I'm just going to search for exploits. Simple as that. I'm just going to do a normal, uh, you know, search engine search. And immediately the first link is taking us to the Rapid7 website. Uh, which is essentially going to give us a Metasploit uh, exploit that we can use with the MSF console. As you can see, VSFTPD version 2.3.4 backdoor command execution. So already we have found that this service or this service fingerprinting scan has given us the services and we have found a vulnerability already with one of these services. And this already poses as a fantastic attack vector that one would really look at. And again, you can look at all the other ones. For example, we have the Apache, which we can see is running a remote web server. We then have the MySQL, PostgreSQL, VNC protocol, which is also very, very tempting. Uh, you know, if you use tools like Hydra to brute force the VNC credentials, you can get VNC access, which is also equally uh, as important or actually very, very powerful uh, as an attack. So as you can see, we have got the services that are running on the web server, which uh, more specifically is the Metasploitable virtual machine. And uh, this is really, really fantastic. And uh, now, as you can see, we have learned how to uh, perform 
operating system fingerprinting and also service fingerprinting and now we know what operating system the server is running on and we know what versions of the services that are running on the ports of the web server in which we are trying to target. So that's going to be it for this video. In the next video, we'll be looking at how to use Multigo for information gathering, which is also a very, very important tool. So I'll be seeing you in the next video. Hello everyone and welcome to this video. In this video, we are going to be exploring Multigo. Now, for those of you who do not know what Multigo is, Multigo is an open source threat assessment tool that was designed to demonstrate the complexity and severity of a single point of failure on a network. All right, so it's a fantastic tool for being able to gather information from both internal and external sources. And from all of this information, it, you're able to build a clear picture. All right, and we'll be looking at this really, really well uh, in this video. Okay, so Multigo comes pre-installed uh, with Kali Linux. And I just want to point something out that there is an option to buy the pro version of Multigo, which costs, I think, about roughly $300 to $400. However, you can use the community version, which is what we're going to be using. It'll work just fine. So Multigo is a very, very powerful tool, and it really is a fantastic information gathering tool uh, that allows you to gather information, and it allows you the information to be displayed or aggregated to the user uh, in a way that is understandable, rather than getting your information in forms of text. Uh, and we'll be looking at this. So what you can do is if you're freshly installed Kali Linux, it will come on your favorites and it'll be this logo right here with the three uh, little circles. And if you hover over it, it's going to be called Multigo. Uh, alternatively, you can go to the menu here and go to your information gathering section and you can find it there as well. All right. So once you open it up, like I've just done uh, right here, it's going to start Multigo up and you're going to be prompted through a setup. Now, if it's your first time running this, it'll probably take a, a bit longer. And if you're running this on a virtual machine, it might be a bit slow. But once it's started, it should uh, come up to speed. All right. So as you can see, it's starting the modules and it's uh, done loading the modules. Now, as I said, if you've just run the program for the first time, which I'm guessing you have, uh, it's going to take you through a, a setup screen that will prompt you to create an account. You have to create an account and register the community version. All right, so once you have registered an account, you can log in and it will take you to this screen right here. Now, it may look a little bit overwhelming and, uh, you know, you just have to keep it really simple. So I'll be talking you through very, very basically through the taskbar or the toolbar here, more specifically because Multigo is a very advanced tool and I cannot cover everything. But we'll be looking at, uh, you know, performing an actual uh, scan on our target, all right? So if you look at the transform hub, these are essentially transforms and they are like modules that give you extra functionality with Multigo. Now, uh, by default, uh, I would just recommend that you install the default one, which should be pre-installed and the case file entities. All right. As you can see, the other modules can give you additional functionality, but come with the commercial or the professional version of Multigo uh, rather than the community version. So again, it might be stripped uh, of features, but you can do a lot of good information gathering with the community version. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to this icon here and just click on it and just hit new. All right. So that'll essentially create a new project. Give it a few seconds. It usually takes a few seconds. All right. So now uh, it's opened up and yeah, looks great. But uh, you might be asking yourself, well, what's going on exactly? No need to get worried. I'm going to take you through all the basics. So at the top here, you have your toolbar and it is sorted out in terms of view entities. We'll be looking at that a little bit more in a few seconds. We have collections, transforms, uh, where you can look at the transform hub and the manager, which are, are the modules that we were talking about. Then have the machines. You can stop all machines. And there's a lot of other stuff here that is really advanced, but we are going to be looking at it from a very basic perspective and in order to get our scan done. All right. So on your left, you have your entity palette, All right, This is going to contain all your entities that you have installed and they provide different vectors of selecting a target. So for example, you can perform a scan on a domain, which is what we're going to be doing. All right. Now to your right, you have your graph. Uh, your graph is where you'll be laying out everything and where all the information will be displayed. So let me show you how it's done. So 
in order to, for you to get started, let's say we want to perform a scan uh, on my website, all right, for example. So my website is a domain. So I'm just going to drag the domain onto the new graph, all right? And uh, it looks like it did. If it doesn't, just drag it again. All right, fantastic. So as you can see, you can zoom in and out with your mouse wheel. And if you right click, you can drag to adjust the view. So I'm just going to zoom out and zoom in back so we can see what's going on. Now, by default, it's already selected a domain called paterva.com. Uh, there are two ways of doing this. You can double click on that and it'll give you the ability to edit that. And I'm just going to change it to my website. All right. So I'm going to hit hsploit.com and I'm going to hit enter. All right. The other way to do it is to double click on the domain and it's going to open up and you just select the domain name. All right. You can also add notes and other information here regarding the domain, uh, you know, for documentation purpose, but we're not going to be doing that. So I'm just going to close that up. So you might be asking now what? How do we get started with the actual information gathering? Well, since we've already we have added the domain property, we can now uh, click on it. If we click on it or we click on it right here through the detail view and we go to this tab right here, we have the property view. This just gives you information that we already pretty much know, which is uh, what the domain is, uh, which is hsploit.com. And uh, we have set everything there. Now we can get started with the actual scanning. So once the target is set, we can start gathering information. So to begin, we right click on the domain. Okay. And uh, we go to the run transform. It's the run transform menu. And now we can select all of these transforms, which are essentially simply put scans. So we can expand this. And as you can see, there's a lot of information we can gather. So we can get DNS name. Uh, so that is database DNS information. We can get the uh, mail server, the name servers, you can get um, uh, the email addresses, you can uh, look for other interesting stuff, for example, you can perform a lookup of phone numbers, which is very, very interesting, because you can actually get phone numbers related to the domain. So again, there's a lot of options here that can really, really help you. Now, as a beginner, what I would recommend is to go with all transforms, which will essentially get all the information it possibly can get. So you want to hit on this run all here okay so uh, just hit run all and um, it's going to get all the information now if we looked at the transform output right here uh, it's going to show you a log of what exactly is going on now as you can see it's gathered a lot of information all right and it's going to structure it in form of a chart so we have got a lot of information here and i'm going to be helping you through it so as you can see it has been able to get information like for example the mail servers uh, it has got the actual DNS uh, servers here at school. It's got the support email. It's got the server mail, uh, the mail server, pardon me. It's then got the servers, the actual servers, the domain name servers. It's got the website, which is hsploit.com. And uh, it's got the other servers, the FTP protocol, for example, and the mail servers, the DNS mail servers, uh, name servers for that matter. All right, so it's gathered information and we can still gather more information. So for example, what if we wanted to get, let's see the IP address. Uh, so what I would do is I would click on the site or I could click on the domain here. But more interestingly, if I wanted to get the mail server, the mail server IP address, I could go and right click and go to resolve to IP address and just run that. All right. And that would resolve it to an IP address. As you can see, I've got the IP address here which is uh, amazing because we have essentially got the IP address for the mail server. And as you can see, this is what I was talking about. Now, with most of the other information gathering tools, we were not able to get such a good visual representation of all the information that we've gathered in such an easy way. Let me explain what I'm talking about. All right. So as we've seen, when performing uh, information gathering uh, scans on a target, we needed to use the terminal or tools and the information that was displayed to us was not put in a very understandable way. Now with Multigo, as you can see, it does it in a flowchart a diagram, all right, where it gives you, it sorts it out depending on the hierarchy. So for example, you have your domain, you have your servers, your name servers, the website, the IP addresses, which are sorted down below. You have the emails and you get a great idea of how the target is designed and arranged. And from here, you can get a single point of failure, which is what we, the main focus of this tool is. All right. Now, furthermore, I'm not going to be going through Multigo because Multigo is a very, very advanced tool and it would require a course on its own. 
all right so uh you know you can perform a lot of transforms uh you know for example the email addresses which can reveal a lot of information and once you're done with your scanning this will give you a fantastic representation of the threats that your target has and the vulnerabilities that you can then exploit from there all right uh, in terms of information gathering you can see that it, it has got a lot of information that is very very useful and furthermore it is graphically arranged in a way that is very intuitive to human beings and it will really help you understanding so i would really recommend that you learn how to use multigo it's a relatively easy tool but again as i said it has a slightly steep learning curve but once you're very very good at it it becomes really really easy and efficient in terms of uh, an information gathering tool all right so that was section three in a wrap where we looked at information gathering now let's look at a summary of what we looked at in this section all right so we started off with dns enumeration where we used a tool called dns enum to gather dns information on our target we then moved on to getting more classic sense of information with who is information using the who is lookup tool we then also performed some subdomain enumeration with a tool called NockPy. All right. So after gathering subdomains and our who is information, we then moved on to finding open ports with Nmap. So we scanned our target, which was Metasploitable 2, to find what open ports were we were able to get. We then moved on to using Nmap with Metasploitable 2 to perform our OS and service fingerprinting, where we learned what operating system Metasploitable 2 was running on and what uh, services were running on the ports on Metasploitable 2. All right, we then finally finished off with exploring Multigo, which is a fantastic information gathering tool that it allows to, to perform information gathering on a graphical user interface. So that is going to be section three in a wrap. And in the next section, we'll move on to vulnerability assessment. All right, so I'll be seeing you in the next section. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this section. All right, in this section, we're going to be looking at vulnerability assessment. So let's look at what we'll be learning in this section. So the first thing we'll be looking at in this section is how to install and configure Nisus. All right. So Nisus is going to be our first vulnerability scanner that we're going to be using. And in this case, I'll be showing you how to get it installed and configured. And then we'll go over the interface. And then secondly, we'll be now finding local vulnerabilities with Nisus. So in this video, we'll be actually looking uh, for local vulnerabilities on our network and vulnerabilities on local computers on our network. All right, we will then move on to checking for Linux and Windows vulnerabilities. So we're going to be looking at uh, checking for OS specific vulnerabilities in the sense that we will be targeting Windows and Linux operating systems. All right, we will then move on to installing and configuring OpenVS, all right, which is our second vulnerability scanner and is also a fantastic tool and an alternative to Nisus. All right, so uh, in that video, we'll be looking at installing it, uh, configuring it, and then finally starting it up. Uh, and then finally, we'll close up by checking for Linux and Windows vulnerabilities with OpenVS. All right. So in here, we'll be checking for OS specific vulnerabilities, uh, the same as we did with Nisus. In this video, we're going to be looking at how to install and configure Nisus. All right. So Nisus is a vulnerability scanner or a vulnerability assessment tool. Now getting to installing Nisus, uh, before we get started with that, I just want to let you know that Nisus has two versions. It has the home version, which is essentially the free or the non-commercial version, which allows you to, uh, to have the full uh, set of features uh, that Nisus has. However, it is restricted to a very small amount of IP addresses that you can scan. More specifically, I think about 16 IP addresses. Uh, whereas the professional feed or the professional version, as it's called, is commercially used in enterprise environment where, where at least your target scope is quite large. All right. So in this course, we're going to be using the free or the home version, as it's called, because it will uh, more than likely suit our needs. Because, again, we're learning how to do this and obviously how to protect ourselves, uh, you know, from these types of attacks. But irregardless of that, the home version will work perfectly the professional version is more focused on more specifically enterprise uh, type of environments all right so let's get started so you just want to open up your browser and you want to go to www.tenable.com forward slash product forward slash nisus home all right I, I will leave this link in the resources section so you can check it out for yourself all right so as you can see here nisus home allows you to scan your personal home network up to 16 ip addresses per scanner with the same high-speed, in-depth assessments and agentless scanning convenience that Nisa subscribers enjoy. So essentially, it contains all the features, but it is just restricted to up to 16 IP addresses. 
So uh, now you need to register for an activation code. Your activation code is like your serial code for your version of Nisa's home. All right, so what, uh, in order for you to get the code, just enter your first name and your last name with your email and just hit register and they will send you your activation code. I have my activation code on my desktop. Uh, they sent it by email and I got it instantly. So I've got it just to make sure I can save time here rather than me checking for my code and then entering it. So I already have my code here and we're good to go. Uh, once you hit register, it's going to take you to the download page. If it doesn't take you to the download page, what you want to do is go to products and you want to go to the Nisus downloads under product resources. All right, so Nisus downloads and uh, on that downloads page, all the Nisus uh, downloads will be sorted out depending uh, on their operating system and the operating system architecture. All right, so Nisa 7.0.1, that is the latest version as of recording this video. It was released on the 11th of January 2018, and you can go ahead and look at the release notes. All right, so as I said, it is, all the versions are arranged depending on the, or the operating system they run on and the architecture of the operating system and the system that they run on. So, for example, we have the Windows version 64-bit, which runs on Windows Server 2008, uh, Windows Server 2012, uh, Windows 7, 8 uh, and 10 and also Server 2016. It, then you have your 32-bit version which runs on Windows 7, 8 and 10. Awesome to see this. It's a fantastic tool because it also gives you multi-platform access. All right, but we're going to be using Kali Linux for this. Uh, so we have our nisus.tmg file which is essentially a Mac OS uh, file. So you can download that if you're running Mac OS or you want to run this on your Mac-based operating system. You then have your Nisa 7.0 Debian. So this is Debian 6, 7 and 8. So any Debian distribution or Kali Linux. All right. So this is the 64 bit version. You then have your Debian 6, 7 and 8, uh, your 32 bit version. So depending on the version of, of Kali Linux you're running and your system or your computer systems architecture, whether or not your processor is 32 bit or 64 bit, you can choose the one according to your system. All right, so you have your Red Hat versions and your Fedora versions, uh, your Ubuntu versions. So they, it's really, really fantastic because it's a very, very multi-platform tool. So what you want to do is just download the Debian one, the Kali Linux one, as you can see here. Just click on the download link. Yours could be 32-bit or 64-bit. I already have mine downloaded, so we can just minimize this. And let me head over to my downloads folder. Fantastic. There it is. There's the file. So... Uh, you now might have noticed or you might be asking yourself, well, what exactly do we do now? How do we uh, move forward? Well, we need to install Nisus. All right. Now, Nisus, uh, the Nisus file that we downloaded is a .debian file. All right. Now, Kali Linux has the Debian package manager already installed and configured, which uh, essentially is pretty much the standard one that comes with all Debian based distributions. All right. So it has the Debian package manager and that's how we're going to get it installed. So just right click in your downloads folder and uh, open a terminal here. All right. Now let me just zoom this in so we have a greater idea of what's going on here. All right. Fantastic. Now that we've zoomed in, we can get a great idea of what we're doing. All right. Fantastic. Uh, so we are using the Debian package manager. Now, because we're doing that, we need to make sure that uh, we are in root. All right. So if you're not in root, you can just use the sudo command, uh, which we'll, we'll do right now. So sudo. And now we're using the Debian package manager that is denoted by the DPKG. And then we select the I command. All right. So the I command means install. And then you select the Nisus file. All right. And just hit enter. So you can hit Nisus and just hit the tab button on your keyboard or the tab key to auto complete it and just hit enter. It's going to start the installation process. I already have it installed. And as you can see, it's going to say here, unpacking Nisa 7.0.1 over 7.0.1. So it is essentially updating it. But since it's the same version, it's not going to actually update it. So for you, the installation will be pretty much the same. Just let it complete. And once it's done processing the Nisa's plugins, it should be done. Fantastic. Now, uh, something very interesting is being displayed here. Now, you might be asking yourself again, how do we access Nisus? Well, we access Nisus through our browser and I'm going to show you how to do that. So it's going to say here, you can start Nisus by typing in etc uh, initialize.t Nisus d start. All right. It's essentially saying to start Nisus, start the Nisus service. Now you can write the command that they've given you or you can use the uh, service, the service command. So service Nisus, uh, Nisus d and start. All right. So once you hit that, 
this the initial service will start and it's always good to know this command because it is essential to know how to start services as we looked at in the previous sections it is vitally important to know what services are running and how to start them all right so we have started the Nisus service. Now we need to actually access it. So it is hosted on the local host and the port is the 8834 port. And as you can see, it's giving us options here if we want to configure our scanner. But we can access a Nisus now because we need to actually activate it and we need to more specifically install it and install uh, and compile all the plugins. So just open up your browser and I'm just going to open up in this tab. So the local host is 127.0. 0 .0, 0 0.1 and the port is 8834 all right now we do not need if we enter this you'll see that is going to give us an error it's going to say that's a bad request so it's telling us here that we need to use the https scheme all right so the uh, we need to use the secure protocol so we hit https all right so i'm pretty sure you you should be familiar with this because uh, if you're using a browser, you know that we have two types of protocols, the two types of transmission protocols. We have HTTP and HTTPS. All right, so once you do that, just hit enter. And it's going to tell you you have an insecure connection. Don't worry, we need to add this as an exception. All right, so we want to hit on the advanced button here and just hit add exception. All right, and it's going to ask you to confirm adding the exception. I'm going to hit confirm. And now it's going to ask us to create an account. Welcome to Nisus. All right, so what we need to do is just create a username. So I'm just gonna call mine Alexis. You can, you know, name this to you or at your convenience. I'm gonna give it a password. So I'm just gonna say Alexis123, just a simple password there. Again, you can customize it as and how you want it. All right, so I'm gonna hit continue. And now it's gonna say register your scanner. All right, so you just wanna leave this as home professional or manager and enter your activation code. So I'm just gonna open up my code here. Now they should have sent you the email and your email should contain the code. So here is my code. I'm just going to copy it. There we are. Fantastic. And I'm going to close that up. Let me maximize the browser again. And I'm going to paste it in here. And once I hit that, it's going to verify my version of Nisus Home. And once it's done, there we are. Setup is complete. And now it's going to start downloading all the required plugins, all the assets. So this will take quite a while. So I would encourage you to just uh, to let it be, you know, go have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. And when you'll be back, it'll be done. All right, so I'll get back to you when this is done. Alrighty, so once it has finished compiling the plugins and downloading the plugins, it's going to take you to the login screen. Now, after it's done compiling the plugins, if it gives you an error telling you to reset your cache, it's really very simple. Let me just open a new tab here just to show you how to do that. Uh, what you can do is go into your preferences and you want to go into advanced uh, network and you want to clear your cached web content. All right, so once you do that, just reload this page right here and it's going to ask you to enter your username and the password that we set at the beginning. So I'm just going to enter that right now and I'm just going to hit remember me and sign in. Fantastic. And you can choose to remember your password if you want to. And there we are. Nisus is installed, configured and we have uh, successfully done it. So that's uh, essentially how to download it and install it and configure uh, Nisus. So I hope that helped you and I'll be seeing you in the next video. We will get started with finding vulnerabilities with Nisus. Hello everyone and welcome to this video. In this video we're going to be finding local and network vulnerabilities with Nisus. Alright, so let's get started. Now we've already uh, installed and configured Nisus and we can start uh, or get uh, ready to uh, start finding vulnerabilities. As I said, we're going to be looking at local vulnerabilities. So that are essentially vulnerabilities that are uh, exist in the host operating system. In this case, Kali Linux. And then finally, we'll be looking at network vulnerabilities where we'll be targeting our Metasploitable 2 virtual machine. So that is going to be a prerequisite. Uh, you know, you can use uh, another Windows uh, virtual machine if that's what you're trying to do. Or you can also target a Mac operating system. But uh, irregardless of that, we're going to be using Metasploitable 2 so that I can demonstrate how uh, you, one would go about finding uh, vulnerabilities on your local system and then furthermore on the network uh, when targeting a host. All right. So as I said, we're doing this on our virtual lab that we created. So uh, the environment is going to be perfect. So let's get started. Now, uh, again, just open up Nisus and uh, my session has expired. So to access Nisus, as you saw, we use HTTPS 127.0.0.1 port 8834. All right. And you want to just enter your username and the password that we created. So I'm going to do that right now. And excellent. There we are. 
So it has taken us into Nisus. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, what do we do now? Well, the first thing we need to do is understand the interface. All right, so the Nisus interface is really, really simple to understand. So it is sorted out into three sections here. You have your settings, your scans, and obviously on the left-hand side, this is your toolbar that contains all the frequently used menus and options that you can use. All right, so uh, in the settings, I'm just gonna breeze over the settings because that is really uh, up to you whether you want to uh, configure it. So in terms of the about here, you would find an overview of your Nisus home version uh, or your professional version that you're running. It will give you about uh, the uh, information about the version that you're running, or what operating system you're running it on, when it was last updated, the expiration date, uh, and what uh, is your activation code. You can check for software updates and update it here and also set the update frequency. All right, when it comes down to master passwords, you can set your master password here if you want to. All right, moving on to advanced settings. This is uh, especially, this is pretty self-explanatory. These are all settings that will help you fine tune your scanning. I'm not gonna go over this because this is more of an advanced uh, feature. All right, when you go on to proxy servers, you have the ability to use proxy servers, uh, SMTP servers, and you have your custom certificates that you can also use, all right? Um, when it comes down to my account, you can configure settings about your account here and you can check for your API keys. You can also change your password uh, if you want to and add your email. All right, so this is just more to do with customization of your user profile. You can also go to users and you can configure the users that already exist and check their role or add new users. All right, so it's really, really great that you can do that. Now going back to scans. All right, so in here, as you can see, it's going to tell you that the folder is empty, create a new scan. That's because we haven't actually started scanning our target, right? So if we move to the left here, we have folders. So we have my scans, all scans and trash. All right, the trash is where you essentially get rid of the scans that you're done with or scans that are irrelevant to you. Uh, as for the resources, this is going to be very, very important. We're going to be looking at policies, which are essentially templates that you cre can create for scans. Uh, which we'll be looking at in a few seconds. You then have your plugin rules and your scanners. All right, so let's get started now with uh, scanning for local uh, vulnerabilities on Kali Linux, which is our host operating system. So to do that, the first thing we need to do is look for a local IP address for uh, Kali Linux, and you can do this by just entering the command ifconfig, and you want to look for the inet address that is right here. So the inet address in this case is 192.168.1.106. So just keep that in mind. All right. So once you have that, you want to go into policies and uh, policies, as you can see here, once you click on it, the menu, and it gives you some information here. So policies allow you to create custom templates defining what actions are performed during a scan. So they're essentially templates that deal with what actions are going to be performed during the scan. So options or scan options. All right. So uh, once they are created, they can be selected from a list of scan templates. We'll also be looking at that very, very uh, shortly. All right. So what we want to do is you can import a policy if you have been using Nisus before and you have saved a policy. But in this case, we haven't uh, used Nisus before. So we're going to hit create new policy. And now it's going to take you to the policy templates. Now, as you can see, the policy templates, there are quite a few and they're divided into the home and the professional version where in order for you to use some of these other more advanced templates, actually you have the professional version. But regardless of that, uh, it gives you the uh, it gives you the most essential ones, which are the advanced scan, uh, the shell shock detection, bad lock detection, which if you have heard of, these are very, very common vulnerabilities uh, if you're aware of them in the cybersecurity world uh, or in the malware world. You then have your basic network scan, very, very important. We have the credential patch audit, uh, host discovery, which is essentially going to scan for live hosts and the open ports on those hosts. Um, you have the malware scan, which is gonna scan for malware on Windows and Unix systems. Great, this is fantastic. This is a great feature for system uh, administrators and also network administrators. All right, you can also scan for the shadow brokers uh, leaks, uh, you know, all the vulnerabilities that exist within the shadow broker leaks. Uh, you have the Spectre and Meltdown Checker, one of my favorite new additions. It essentially checks for the latest vulnerabilities and CVEs regarding the Spectre and Meltdown vulnerabilities or flaws uh, in the in the processes. So that's also something very, very interesting that you can check out for yourself. You also have your WannaCry ransomware check. Uh, you have your web application check where it'll essentially check for the web applications. If you specify a host that is running on a web server, it'll check for any of the vulnerabilities uh, as, uh, when it comes down to the templates. All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to be, we're going to perform a, an advanced scan on, uh, on the local host, which is Kali Linux. 
All right, so to do that, we click on the advanced scan and now it's going to ask you here to give a name to the scan. So I'm just going to call it Kali Linux uh, or I'm just going to call it advanced scan. All right, or local scan. That's much better because it, it defines what we're doing. And furthermore, when we'll be creating our scan and giving it a name, uh, it will be a much better way of naming it uh, or in terms of naming conventions. Now, uh, in terms of the settings here, you can see that uh, you have your permissions tab as well. Now, permissions is very, very simple to understand. This is uh, essentially the permissions you want to give the users or whether or not they can access this plugin. So, uh, so because we, we want all users on Nisus to be able to access this plugin, we'll just leave it to the default as no access or can use. All right. So you can just leave that as the default, which uh, is no access. All right because we are the systems administrator anyway. When we go to discovery, uh, you want to make sure ping the remote host is left on because it will essentially ping to test whether the host is online. All right, uh, now when it comes down to the ping methods, uh, make sure the ERP, the address resolution, resolution protocol, pardon my language there, and we have the transmission control protocol, the ICMP. Uh, make sure that these three are currently ticked because these are the most important ones, uh, the important ping tests. When it comes down to port scanning, just leave this as default. We don't need to change anything here. Again, these are more advanced, so uh, we are not going to be looking at that right now. Uh, when it comes down to service discovery, just make sure uh, you probe all ports to find services. This is going to, uh, it's essentially going to perform scans on all the ports and find the services and then match them against uh, common vulnerabilities that are currently, uh, you know, very, very popular on those services that are running on those ports. Okay, when it comes down to assessment, uh, you can just leave that as it is. These are not things that we want to touch right now. Uh, when it comes down to report, again, leave that as it is. And advance, uh, you can just leave that as it is as well. So we just want to touch the basic, uh, which we have looked at, and uh, the general settings where we uh, gave the, uh, the policy template a, a name, and you can also give it a description. When it comes down to credentials, here is where you can enter the default credentials that you want to test uh, for vulnerabilities against. For example, you can give the default uh, credentials for SSH and it will test the vulnerabilities against the SSH port. Uh, when it comes down to the compliance, uh, you don't have to touch this is uh, an advanced section here. So I would recommend that you do not play with this. Uh, when it comes down to plugins, this is the most important. So the plugins uh, essentially are vulnerabilities that you can use, a plugin vulnerabilities that allow you to scan for specific vulnerabilities. So for example, you can scan for brute force attacks, which are currently enabled. If you look at the structure of the menu, on the left side, you have the uh, plugins that are enabled, and on the right side, it gives you information about the plugins. All right, so as you can see, you can show the enabled, and uh, as you can see, we have done that. So you can hit show all, and you can show the enabled ones. So currently all of the plugins are enabled, but we do not want to leave this as the default because we want to scan for a few vulnerabilities that are, are very, very common. Uh, we're just gonna scan for basic ones that are very, very common against a Linux subsystem or Linux operating system for this matter. All right, so uh, more specifically, the ones that we're going to, uh, the ones that we're actually going to use, let me just show all there. So I'm gonna disable. Uh, I'm going to disable all of these ones. Uh, the only ones I'm going to leave uh, open are the default Unix accounts, this one right here. So this is just, if you click on it, it's essentially just going to test uh, the default uh, usernames uh, for the uh, for the Linux distribution against the default passwords. So that's what the plugin is going to do. I'm going to disable the all these other ones right here. Hopefully I can get them disabled. There we are. Uh, don't worry if it's a little bit slow. It usually has that issue. And uh, I'm just going to disable all of these other ones. We'll be looking at uh, some of these plugins more uh, advanced when we'll be looking at performing this, or performing a scan against Metasploitable 2. All right, so we're just going to disable all of these ones here. And uh, the one we want to look for is uh, the Ubuntu local security check because it's going to check against Debian security checks. So there it is. Uh, let me just enable it. Ubuntu local security checks. If you click on it, just give it a few seconds if it takes some time. And let me just disable these other ones. Of course, it's going to be a bit slow, but don't worry about that at all. All right. So once you've selected Ubuntu uh, security checks and the default Unix accounts, it is essentially those are all the plugins that we want to select. Once that is done, just hit save. All right. So uh, again, you can run this on your local operating system which in many cases it could be Windows if you're using Nisus on Windows or in this case we're running it on Kali Linux and these are some basic plugins that you can use. So I'm just going to hit save 
and this scan will reveal some very very basic uh, information not really any vulnerabilities because i haven't used any specific plugins but this uh, the first example where i'm showing you how to scan for local vulnerabilities this is just going to be a simple scan when we move over to metasploitable 2 that is going to be uh, when we moved into an advanced section all right so we have created the policy and as you can see it's going to be stored under policies so this is a template that you can use at any time so now we need to perform the scan and you might be asking yourself well how do we do this well we go into the my scans folder and you want to hit uh, create a new scan all right so once you do that it's going to take you to the scan templates now because we already created our policy which is essentially a template we can select on the user defined menu and we'll find our policy there excellent so it's called local scan so we're going to click on it and now we need to give a name to the scan all right not the policy a name for the scan in this case the name is going to be a uh, kali linux scan all right so we're not expecting a lot of vulnerabilities to find a lot of vulnerabilities here but it'll be interesting to see what we get nonetheless now uh, you can add a description and you can just leave the folder to the default my scans folder when it comes down to targets here is where you would specify the targets your target ip or your target range your target network range your target uh, domain all of that good stuff so in this case we're going to be targeting the ip address which is as we saw 192.168.1.106 you can just copy that to save time if you have run the command and all you'd have to do is just paste it in all right now mind you you can also add a range so if you wanted to add the range of 106 to 110 we could also do that if you wanted to add a subnet so we could add the entire subnet network subnet and it'll scan for all the targets on the network but as we know that's going to take quite a while so we'll just change it to the default ip address for kali linux which in this case is 192.168.1.106 all right so once you're done just hit save and it's going to save it to your scans and to get it running or to stop the scan just move here to the right and hit launch all right you can also stop the scan from here and the way to know if the scan is currently running it's going to display these green arrows here this progress bar that is essentially telling you that the scan is running once it's done it'll tell you it's done and you can click uh, on the scan and it'll show you the results so this uh, will take some time depending on the plugins you've selected and the uh, whether or not you've chosen uh, many multiple targets or you've chosen uh, the entire subnet but in this case it shouldn't take too much time because we have selected a singular target so i'll get back to you when the scan is complete all right so the scan is complete and that will be denoted by a little tick icon there and that means that the scan is complete so uh, in order to analyze the results that we've got from the scan just click on the scan or double click on it and it should give you uh, this little menu here that shows you or sorts the information really really well so uh, as i said this is going to be a very very basic scan as you can see the results are very basic but don't worry this was just to get you up to scratch with how to use nisus all right so uh, let's look at how to go through the results so as you can see it's sorted into three options you have your hosts vulnerabilities and your history so in terms of hosts uh, it did recognize that uh, 192.168.1.106 was a host and in terms of vulnerabilities it gives you this little bar here uh, with a, the color blue which I'll get to in a second and it gives you two so that means it was able to get two vulnerabilities all right but now if we go to the right here we can see that the scan details this is essentially information about the scan so it's going to give you information like the name of the scan the status the policy you are using uh, the start time the end time and the elapsed time that the scan took all right now when it comes down to vulnerabilities this is my favorite part it sorts out the vulnerabilities in a pie chart all right um and essentially uh, it is sorted into color so as you can see uh, if you use the key here you have blue as info green as low yellow as medium orange as high and red as critical so in this case we're only able to gather information about vulnerabilities that exist all right and that can be accessed in the vulnerabilities tab so if i click on that it's going to just show you one vulnerability here that we currently have and that is the netsat port scanner it is essentially a vulnerability that allows Nisus to run a netstat command. So netstat is a, prob is a very, very good networking tool. Uh, if you have heard of it, it is known as the Swiss army knife of network tools. It's great for connecting one computer to another. So uh, netstat was, uh, was able to host, to run the scan on the remote host and enumerate the open ports. 
So essentially what it's saying here is it was able to enumerate open ports. Nothing, uh, you know, seriously important here. In the next video, when we'll be moving on to uh, finding vulnerabilities in Linux and Windows systems, uh, this is where we'll look at some really, really huge vulnerabilities and how they're sorted out. All right, so that's going to be it for this video. In this video, we looked at how to find vulnerabilities, local vulnerabilities on our network. And uh, yeah, that's going to be it for this video. In the next video, we'll be looking at finding local uh, vulnerabilities uh, on Linux and Windows. All right, so I'll be seeing you in the next video. Hello everyone and welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to be finding Linux and Windows vulnerabilities using Nisus. All right, so uh, in the previous video, we looked at how to find local and network vulnerabilities uh, using Nisus. Now, that was very basic and we didn't find anything that was very, very interesting or anything that was relatively interesting. Now, in this video, we're going to be using Metasploitable 2. Now, as I've mentioned, Metasploitable 2 is a purposely vulnerable uh, Linux operating system or Linux server that is running a plenty of web applications like, uh, you know, PHP, my admin, all of that good stuff. But what we're going to be trying to do is we're going to be trying to find uh, these vulnerabilities that exist within Metasploitable 2. And furthermore, we'll be testing a Windows system, which is my host operating system uh, that I'm currently running. As you know, I'm running uh, Kali Linux in a virtual machine. All right. So let's get started. Now, as I said, uh, make sure you have started up Metasploitable 2. And we want to use the ifconfig command to get the IP address, which in this case is 192.168.1.107. All right, so once you know that, you're pretty much ready to get started. So we're going to be starting off with Linux. Now, uh, I would assume that you already know how to create a new policy, and that's what exactly what we're going to do. So you can run this with Metasploitable 2, or you can use any Linux distribution that you want. It doesn't matter, whatever you want, as long as you know the IP addresses of that computer that's running Linux, uh, and it's on your network, you're pretty much good to go. All right, so we're just going to go into Policies. And we're going to create a new policy. We're going to leave the old one there. And now what do we want to select? This is very, very important. We now want to select the advanced scan. All right, because we want to customize a few things and we're going to call it Metasploitable 2 scan. All right, we're just going to scan. We're just going to call it that. Or you can call it whatever you want. It really does matter. So I'm not going to change anything in terms of the settings. Uh, when it comes down to plugins, yes, I need to change a lot of stuff here because we're going to be enabling quite a few important plugins and we're going to disable the ones we don't need because it just saves a lot of processing time and scanning time. All right, uh, so let's look at what we need to enable and what we need to disable. So we don't need uh, these two here. We want to enable backdoors because we want to check for backdoors. So I would recommend that you just copy what I do because this will act as a fantastic guideline for a good scan. All right, so we're not scanning. Uh, we're going to leave CentOS local security checks because again, you could be running uh, CentOS and I do not want to, you know, discriminate against your scan. So if you're running CentOS, just leave that open. We're going to get rid of this. Uh, Cisco. No, we don't need Cisco. We're going to check for DNS information. That is very, very important. So DNS, we're going to leave DNS on. Debian, let's see. Uh, we're going to enable the Debian local security checks. That's very, very important because as we know, you could be running a Debian distribution, which is very common. Or if you are using Metasploitable 2 for this scan, you know it is Debian based because it's running off Ubuntu. All right, uh, the default Unix accounts, we're also going to enable that. We don't need these. Uh, we're going to look at firewalls, not really. Denial of service, yes, we want to enable that. Firewalls, uh, yeah, we want to leave that open as well. Free BSD, yes. Gain a shell remotely, yes, FTP. Uh, yeah, we also want to enable that as well. We actually need to check for FTP there. Uh, general, mm, let's see, Huawei, no, we don't need to look at anything there. So Gen2, we leave Gen2 on because you could be running Gen2 or Gen2. Sorry if I, uh, we're going to leave the HP UX uh, local security checks. Huawei, no, we're going to remove incident response, Junos, Mac OS, because I doubt you're scanning a Mac operating system here. We're going to leave the miscellaneous ones. Uh, going to get rid of these ones. Oracle, no, nothing to do with Oracle there. Uh, we're going to leave the peer to peer file sharing because that's to do with torrents. Or you know what? We can just disable that. That is really, really unnecessary here. Let's see what else. Uh, Red Hat, no. Oh, you can actually enable Red Hat. That could come in handy. Yes, we're just going to leave Red Hat open. RPC, no, nah, we don't need that. SCADA, not really. Mm, service detection, you know what? Let's leave that on because we might need that. The SNMP, yeah, we want to leave that on. Uh, we're going to disable settings. Uh, SNMP, leave that. Solaris, 
no we don't need that or actually let's leave that open SUS or if you want to call it SUSE depending since we're not scanning windows we're going to get rid of all of these other ones we're going to leave the Ubuntu local one uh, we don't need to do Ubuntu or you can actually leave the uh, SUSE and Ubuntu local security checks on all right so those are the plugins that we're going to be using for Linux uh, more specifically Metasploitable 2 since that's what we are performing the vulnerability scan on and just hit save right so we've created our policy and we're saving it excellent now we can perform our scan so I'm just going to go into my scans and we're going to create a new scan and uh, we're going to go to user defined uh, policies here uh, and the Metasploitable 2 scan click on that and now we name it so I'm just going to call it uh, Linux we're just going to call it Linux scan just to keep things really, really simple. And I can just give some information there. Metasploitable, Metasploitable 2, like so. And now we select the targets, which, as I said, you should know. Uh, you can just using the ifconfig command on any Linux distribution that you may be running. Or in this case, if you're following my way, uh, where I'm using Metasploitable 2 as a virtual machine, uh, the IP address for me is 192.168.1.107. So I'm just going to type that in. So 182.168.1.107. All right. And by the way, you can perform the scans on one or more Linux uh, distributions. So you can, uh, if you want to select another target, you can just hit the enter button and just go a line below it and enter your other IP address. But for me, I'm just going to be scanning the Metasploitable 2 virtual machine. And uh, once that's done, I do not need to change any of the other settings. I'm just going to hit save. And once it's saved, we can begin the scan. So I'm just going to uh, launch the scan. And obviously this will take uh, significantly longer. I'm not going to say it's going to take that much time, but it should take a few minutes uh, longer than the Kali Linux scan because we've used a lot more plugins. So I'm going to get back to you when the scan is complete. All right, so the scan has completed and again, it'll be de denoted by this little tick and it'll give you the latest date modified there. So you can uh, actually look at uh, what time it, the scan was complete. Uh, so I'm just going to double click on it uh, as we did previously. And as you can see, there's a little bit more information now and you might be getting excited and you should be getting excited. So we, we have already looked at how to analyze the information. So we're just going to look at uh, what vulnerabilities that we have found. So as you can see, if we move on to the right hand side and we go to the vulnerabilities chart here, uh, we have 10% critical vulnerabilities, 4% high, 15% uh, medium, 4% low. So, you know, uh, we actually have quite a lot of vulnerabilities here. However, we do have a new menu and that is the remediations. Now, these are the fixes that you can make uh, to solve these or to fix these vulnerabilities. Now, let's just look at the vulnerabilities we were able to find. I'm not going to go in depth to into what all of these uh, vulnerabilities are, are because there are a lot of them. And, you know, when it, terms, when it comes to exploiting these vulnerabilities, there are quite a lot of them because, as I said, Metasploitable 2 is designed to be vulnerable. All right. Uh, so as you can see, we have some really, really interesting ones. And the first thing that catches that actually comes to my mind is the VNC server. Now, if you know what VNC is, a VNC allows you to connect from one uh, computer to another and allows you to view your computer remotely. Uh, or to control your computer remotely. So uh, as you can see, the VNC server running on the remote host is secured with a weak password. So it is using the default password, which is in this case, as you can see, uh, it already got the password, which is amazing. The default password is password. So uh, one can easily just log in uh, and, you know, can uh, connect to the system and, uh, you know, uh, make changes and now if when it comes down to an attacker the attacker will then be able to control the system so nisus was able to log in using vnc authentication and a password of password a remote un authenticated attacker could exploit this to take control of the system as i said you know these are very very big vulnerabilities and as you can see it's labeled as critical because this is uh, something that you should be really lo looking out for so how would one remediate this the first thing one would do is they would change the default password to something more secure once you do that this becomes it no longer is a critical vulnerability all right going back to the vulnerabilities page there are a lot of them and as I said, I'm not going to cover all of them. I just wanted to show you that you can get quite a lot of them. All right. So as you can see, there are there are plenty of them. You have your Samba badlock vulnerability. If you click on that, uh, the version of Samba. Samba is a essentially a file server, a uh, local file server. So as you can see, uh, this version of Samba running on the remote host is affected by a flaw known as badlock that exists in a security account manager and local uh, security authority. 
Due to pro improper authentication, level negotiation, negotiation over remote procedure call channels, a man-in-the-middle attacker who is able to intercept the traffic between the client and the server hosting the SAM database can exploit this flaw. So it is a man-in-the-middle uh, vulnerability, again, quite a big vulnerability, but it is uh, labeled as medium. But irregardless of that, uh, you know, these vulnerabilities are really, really, they're really, really huge. Uh, so uh, I would recommend that you just go through them and you look at the remediations that you can perform. Now, if you look at the remediation page here, you can see it's going to give you actions that you can perform right now that will solve some of the, or that'll help you fix some of these vulnerabilities. So one of them is to upgrade Samba version 2.1.11, which is the latest version as of recording this, uh, which is the version installed, and you need to update it to the latest version, which is 4.4.2 or later, all right? so. That's great that it tells you to do that. And when it comes to the other vulnerabilities, those are dependent on what you can do to fix it or what you can do to mitigate these attacks. All right, so as you can see, we've found a lot of vulnerabilities here on our Metasploitable 2 virtual machine. And it's fantastic that we know these vulnerabilities because now we can assess them and then gain our method of attacking the system, which we'll be looking at as we move along now, you know, when we'll be testing for gaps in our system. Uh, so this is great. This is excellent. And uh, that's going to be it for this video. Uh, I hope you guys have learned a lot in this video. In the next video, we'll be looking at uh, scanning for vulnerabilities on Windows operating systems or Windows computers. So I'll be seeing you in the next video. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to be checking for Windows specific vulnerabilities with Nisus. All right, so let's get started. Now, in the previous video, we looked at how to perform or how to check for vulnerabilities on Linux, more specifically Metasploitable 2. In this case, we're going to be looking for vulnerabilities on my operating system here that I'm currently running, which is Windows 10. Uh, so I'm really curious to see what vulnerabilities we can find. All right, so let's get started. So I'm just going to open up my virtual machine again, and we're going to create a new policy now. You pretty much, you should be accustomed to this. And this is always good practice to create your own policies. So from then onwards, you can customize them to your liking as well. We're going to a new policy there. And we want to perform um, an advanced scan. All right, because we want to select our own plugins. And we're going to change the name to Windows Scan. And uh, we're going to leave the settings as they are. And we're going to go directly to the plugins. Uh, all right, because we already know what we're doing now. All right, now the plugins are the most important thing. Now, as I remember, some of the most important ones that you would find with Windows are really very simple. We have the DNS, databases, uh, denial of service. So I'm just gonna disable these ones. Um, do we need backdoors? Not really. Uh, so we would, uh, DNS is really the most important one. So I'm gonna leave databases. Uh, Debian, no, we don't need uh, denial of service. Yes, DNS as well. Local network security checks, no, nothing there. Fedora, nothing as well. Firewalls, no. Uh, FTP is very important. We have to make sure FTP is there. Gain a shell remotely, not really. General, nothing. Uh, usually we would have the, uh, the SMTP or the settings or web servers. Yeah, usually those are the main ones that I would use. Uh, so let me just get rid of these other ones here. And uh, let's go all the way down so we can do it directly from there. We would have Windows user management. That's very important. Uh, we have the Microsoft bulletins, Windows as well, web servers. Yes, we need that settings as well. There we are. Let's uh, SNMP, which is important as well. Uh, the settings. Yes, uh, there it is. It exists as well. SMTP. Yes, SMTP problems. That's very, very important. Service detection. Yeah, we need that as well. Scientific that we don't need SCADA. Uh, we can leave the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing on as well. That is to deal with torrents or torrent clients. Um, yeah, those are pretty much the most important plugins that I've found to, to work well when performing a vulnerability scan on a Windows operating system. Now, mind you, I'm running the latest version of Windows 10, which is, in my opinion, it's quite secure. And I have taken uh, extra precautions to secure it even more. But let's see what it's able to turn up. You know, hopefully it can also teach me a thing or two about what I need to do on my system. All right, so I'm going to hit save. And uh, once it's done, we can just go back to our scans, all scans, and we're going to create a new scan. And we're going to go to the user defined templates and look for the Windows scan. We're just going to call it local Windows scan. All right, simple as that. And we're just going to get the IP address. I actually forgot to do that. 
So I'm just going to open up my um, my terminal here and to get your IP address uh, details, just hit IP config on Windows. And uh, again, you can run this on a Windows virtual machine. You could have downloaded your own. You know, you can run Windows 7, Windows XP, as long as you're just understanding what's going on. So the local IP address is 192.168.1.104. Uh, All right, so we're going to use that. So 192.168.1.104. Excellent. So uh, that is the IP address there, which is our target. And uh, we don't need to change anything regarding the schedule and the notifications. So I'm just going to hit save. And once it's done, we can begin the scan. So I'm just going to hit launch. And again, it shouldn't take too much time uh, this time because we've used a lesser amount of plugins. So uh, let the scan begin. And for some reason, it's uh, not yet started, uh, but it should start anytime now. So I'm just going to get rid of these other scans here. And uh, it's still pending. If it t tells you that it's pending, uh, just give it a few seconds. Just let's go back to my scans. And there we are. The scan is running. Uh, if it takes quite a while, don't worry about that. It usually starts up uh, anyway. So um, I'll get back to you when the scan is complete so we can look at what vulnerabilities uh, Nisus was able to discover. All right. So the scan is complete and uh, we can go ahead and look uh, what it's found. So I'm just going to double click on it and uh, there we are. So again, this time we don't have any major vulnerabilities. Uh, it was only able to gather information about certain vulnerabilities. So let's look at what we were able to find. All right. So if I click on the vulnerabilities page here or the, the vulnerabilities tab here, we can see that we have the default, uh, just some normal information regarding vulnerabilities that might exist. So for example, we have the VMware ESX GSX server detection. So let's click on that. So according to its banner, so that means there was a banner grabbing here. Uh, the remote host appears to be running a VMware server authentication daemon. Now that is very important, you know, uh, someone uh, being able to get information about uh, my system, like for example, in this case, uh, it has, it was able to detect that I am running VMware, all right, which is, which is quite interesting. So which likely indicates the remote host, the remote host is running VMware server uh, or ESX server or GSX server. So that is quite interesting. I really like that. And it was able to uh, to deduce this by uh, looking at the ports. So the ports uh, 912, which was the TCP port for VMware authentication and uh, 902, which was TCP for VMware uh, authentication as well. So very, very interesting. OK, so let's go back to the vulnerabilities and let's see what else we were able to get. Ah, there we are, service detection. So let's click on that. Uh, so Nisus was able to identify the remote service by its banner or looking by the error message it sends when it receives an HTTP request. All right. So uh, it was able uh, to find out that SSH was running. Interesting. Uh, let's see what else. Web server was running. Very, very interesting as well. Um, nothing else here that was interesting. The only thing was the SSH. Uh, but what we already knew that, that uh, the SSH by default is configured to run on port 22. Uh, all right, back to the vulnerabilities. Let's see one more that we we're able to get and uh, something more uh, interesting here because um, Windows is quite secure nowadays. Uh, so let's see. Uh, there we are, Windows NetBIOS or SMB Remote Host Information Disclosure. All right, so the remote host is listening. UDP is listening on the UDP port 137 or TCP port 445 and replies to the NetBIOS uh, NBT scan or SMB requests. All right, so fantastic so it was able to get four netbios names uh as you can see alexis workstation that's the name of my computer that's awesome you know and i'm actually running a file server of this computer so it's really really interesting that it was able to gather that i'm actually quite impressed uh as, as for the work group it, uh, detected that I, was, I have a work group and it got the mac address on my adapter so that is interesting you know that is quite interesting uh for the simple fact that i do run a file server and it was able to gather the uh the computer name right so that was very very interesting and uh that is essentially it for this video as you can see it's really very simple performing scans on different uh operating systems and nisus has really made it easy for you to select the uh, appropriate plugins. You can scan uh, for and against different plugins and it really makes your scans more interactive and it gives you more results and different ways to analyze your target or your host and understand what vulnerabilities exist. All right, so that's going to be it for this video. In the next video, we'll get started with OpenVS. So I hope you're excited and I'll be seeing you in the next video. Hello everyone and welcome to this video. In this video we're going to be installing and configuring OpenVS or OpenVAS 
on Kali Linux. All right, so OpenVS is a vulnerability scanning tool or a vulnerability analysis tool uh, that comes pre-installed with Kali Linux. However, if it's not installed uh, on your version, it's really very, very simple to get it installed. Uh, so uh, essentially how you'd look for it is you would go to the application menu in Kali Linux and you go to vulnerability analysis. Sorry, let me just go back there. Vulnerability analysis and you'd find it in here, OpenVS. All right, if it isn't installed, uh, what you want to do is you need to update your repositories. So that can be done on app get update. All right, so you want to make sure you're in root before you do this uh, and uh, just update your repositories. Furthermore, then you need to upgrade your repositories. So upgrade, app get upgrade. And once that's done, you can get started with the OpenVS installation. So to get started with that, all you need to do is just go to this web page that I'll have in the resources. So it's www.cali.org. Uh, slash penetration testing slash open VAS uh, vulnerability scanning. All right. So as you can see, uh, you can go through this paragraph here where it's essentially telling you about open VS. So uh, for this reason, we have manually packaged the latest and newly released open VS 8.0 tool and libraries for Kali Linux. Although nothing major has changed in the release uh, in terms of uh, running the vulnerability scanner, we wanted to give a quick overview on how to get it up and running. All right, so the first thing you need to do is you need to update your repositories. And the second thing you need to do is you need to upgrade uh, your packages. All right, once that's done, you need to install OpenVS and that can be done with the uh, app get install. All right, and you just wanna hit enter. Now I already have mine installed. So if I just hit enter, it's just gonna overwrite uh, over the currently installed one, as you can see. So uh, I already have it installed. Now, the next step is the most crucial, and uh, th that is to essentially set up OpenVS. All right, so uh, you just need to copy this command or you can type it in. So it's OpenVS. Sorry, let me just minimize that. There we are. Open, OpenVS and setup. All right, so once you hit enter, it's essentially going to start the setup process for OpenVS. And it's going to take quite a while because um, it needs to install, uh, download and install all the required files and all the CVE uh, databases that uh, are required. All right, so give that uh, a few minutes uh, so you can go ahead and get yourself a cup of coffee or tea and it should be done when you're back. All right, and once it's done, it's going to give you your um, your login credentials into which you can actually log in to OpenVS through the local host on your web browser. All right, it should give you the username as admin and the password as a long string, as we've already looked at, as a long string of text that is a password. All right, now uh, the main advantage that we need to look at here of using OpenVS is the fact that after you've uh, performed the setup, you can now look at the settings here. Uh, so once you've set up OpenVS, it'll, you should be able to look with the Netstat tool to check out what uh, services are running or, or what services are listening and it should give you the port in which you know the local host is currently running all right so to start the openvs service you just use the openvs and start command all right so let's do that right now openvs and start all right and it should just take a few seconds to start the openvs services there we are now to look at the other options we can use with the openvs we can just use openvs and if i use the tab button it should give me the options that I can use with OpenVS. All right, so I can look for updates. I can start and stop the service and I can go through the setup. All right, now looking at the OpenVS settings here, uh, after it's given you a password, you, you have to access the local host through the, uh, the transfer protocol, the secure transfer protocol, HTTPS. And the local host is 127.0.01. The port is 9392. So it's obviously different than Nisus. All right, and then you'll be asked to enter your username and your password that was provided to you. All right, so I'm going to do that right now. So I'm just going to access it here. So 127.0.0.1 and I use the port 9392, 9392. And if I hit enter, it's going to give me an, er an error here. So again, we have to use the transfer protocol here, uh, HTTPS, and uh, I'm going to hit enter. And uh, if it asks you for a security exception, uh, you know, just the same way as it did with Nisus, just add it as an exception and you should be good to go. All right, so the default username should be admin and the, after performing the setup, it should have given you a password, which you can later change after you've logged in. All right, so 
um, essentially uh, I, I've already changed my password so it's much shorter so uh, if I just hit enter it's gonna log me in and there we are so as you can see this is open VES and we'll be going through all of this in the next video when we'll be looking for vulnerabilities in Linux and Windows so that's gonna be it for this video and I'll be seeing you in the next video Hello everyone and welcome to this video. In this video we're going to be checking for Linux and Windows specific vulnerabilities with OpenVS or OpenVAS as it's so called. Alright, so let's get started. Now I hope you've started the Open v or you've actually started OpenVS and uh, you've opened up VS in your browser through the local host. Uh, so the port, the default port is 9392. Uh, you've got your credentials, so the default username is admin and the password is a long string that they'll provide to you in the terminal after you've ran the OpenVS setup. Uh, so again, as I said, you can change it, um, you can change it in OpenVS and I'll be showing you how to do that in a few seconds. Alright, so welcome to OpenVS and uh, I hope you like the interface. Uh, so let's actually start off with the interface. So you might be asking yourself, well, this looks quite different than Nisus. Well, the truth is, is OpenVS offers you a lot more flexibility in terms of the types of scans you can perform. So let's get started with the interface. So first and foremost, you have your dashboard. So what is your dashboard? Your dashboard is essentially a summary of all the information and reports that were gathered and uh, obviously and information that was got during a specific scan on a target. All right, so as you can see, uh, you have here a graph uh, that is sorted uh, and the data is essentially tasks by severity, which in this case is zero because we haven't started any tasks or scans. All right, we then have tasks by status that is about essentially is a real world information that contains information about the latest CVEs. Uh, so the graph is uh, explaining or well, it's displaying the total amount of CVs released every year. All right, uh, so then you have your host topology. Now yours should be blank. Uh, the reason mine has actual hosts here is because I've performed a few scans with OpenVS as I do like working with it, even on a professional level. All right, uh, the next we have this little chart here that displays the NVTs by security class. So as you can see, we have the high, medium, low, and the log or information. So very, very similar to Nisus. So you can customize the dashboard by going to the little blue spanner. All right. So uh, if you click on this, it'll allow you to edit the dashboard and add uh, as many uh, or as much information as you would want. All right. So once you're done, you can just hit save changes. Excellent. Uh, so uh, now let's move on to the menu right here. So I've looked at the dashboard. Now when you move on to the scans, this is where you'd start a specific scan or in this case, a task. All right, so it does have a dashboard as will most of these other sections here. Uh, and the dashboard is essentially going to be a summary in this case of tasks, reports and results. All right, you can also add notes as we'll be looking at in a few seconds. All right, moving on to the assets. In the assets, you can add hosts and operating systems, pretty self-explanatory. It also comes with a dashboard section. You then have your security info, which contains information about the latest NVTs, CVEs and CPEs. All right, so just information about the latest vulnerabilities, which obviously we'll be looking at. Uh, you then have your configuration. This is going to be a very, very important menu or a very, very important section when performing uh, scans because we have to configure a lot of stuff here in terms of adding new targets and creating our own scan configurations. Moving on to the extras, your extras contain uh, things like your trash can, your settings, where you can edit your username and your password. So if you want to change your password, you can go on there. Then have your performance. This will just uh, informational statistics about your performance. Uh, moving on to the administration, you have your users, so you can add or remove users. You have your groups, so you can add or remove users from groups and create new groups as well. You then have your roles, so you can assign or you know reassign roles to specific users. Uh, you then have your help, which contains your documentation and the about uh, section. All right, so let's get started with actually performing a scan with OpenVS. All right, so in this case, as I said, we're going to be checking for Linux specific vulnerabilities and Windows specific vulnerabilities. So we're going to do this side by side. All right. So uh, to get started with a scan or actually before we get started, uh, I'm going to be using Metasploitable 2 uh, as my Linux operating system. And I'm going to be using uh, Windows as my host operating system as the second or the Windows computer. All right. Uh, so to get started with a scan, it's really, really very simple. All you have to do is go into your configuration and we need to create our own uh, or a new scan configuration. So I'm going to click on scan configs. All right. So it's going to take me there. And now you want to move all the way to the left here. 
and if you go through these little three buttons you want to go to the little star here the little star tells you uh, create a new scan configuration that's indeed what we want to do you can look at the default ones that are created here but for us since we want to specify you know the plugins that we're going to be using or in this case as they're called the uh, the vulnerabilities so we're going to go and create a new scan configuration and we're going to call it uh, let's call it uh, since we're using metasploitable scan all right so we're going to call it the metasploitable scan uh, and we are going to leave the comments as uh, empty because we do not need to add a comment or if you want to you can go ahead and do that uh, you can then select the base as empty static and fast because uh, when we select this we're essentially saying uh, we want to start from scratch and we want to create our own uh, configuration all right so then hit create fantastic all right give it a few seconds to, to load up the secondary menu which will prompt us to create our scan configuration all right so as you can see you can now edit the scan configuration here and now you can edit the network vulnerability test families so these are sorted in terms of nvts and these would be the equivalent to the plugins uh, in that we saw in Nisus, all right. So as you can see, the names are pretty much the same. You have your they are considered to be NVT uh, families here. So you have your buffer overflow, brute force attacks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So let's select what uh, which one of these NVTs we want to scan for against, all right? So it is essentially a set or a family of vulnerabilities. So in this case, since we are scanning for Linux, we can uh, perform some brute force attacks there. Uh, we can perform some buffer overflow compliance. Uh, let's see what else we need to add there. Um, credentials, databases. Yeah, there we are. Databases, uh, denial of service, default accounts. That will also be quite interesting. FTP, uh, that is also quite interesting as well. Uh, we can look at uh, gain a shell remotely. Uh, if I can find it, there we are. Gain a shell remotely. General, no. Yeah, we can actually use general malware. Uh, let's look for malware there we are malware port scanners and privilege escalation fantastic and uh, finally we can just uh, enable uh, service detection all right so excellent we have enabled service detection and that is the last of the nvt families or plugins that we're going to be scanning for against or the set of vulnerabilities we're going to be testing on our target so i'm going to hit save and now it's going to save the scan configuration and the next step is to add our target all right, so our target is essentially going to be the IP address of your target or your target for that matter. All right, so what I'm going to do is before we move on, we want to create the scan configuration for the Windows uh, operating system. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back into uh, we're going to create a new scan configuration because we are going to do this side by side with the Windows operating system. So I'm just going to call it Windows scan. All right, fantastic. Excellent. Now. Uh, we need to create our scan configuration so leave it as empty static and fast so create that uh, we now need to edit our scan configuration so uh, just give me a few seconds here let this start up all right excellent so now the nvt families that we're going to scan for against are going to be brute force attacks buffer overflow those are pretty much the standard uh, we can look at default accounts denial of service mm. If I can remember the other ones, let's see FTP, yes, gain a shell remotely. Also, that'll be quite important. Uh, FTP, gain a shell remotely. Excellent. We can look at port scanners, privilege escalation. That those are also very, very important. Port scanners, privilege escalation, um, service detection, SNMP, web servers. Uh, so let's look for service detection, SNMP servers and uh, so service detection and web servers. So service detection, which we've enabled web servers. There we are. And uh, Windows, uh, Microsoft bulletins. All right. So those are the NVT families that we're going to be scanning for against our target. All right. So once that's done, I'm just going to hit save and we have created our Windows and our Linux, Kali Linux scan. All right. So as you can see, uh, if we just look at the current scan configurations that we have, um, we have the Metasploitable scan and if we reload this we'll have the windows scan so let me just reload that so you can see that indeed we will have the the windows one all right so there we are all right excellent now we need to add our target all right so we're going to go into configuration and to our targets excellent all right so in our targets essentially now we have to add the ip addresses so let me get the ip address for the metasploitable 2 virtual machine so I'm just going to log in here. MSF admin has the default credentials and I'm going to write in the ifconfig command. All right, ifconfig, the IP address is 192.168.1.101. Excellent. So we're going to create the metasploitable target now. 
So we're going to create new target, go to the little star there, and we're going to call it Metasploitable2. And you can add a comment. Now in terms of the hosts, you can upload from a file, you can upload hosts from a file, you can select a singular host, which is what we're going to do, or you can select, you know, an IP range or a, the entire subnet. So I'm going to just uh, add the no, the IP address for the Metasploitable2 virtual machine, 192.168.1.101. Excellent. And uh, I do not want to exclude any hosts. We're not performing any reverse lookups. In terms of the alive test, you can just leave that as the default. We do not want to perform any type of special ping attacks or pings, sorry, not attacks really. Uh, as for the credentials for authenticated attacks, since we are not performing any authentication attacks, uh, we do not want to uh, leave any default credentials. So I'm just going to hit create. So we have created the Metasploitable 2 uh, target. And as you can see, the name and the target is there. The IP address is singular and the port list is going to be the, uh, the default IANA. All right. Now we're going to create a new one and we're going to call it Windows. All right. And now we need to get the Windows IP address, the local IP address that is. So I'm just going to go into my command prompt and I'm going to hit IP config. Should have launched that as administrator. So I'm going to do that right now. There we are. Let me just launch it as administrator. Right click there, run as administrator and grant it administrator privileges. So IP config and my local IP address is 192.168.1.104. Excellent. Let's uh, go in and add that information. So 192.168.1.104. Fantastic. Now uh, we do not want to exclude any hosts. And again, we'll leave everything uh, as it is at the default and we're going to hit create. Excellent. So we have now created our two targets and our config scan configurations. Now it's time to perform the actual scan on our targets. So in order to do that, you guessed it, we go into the scans menu and we go into tasks. All right. Now, once we're in tasks, we have to create our new task uh, and the task is considered a scan. All right. So this is a little wizard. So we're just going to close this because we do not want to go through the wizard and we want to go into the uh, blue star icon again and we're going to hit new task. All right. So new task and we're going to call it, uh, let's call it the Metasploitable. We're going to create the Metasploitable 2 task. Metasploitable 2 scan. We're going to call it the Metasploitable 2 scan and uh, the comment will leave it as it is. And as for the scan targets, remember we created it. So uh, by default, it will detect it. So that's really, really awesome. So uh, in this case, we're going to select Metasploitable 2 because that is the IP address. As for the alerts, we're going to leave that as it is. We do not want to schedule the scan. We want to do it right now. As for the uh, scanner, leave the scan as the default open VAS by default. As for the scan configuration, uh, you can leave that as it is. All right. More specifically, the scan configuration is very important uh, because we need to select it. We need to select the scan con configuration that we created. Sorry about that. I was referring to the scanner. So uh, we want to select the, the one that we created, which in this case was the Metasploitable scan. And I'm going to click on that. And uh, once you have selected that, we, we now want to hit create. All right. And next, let's do the Windows task. All right, so I'm going to create a new task here and I'm just going to create it for the Windows so we can run them side by side to save time. All right, um, so we're going to call it Windows. We're going to call it the Windows scan. Again, you can call it whatever you like and it's really, really up to you. I'm not going to add any comment. The target is going to be Windows, which we created. We'll browse all the way to the bottom here to the scan configuration and we're going to select the Windows scan. All right, I'm going to hit uh, create and uh, give it a few seconds and there we are. Now we're ready to begin scanning and you might be asking, well, how do we do that? All right, it's really very simple. So as you can see, the scans or the tasks are going to be sorted out really, really well. So they are sorted on this beautiful table in terms of their name, their status, their reports, their severity, the trend and the actions. And now the most important thing to look at here is the status and the severity. The status will run in a bar in this bar right, uh, right here in terms of a loading bar from 1% to 100%, all right? It's going to display the progress in a form of a percentage. In uh, when you look at the severity, the severity will be displayed in terms of a scale, so a scale of 1 to 10, uh, 1 being the lowest in terms of this uh, severity of the vulnerabilities that were found, and 10 being the highest. All right. And uh, finally, the actions allow you to control uh, your scan here. So the green button is to start the scan. The gray dot button is to stop the scan. You then have the trash icon that allows you to de delete the scan. You have your edit task and you can then clone and export the task. So what we're going to do is we're going to start uh, the Metasploitable scan. And uh, well, once you start it, what I'm going to show you is something interesting here. As you can see, the status is going to show as requested. All right. Very something very, very interesting here. 
is you can change the refresh period of OpenVAS by going to the top right here. And as you can see, mine is set to refresh every two minutes. But if I want constant updates as to the progress, I can change it to something shorter like 30 seconds, or I can add my own value here. So I'm just going to change it to 30 seconds here. All right. And I'm going to start uh, the other window scan right here. So give that a few seconds. And uh, once I start it, the Metasploitable 2 scan should have started. And there we are, as you can see by default, it started and it's at 1%. Now this will take uh, quite a while, uh, depending on the plugins or the NVEs that we selected. And by default, if you just refresh it or it'll refresh itself, it will update you on the progress of the scan. Once it's done, we will explore what uh, or the vulnerabilities that we have found and we'll look at how to analyze the results. All right, so let me just reload this and show you that indeed the Windows scan has started. All right, just give it a few seconds. There we are. So they have both started and uh, I'm going to let these complete and you should do. So I'll get back to you when these are complete. All right. So these scans are currently ongoing and they, they've taken quite a while actually. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drive you through how to access or how to get through or how to analyze the reports and the results that you get in terms of the vulnerabilities that were found. So the Metasploitable 2 uh, scan is uh, currently at 48% while the Windows scan is at 4%. Uh, it's, uh, it's been quite a while now. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go into scans and I'm going to go into the reports. All right. Uh, so I'm going to go into reports here and we're going to see what vulnerabilities that were found so far. All right. So for some reason that did not open up. So I'm just going to start it again. There we are. All right. So here are the reports. Um, so as you can see, uh, with Metasploitable 2, we have a severity of 10, which in this case is very high. So the scan results show that uh, we have five uh, vulnerabilities in the high uh, severity, uh, 12 in the medium and two in the low. And in terms of logs, we have 62. All right. So uh, if we click on this, if we click on the date exactly, which is what we're clicking on, it will show you uh, all the vulnerabilities uh, or all the uh, the exploits that are currently existent with open uh, that were found with Metasploitable 2 with OpenVS. All right. So as you can see, um, we have let's look at some of the most common ones or some of the useful ones. So for example, PHP my admin multiple cross site scripting. So X uh, cross site scripting vulnerabilities. We have that there. Uh, so we can check for an anonymous FTP login. So FTP logins are extremely weak uh, on Metasploitable 2. Uh, and uh, yeah, those are some of the vulnerabilities that were found. So as you can see, the information is displayed here, 19 of 198. So let's go back into reports here and we can go through the information a little bit more. Okay. So looking at Metasploitable 2, uh, if we go and look at the results, all right, this is very, very important. If I look at the results, uh, the results now will show you uh, in terms, uh, it'll show you the vulnerabilities in terms of the severity class, as it says over here through the dashboard. All right, and then it'll give you some graphical representations. Uh, so you can see here through the, uh, the, the bar graphs. So the vulnerabilities that were found here were, for example, OS detection and consolidation reporting. These are all logs, uh, that information that was found about vulnerabilities that can be exposed. All right, so that is what uh, you would find in the results. And again, the information is sorted out really, really well here. Moving on, let us go back to the uh, reports section here for some reason. All right, there we are. Let's move back to the reports. And if I click on Metasploitable 2 while the scan is still uh, undergoing, that is under the tasks menu. As you can see, it'll, uh, it'll show you some information about the scan. Uh, moving on to the reports, as I said, uh, when we are analyzing the results that we got uh, while the scan is still completing because it's taking quite a while now. Uh, again, for some reason, it is taking a while. Uh, so now if we click on the vulnerabilities that we were able to find on Metasploitable 2 again, you can see that if you click on one, for example, let's see, check for anonymous FTP uh, login. So if I click on that, as you can see, it's going to give you uh, information here about the vulnerability. So for example, you have the, uh, the summary here. So this FTP server allows anonymous logins, something very, very, you know, powerful there. It was possible to log into the remote FTP service with the following anonymous account. Uh, so anonymous, uh, obviously that's the host. So openvs at example.com, FTP openvs at example.com. So as you can see, that is extremely, uh, extremely, extremely exploitative. And in, if an attacker was to get a hold of this, you know, it would be quite dangerous. Looking at uh, the solution, as the, these are the solutions that they give you, 
uh, or you know means of mitigation to mitigate the exploits or the vulnerabilities. So if you don't want to share files, you should disable anonymous logins. Pretty simple, but a lot of people overlook this, and this is really fantastic uh, for you know for a network or a systems administrator. Uh, let's look at the Windows scan. For some reason, that is taking quite a while as well. Uh, probably have to optimize the scans a little bit more. Uh, so if I click on the Windows report, as you can see for the Windows report, uh, actually, let me just go to the reports. There we are. So as you can see, the report is empty. We haven't got any vulnerabilities so far. Uh, but regardless of that, the scan uh, technique or the methods of uh, you know creating a scan, uh, creating your own scan configuration, uh, adding your host, and finally uh, starting the scan is pretty much the same. And uh, going about it with selecting the host is also quite uh, is quite important to do. And we looked at that. So I'm pretty sure this should cover everything with OpenVS in terms of obviously, as I said, going through what a scan is and a task, how to uh, create your own scan configuration, how to select the different plugins or the uh, vulnerability families. Uh, furthermore, creating your own scan and then finally scanning it. All right, so that's going to be a wrap for section four, where we looked at vulnerability assessment. Now let's look at a summary of what we learned in this section. All right, so the first thing we looked at was how to install and configure Nisus. All right, so we looked at uh, how to install it and configure it, that being our first vulnerability scanner. We then looked at how to uh, log in and uh, finally an overview of the interface. We then moved on to finding local vulnerabilities using Nisus, so vulnerabilities on our local operating system, in this case, Kali Linux, all right? Uh, we then moved on to checking for Linux and Windows vulnerabilities with Nisus, so this was more of checking for OS-specific vulnerabilities, so we looked at how to find vulnerabilities on Windows and uh, vulnerabilities on Linux. We then uh, moved on to the next stage, which was installing and configuring OpenVS, which is our second vulnerability scanner that we were using. And uh, again, we were um, we looked at how to download, uh, how to install it, and how to set it up, and how to compile the scripts. All right, we finally finished off with OpenVS, where we looked at checking for Linux and Windows vulnerabilities. So again, OS-specific vulnerabilities. All right, so that is going to be it for this section. In the next section, we'll be moving on to exploitation. So I'll be seeing you there. Welcome to section five, exploitation. Now let's look at what we're going to be learning in this section. All right, so we'll start off by mastering the Metasploit consoles. So this is a very, very important step because it is uh, the, essentially the basis of all exploitation in this section. So it's very, very important that we look at how to learn or we'll actually learn the Metasploit console. So we'll be looking at all the syntax and we'll be performing some basic exploitation on Metasploitable. All right, uh, in the second video, we'll be moving on to you exploring Armitage, which is the graphical user interface for Metasploit, which is also vitally important and, uh, and acts as a fantastic, uh, fantastic replacement for Metasploit console or an alternative. Okay, we'll then move on to something really, really practical, which is MySQL database exploitation, where I'll be showing you how to exploit and exploit the MySQL database that is running on a Metasploitable 2 using a brute force attack. All right, we'll be then moving to uh, client side attacks using beef or the beef framework, where I'll be showing you how to hook a browser, how to hook your target browser, and uh, then finally how to uh, run exploits on the browser that can give you access to your client. Okay, we'll be then moving on to client side attacks with the social engineering toolkit, where I'll be showing you how to use the credential harvesting method to get credentials from your target. All right, so that is what we're going to be looking at in this section, and we're going to be using the Metasploit uh, console uh, or rather more the Metasploit framework. All right. So in this video, we're going to be looking at uh, the Metasploit console and uh, going through everything about Metasploit. So you have a good understanding and you can move forward with Metasploit. Now, the requirement for this section is that you need Metasploitable installed and running. Now, this is going to act as our vulnerable uh, operating system or our target. Now, the reason we're using Metasploitable, obviously, because it was created by the Metasploit team to be actually uh, vulnerable, they designed it to be vulnerable for people to practice their skills, which is the perfect scenario here where you can practice these skills on. So in this section, we're going to be exploiting, right? Th that, that is the primary focus of this section. In the previous sections, we were performing information gathering and vulnerability analysis. So we are getting information about the target. We were getting information like uh, the ports that are open, the services running on those ports. We were looking at the vulnerabilities that currently exist and how one can exploit them. Now it's time to get uh, to the actual exploitation. So what is Metasploit? Well, Metasploit is a fantastic framework that can identify systems, 
ports and services all right it can then check for the vulnerabilities on these systems or services and finally it lets you exploit these services all right so metasploit is pre-installed with Kali Linux and it comes in different versions so you have your Metasploit console, which is the MSF console. You then have Armitage, which is the graphical user interface Metasploit, uh, which we'll be looking at in the next video, which is awesome uh, as well. Now, looking at uh, Metasploit, as I said, we're going to be using the MSF console. There is a lot of terminology that you have to understand to get a good grasp of Metasploit. In this case, we're going to get started, uh, you know, directly. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to launch Metasploit at the MSF console first. All right, so we'll just open up your terminal and as I said, it should be pre-installed. And what we're going to do is we're just going to expand this now because there's going to be a lot of information that we need to display. So to launch the Metasploit console, what we need to do is just type in MSF console. All right, so MSF console, simple as that and just hit enter. Now, if this is your first time, it's going to take a while to start the framework, but don't worry, it started and it's only going to be that long for the first time. As you can see, it's going to give you the message here, starting the Metasploit framework console. All right, fantastic. So just give that a few seconds uh, so that it starts up. And once it starts up, we can get to understanding the terminology that is involved with Metasploit. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, so just give this a few seconds and voila, here is Metasploit. Now, as you can see, Metasploit has a tendency of displaying some really, really funny images here. Uh, that is pretty, pretty cool because it acts as a welcoming message. Uh, you know, even to beginners, that is at least what I like to think about it. Now, uh, I know one of the first questions I'm going to be asked is how do I change uh, the welcome message? Because if you reload Metasploit every time, you're going to see something interesting that they do post some funny messages here. So a quick tip, if you want to change this, uh, all you have to do is just hit banner. All right. So as you can see, the Metasploit console gives you the new prompt here. So MSF. Uh, so now we are uh, we are exclusively working with Metasploit now, more specifically the Metasploit console. So I'm just going to type in banner. And as you can see, it's loaded up as uh, the Metasploit console again. And now it's using a different image here, uh, obviously. Uh, and there's some funny text written. So as you can see, to boldly go where no shell has gone before. That is a very, very good reference there. I'm, I'm sure you know it. Uh, so one of the most important commands that you can use with Metasploit is the clear command. So the clear command allows you to get rid of all the information that you don't need anymore. So if I clear, voila, we have a clean interface to start working with. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add the banner again because I just want to use it to, to show you some information here. Let me just load it again because that image is way too big. All right, fantastic. Now, uh, as you can see, the, uh, the Metasploit console has started up fresh and uh, what it's going to give you here is information. So it's going to give you the little uh, image and some funny text. And if we look closely, it's going to display the version of Metasploit that you're running. It's going to give you some information here on exploits, uh, auxiliary and post. You have your payloads. Now, let me explain what exploits are. All right. Exploits essentially give you or, or take advantage of vulnerabilities that exist on a system. So they allow you to take advantage of vulnerabilities. There's, they are means of exploiting a system, really or simply put. When it comes down to payloads, payloads are, or a payload is essentially code that is remotely executed on your target. And then obviously from that, you can gain remote access and, you know, you can control the system remotely. So that is this, that is what a payload is simply put. So that was the most important terminology that you need to get a grip on. All right. So Metasploit uh, is sorted in terms of modules that you can use. Now, modules contain, uh, you know, different vulnerabilities that you can use and exploit are for and against your system. Now, as I said, there are going to be some very, very important commands that you need to get a grasp of with the Metasploit console. So I'm just going to clear this up and we can have a fresh terminal here. So uh, one of the most important commands as we have looked at is clear. We have looked at the banner, which allows you to change the image. Not very important, but it's also very, very good. OK, uh, now the most important one is the help command. All right. The help command allows you or displays the help menu for Metasploit, more specifically the Metasploit console. So this is a great starting point if you're looking to experiment with Metasploit, which I highly recommend that you do. It's always good to learn the tool yourself and get an understanding that you would enjoy. All right. So the help command is pretty self-explanatory. It essentially displays a help a menu. All right. So I'm going to clear this and the clear command is inclusive with Linux as well. It just clears up the terminal. So I'm going to hit clear again. And let's look at the other commands. Um, all right. So the other command is the use. All right. The use command essentially allows you to configure. It allows you to be begin configuring the module that you have chosen. 
We'll be looking at this when we'll be getting into exploitation. We're going to be performing some basic exploitation in this video uh, on Metasploitable 2. But for now, uh, the use mod, uh, the use command essentially allows you to uh, to get started with configuring the module that you have chosen. Uh, now let's look at the other command, the set command. All right, the set command allows you to set the various options for a given module. So different modules have different options. Uh, depending on your, you know, for example, uh, you know, selecting the ports, selecting your hosts, etc., etc. As I said, don't worry, we'll get into all of this and it'll all come together. The next command is the search command. The search command allows you to search for an individual module that you want to use. We'll also be looking at this uh, very, very briefly. But for now, let's just focus on the basics, all right? Uh, the other command is the run command. The run command allows you to launch a, a non-exploit module. So for example, a scanner module. A scanner module essentially works exactly as you would think it works. It uh, it essentially works like a network scanner, like Nmap. So it allows you to perform basic information gathering. Okay, uh, so you can just do that by hitting, uh, you know, run once you have set all the options. Uh, now looking at the other command, we have the exploit command. All right, the exploit command allows you to launch the exploit module in which uh, you know you want to target on your host. So this way you actually get started with the exploitation process. Okay, so those are all the commands that you need to look for. One of the most important ones as well that I forgot to mention is the back command. The back command allows you to go back a step. And finally, we have the exit command that allows you to exit the Metasploit framework or the Metasploit console. All right, so let's get started now with some basics. Now, as I said, Metasploit is a very, very powerful tool that also allows inclusion of other services. What do I mean? As I said, it allows you to perform information scanning. It also allows you to perform vulnerability analysis. So it works with tools like Nisus, OpenVAS, and Map. But as I said, we've looked at that. We've already looked at information gathering. We've got information about our target. We've got information about what ports are open, what services are running. Now it's time to exploit them. Uh, but before we get started, uh, as I said, you can perform a basic, uh, you can perform Nmap scans with Metasploit. So let's actually do that right now. All right. So uh, if we just launch, uh, you know, directly, just hit Nmap. All right. And now we need to get the IP address of the Metasploitable 2 virtual machine because that's what we're going to be using uh, and that's what we're going to be exploiting. So I'm just going to go into the Metasploitable 2 here and I'm just going to hit enter and get the local IP address which in this case is 192.168.1.106. Excellent, fantastic. Now let's go back into uh, Kali Linux and we're in Kali Linux now. So we're just gonna select the IP address here, 192.168.1.106 and let's see what ports are open. So we're performing information gathering and voila. As you can see, it's already got the information about the open ports and what service is running. Now we need to get the service versions because we're gonna exploit a port now. All right, that is what we're going to be doing in this video. So what we're going to do is uh, I'm just going to clear this up. And now we want to perform some information gathering with ZenMap. All right. The reason I'm using ZenMap is because it displays information in a very, very user friendly way. Uh, essentially, ZenMap is the graphical user interface equivalent of Nmap. All right. So it gives you a very, very good graphical um, representation of Nmap. So by default, I'm just going to hit uh, in the target box here. I'm just going to select the target. So 192.168.1.106. As for the profile, I'm going to leave that uh, at intense scan. Uh, and the commands, as you can see here for an intense scan are as follows. You have your Nmap, your A and your V, uh, and then followed by your target. And once you're ready, just hit scan. So uh, we're actually going to be finding the service versions running on these ports and we're going to be exploiting them because as I said, Metasploitable 2 is designed to be vulnerable and one or more of these ports is going to be vulnerable to an attack and we're going to be exploiting it. So uh, we're going to let this scan complete and I'll get back to you when the scan completes and we can move to the next stage, which is exploitation. All right. So the ZenMap scan or more specifically, the Nmap scan is complete on our target. And uh, let's look at the ports and the hosts it was able to, to bring up. So you can just go to the ports and hosts tab here. And if we click on that, as you can see now, it's going to display the port, the protocol, the state of the port, the service and the version that is running. All right. So as you can see, there are different versions are running on these ports of different softwares. And now this is where you can get the vulnerabilities in. So you might be asking, well, how do we actually uh, get the vulnerabilities here? Now, as I said, we performed vulnerability analysis with tools like Nisus and um, we performed it with Nisus and OpenVS. Now, uh, more specifically, I'm going to be showing you a few tips and tricks here that you can use. 
So uh, by default, as you can see, we have a default service on the FTP port running called VSFTPT 2.3.4. All right, so let's see if this is vulnerable. You can do this really, really easily by going into your browser. All right, and you can just search for the service name. All right, so let me just check what the service name again is, the VSFTPD. I believe this is a very vulnerable software, especially if the version is running. VSFTPD, TPD, uh, all right, 2.3.4. And as you can see, there's already searches. You can search for the exploit, the vulnerability. So we're gonna search for the 2.3.4 exploit. All right, so this is a simple search engine search. You can also running the, you, can, you can also run this on Google. I'm going to be doing this on DuckDuckGo. So let's just see what we get. So I'm just going to hit search. And by default, as you can see, we have the VSFTPD backdoor command execution by Rapid7. Now Rapid7 is the company that created um, Metasploit. And as you can see, this is going to be a Metasploit module that you can use. So let's look at the information about this exploit. So this module exploit a malicious backdoor that was added to the VSFTPD download archive. The backdoor was introduced in the VSFTPD archive between June 30th to 2011, etc, etc. Alright, so this is a backdoor exploit that allows you to gain backdoor ac access, uh, you know, into the system, in this case, the Metasploitable 2. So, uh, it's given you the module name that you can use with Metasploit. So let's copy that. All right, and we can get started direct with uh, Meta, the MSF console with exploitation. So just copy this and we want to go back into our terminal. And now, as I said, what is the command that we use to actually select uh, a module that we wanted to use? It is the use command. All right, so we type in use and we paste, we paste in uh, the name of the module. In this case, it's an exploit. So for Unix, the FTP uh, protocol and the name or, and the version of the service, which in this case is the VSFTPD 2.3.4 backdoor. So once I hit enter, it's going to just uh, say here MS exploit and it's using that current exploit. All right. Now we need to set the options. All right. But first we need to show the options. So we use the show command, show options. This will show you the options that you can edit. And these are very important. So once I hit enter, it's going to show you the options that you need to change or you need to add. So the first option is the our host. This is the target address of the, you know, of your target. So in this case, it's going to be the IP address of the Metasploitable 2 virtual machine. All right. Or our target for that matter. You then have the R port, which is the default uh, of the target port uh, for FTP, which we know in this case is port 21. It was correctly configured. So yes, we do not need to change that. So you might be asking, how do we actually, how do we set uh, these things? And we looked at this command. So we're going to use uh, the set command. So we'll say set. And now we select uh, the option name, which in this case is our host. All right. We're going to set our host and we're going to enter the IP address. So 192.168.1.106. All right. So once I hit enter, it's going to set that our host to that IP address. All right. And you might be asking, well, what now? We've seen that we, we have set the R host and we can confirm this by checking or by, by typing in show options again. So if I hit show options, as you can see, the target address is going to be 192.168.1.106. Yes, the R port, uh, is, uh, the, the port is 21 and we know it's running that service. And we can confirm this by going to the results that we got with ZenMap, the information gathering. So as you can see, the port is port 21, the protocol is TCP, the service is FTP, and this version is VSFTPD 2.3.4. So we are ready to exploit. And how do we do that? You guessed it, we use the exploit command. So I'm just gonna type in exploit and just give it a few seconds. Now by default, if this stage doesn't work, just try it again. It usually works uh, the second time or the third time around. And voila, it has successfully created a backdoor and launched the backdoor and given us a reverse shell. So as you can see, let's look at the information that is given us. So uh, the IP address that connected to us via that port, backdoor service has been spawned. And now you might be asking, what do we do? Well, the thing you can do is you have access to the Metasploitable 2 virtual machine. And you might be saying, well, how do we know that? Well, uh, you can type in any command that you want. So if, for example, I type in ls. There we are. So we know that uh, we're in the root directory or the home directory of the uh, Metasploitable 2 virtual machine. Uh, but we can confirm this by going into the, we, we can type in the uname a command. And as you can see, Linux Metasploitable 2, uh, and we are in the Metasploits, uh, you know, operating system. We've exploited it and you can imagine the damage we can do now. So that was some basic exploitation, you know.
and now you have access to the entire operating system remotely with the back door. So that was how to exploit a service that is running on a port using Metasploit. Now, as I said, this is where everything comes together. We've done the information gathering. We have got, you know, we've performed the vulnerability analysis. You know, these are all stages on their own, but very, very important as you can see. Now, you, you know, you've looked at the service that was running on the port, uh, the FTP port. You've seen that indeed there is a vulnerability and you've exploited it and you have access uh, in your system now. So that was how to use Metasploit, more specifically the MSF console. In the next video, we'll be looking at Armitage, the graphical user interface before Metasploit. So I hope you're excited and I'm going to be seeing you in the next video. Exploring Armitage. Hello everyone and welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to be exploring Armitage. All right, so we're actually going to be performing exploits on our vulnerable operating system, which in this case is Metasploitable too. So I hope you're really, really excited. So you might be asking yourself, what exactly is Armitage? Well, Armitage is simply the graphical user interface for Metasploit, all right? So the way you have Nmap and Zenmap, Nmap being the command line interface, and you have your Zenmap, which is the graphical user interface, that is the same way. So you have your Metasploit console and Armitage. So Armitage is the graphical user interface for Metasploit, all right? So some of the advantages are it gives the user much better idea of what's going on. So great ease of access and the user is able to understand uh, the, the scan process and how everything is being exploited. And it just gives the, the user graphical representation of the scan and the exploitation technique. All right, so let's get started. Now, by default, Armitage can be found on the dock uh, on Calidex. So if you just go to the little uh, green head creature icon, uh, I'm not sure if that is the, what it is, uh, but regardless of that, uh, as you can see, it is Armitage. Or if you do not have it on your dock, you can just go into applications and you can go into exploitation tools and you'll find Armitage there. All right, so just click on Armitage and now it's going to prompt you to connect to the local host in a few seconds. Just give it a few seconds to start up. And there we are. It's going to prompt you to connect to the local host and the port. Just hit connect. Do not change anything here. And once uh, you hit connect, it's going to prompt you to start the Metasploit RPC server. So just hit yes, we want to do that. And now it's going to start connecting to the remote host and just give it a, a few seconds and we should be good with Armitage. All right. So the great thing about Armitage, as I said, is that the exploitation is uh, is then uh, the exploitation process is automated as well as the setting of hosts, the setting of targets, but, you know, vulnerability analysis, uh, you know, it also offers, you know, functionality like that. And we'll be looking at this when we'll be exploiting our, our Metasploitable 2 virtual machine. All right, so as you can see, Armitage is loaded up and you might be a bit confused with the interface because you heard me tell you that it was a graphical user interface and now you're seeing a Metasploit console here. Well, don't worry about that. The Metasploit console there is, uh, is there to aid you in what exactly is going on. All right, so the first thing I'm going to start with is I'm going to start with this little toolbar up here. This little toolbar is uh, very, very simply put. So in Armitage, you can set, change settings like add a new connection. You can check the preferences. You can set the target view settings. You can set the target view, set the exploit rank. You can use a SOX proxy like we did in the proxy chains video. We can look at the listeners so you can connect to or wait for. You can set the L host, the listening host, if you want another listening host. For example, if you're running uh, Kali Linux on another computer, and you want uh, that computer to also listen to. You also have your scripts and you can close Armitage. In terms of the view, this is just to edit the view. When we look at hosts, you can add your host. So for example, uh, we'll add our Metasploitable 2 virtual machine here, but uh, we'll do that in a few seconds. We have Nmap scans, which is awesome. You can automate Nmap scans directly from Armitage. You then have your Metasploit scans, which is awesome. Uh, we then have your DNS enumeration which we looked at in the information gathering section, I hope you remember. So everything can come together really, really beautifully. And that's why I really enjoy using Armitage and you'll, I'm sure you'll see why, All right? You can then clear your database, which is essentially just clearing, uh, you, you know, any of the leftover scans uh, that you had performed or exploits that you had performed. You then have your attacks where you can find attacks on your target or your host uh, and you have Hail Mary, which is something we'll look at in a few minutes. Okay, looking at the workspaces, you can manage and show all your, the workspaces you currently have. In terms of help, you have your homepage, your tutorials, scripts, and your bot section. 
All right, fantastic. Now let's get into the interface. So the interface is sorted into three sections. All right, you have your, your first section, your second section, and your third section. All right, so you can enlarge them and resize them uh, depending on how you want them. Uh, to be displayed so I usually like having mine uh, like this because I like having to see what the console displays but uh, as much as I like that I will be looking at the first section here in the first section uh, essentially what is being displayed here is your pre-configured modules all right so you can also search for modules here uh, you know in this little search bar so this is where you have all the modules sorted in terms of auxiliary exploits payloads and the post which we'll look at in a few seconds uh, when it comes to the second, the second interface here, the second interface is used to display your active targets uh, that we were able to exploit against. All right, so this is where all your active targets will be displayed in forms of computers. We'll look at that again when we'll get started with Metasploitable 2. As for the console, this is your Metasploit console, and uh, it'll be well. Your activity will be sorted in forms of tabs here. Again, you'll be you look at exactly how that happens. And essentially allows you to run your metapreter or your console sessions simultaneously something really really awesome and i'm sure you'll appreciate it okay let's get started with your module section so as i said your modules essentially contain all your modules in this section and they're sorted in terms of auxiliary exploits payloads and post and you can go through them so for example we have auxiliary you can look at the auxiliary scanners you have your scanners fuzzers uh you know your sniffers spoofers etc etc you have your exploits, where your exploits are sorted in terms of their, their platform that they're running on and operating system that they're running on. For example, you have Android, Apple, iOS, uh, Firefox, FreeBSD, uh, Linux, uh, Unix, uh, Mac OS X, and Windows. You then have your play payloads that are also sorted in terms of their platforms and the operating systems that they're currently, that they are to be exploited on. All right, you then have your post, which is also similarly sorted in terms of their platforms and the operating systems that they are designed to be exploited on so let me just close every one of this and as i said you can also use the search bar here to search for the metasploit uh, modules all right now let's get started with some actual uh, exploitation and we're going to start off with metasploitable too all right so what we're going to do is we're going to go into hosts all right now in hosts you can import hosts or you can add hosts we're not going to add a host yet and the reason is i'm going to use an nmap scan to also perform some information gathering while adding the host so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go into nmap scan and I want to perform a quick scan that will detect the operating system that is running on our target or our host for that matter. So I'm going to click on that and now it's going to prompt you to enter your host IP address or your target IP address or the range if you want to scan your entire network. In this case, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get the IP address for Metasploitable 2, which as you can see here is 192.168.1.106. So we're just going to enter that right now. Excellent. So once we hit enter, it's going to perform the nmap scan and it's going to detect what operating system is running. Now, as I said here, the activities are going to be sorted out in terms of tabs. So your console is still open and your nmap uh, scan is still uh, ongoing here or it's, a, it's just started and you can run them both simultaneously, which is fantastic, right? So the scan is done and it should give you a prompt here saying the scan is complete. Voila. So uh, it's going to give you an option here saying use attacks, find attacks to suggest applicable exploits for your targets. Interesting. So I'm going to hit OK. And what do we have here? Well, we have a little cute little penguin here to represent Linux. So we know it is running uh, Linux 2.6 uh, and the kernel is not specified more than that. All right. So you can see the services and the ports and the services running on these ports uh, with the Nmap scan. So we were able to get information about our target. And now we, we understand what operating system is running on it and we can see the services running on the ports. In the previous video, we looked at exploiting the FTP protocol or the FTP port with the, uh, the VSFTPD uh, backdoor. And how did we do that? All right, the first thing we did is we know that it exists as an exploit. So we're gonna go into our modules and I'm gonna show you exactly how to find it. So we're gonna go into exploits and we, we are going to go into Unix because it is a Unix exploit. And once I click into Unix, we're going to then select the protocol, which in this case is the FTP protocol right here. And we're going to expand that. And voila, you have your SVSFTPD 2.3.4 backdoor. So if you want to execute this, what we do is we just double click it. All right. And once we double click it, it's going to give you the options that we used in the previous uh, or we used in the Metasploit console. Uh, options like setting your R host and the R port. 
So by default, the L host, which is your listening host, which is your IP address, is default is set by default. So 192.168.1.107, and the default listening port is also set uh, by default. All you have to do is just enter your R host, which in this case is 192.168.1.106, and we will exploit the backdoor using the FTP service. So 192.168.1.106. And once you're ready, you can just hit launch, all right? And it's gonna launch the exploit. So just give it a few seconds and it's gonna open up a new tab over here, the exploit tab. Just give it a few seconds here. And there we are, found shell, command shell open, and voila, we have backdoor access. Now you might have noticed something also very, very interesting. The Linux computer here is now uh, surrounded by lightning or electricity and is turned red. Now this means that we have successfully exploited this system in one way or another. All right, so this is fantastic. Everything is automated really, really well. But now you might be asking, I want to exploit more things with Metasploitable. What can I do now? All right, tell me what I can do. So what we're going to do is we're going to close up this menu here. And what uh, the, the awesome thing, here, as I said, is the automation. Uh, but before that, I'm just going to, well, if I look at the shell that's running, uh, if I right click, sorry about that, if I right click on the target, we can see that it gives us options to log into the default network services. Now, that is something just, uh, you know, very, very common. Once you've cracked them, if the cracking process is possible, you can then log into things like the FTP protocol, the HTTP, MySQL, SSH, you get the idea. Now the shell that we created, which is what we, the exploit that we used, allows us to interact with it. We can then upload, we can pass the session, we can post modules and we can disconnect. So uh, let's say we wanted to interact with it. So if we wanted to interact with it, it's going to open up a shell for us. And again, we can list the files on the server, the Metasploitable 2, uh, you know, virtual machine, which is considered to be a server because it does run some web applications. And voila, you have access to the root folder. So let's see if we change directory to the home directory and we list the files in there. We have the MSF admin. So let's also change directory into that MSF admin and we can list the files in there. We have the vulnerable. So CD vulnerable, CD vulnerable. And if we list there, we have the web services that are running. So you have MySQL, the Samba, uh, Tiki Wiki, etc., etc. So I'm just going to close the shell because we are done with that exploit. Let's look at how to exploit or how to find exploits automatically now. So I'm going to close that shell and I'm just going to right click and I'm going to go to the shell one and I'm going to hit disconnect because we're done with that exploit, right? So once it's disconnected, it's going to remove the little uh, icon that denoted the fact that the uh, operating system or the computer was, uh, was exploited. Now you might be asking, well, how do we find exploits automatically? Well, we go into attacks and we find attacks. All right. So now it's going to find attacks that you can run on the operating system or the computer, in this case, our target host, which is the Metasploitable 2 virtual machine. So as you can see, it's gonna square if the exploits and just give it a few seconds to go through all of them. And once it's done, it's gonna give you all a, a list of the compatible exploits that you can use or exploits that can actually uh, exploit a vulnerability on your on the operating system or the target that you've chosen. So if we right click now and we go into attack, you can see that it's listed all the services uh, that we can crack. So if we go to FTP, we have the VS FTP backdoor here. We have the pure uh, FTP bash uh, execution here. You can also check for exploits again. You have your telnet, you have your HTTP vulnerabilities. So these are all uh, vulnerability uh, or exploits that you can run on this virtual machine. So if we go to, for example, something like the web app, or let's get something more practical. If we go into the MySQL, so we are only have one exploit for the MySQL uh, database. So if we click on this payload, if we load it and uh, let's see if everything is set correctly, the R host, there we are. That's okay. So we're just going to launch. Let's see if we can get any information, right? So it's going to start the exploit in a new tab. I'm just going to close the old tab. So it's going to start the exploit process. Just give it a few seconds here. And there we are. It's going through a process. Uh, for some reason, the MySQL function system execution is not available. So yeah, this exploit did not work. Now this is what I was talking about. Not every exploit is going to work. And it's really, really important that you understand this. You know, whether or not a computer is vulnerable to an attack, um, you know, different exploits might not work for different reasons. So let's try and find another exploit that we can, we, you know, we, we can use here. So I'm just going to right click and we're going to go into attack. And let's see if we can look at the real server here uh, or Samba. Uh, let's try the trans to open on the Samba server. 
All right, so make sure all these settings are set by default here and I'm going to hit launch, all right? So I'm just going to close the old exploit, start it by handler. And again, uh, this target is not vulnerable. Uh, the Samba server is running the Samba 3.0.20 Debian. So again, not vulnerable, uh, but regardless of that, you can take your time and find services that are vulnerable. Um, so let's see what else we can try and exploit. What about the SSH service? All right, so let's if we can actually get SSH uh, access, that will be really, really fantastic. So let's see what we can get here. So let's try and look at what services are running on the SSH port. So if you go to Nmap and I look at the SSH port, which is port 22, we have OpenSSH that's running on uh, Ubuntu. So Debian Ubuntu. So let's go back to attacks and let's go to SSH. All right. And let's see whether we can get any uh, vulnerabilities here. If I click on more, as you can see, you have Ubiquity and the other exploits that you can use. So uh, I'm just going to use uh, something random. So let's try the Tectisha password change request. Again, make sure your settings like your, uh, your R host are set correctly and just hit launch. Again, this might not work. All right, there we are. Uh, the authorization is continuing. Uh, let's see if we can get anything. So, so far, the exploitation has not been successful. Again, as I said, not all services uh, will be able to be exploited, even if they are vulnerable. Right. And that is the real charm of exploitation is finding the correct vector or the, uh, the correct entry point. All right. So if I right click here, as you can see, that was a failure. So I'm just going to close the exploit again. We're going to close that one as well. And let's try and find one that works before we end this video. All right. So attack uh, web applications or VNC. We can actually look at VNC because I feel that we can get uh, there. We are. So VNC keyboard execution. I'm going to hit OK. Let's see if we can get access to the VNC here. All right. Uh, there we are. Um, for some reason, it hasn't started. All right. There it started. Uh, opening run command and yeah by default the VNC uh, the connection was reset by the peer so uh, the Metasploitable 2 virtual machine has some sort of protection against uh, unknown logins through VNC so we're going to try another attack vector here hopefully as I said we can get one um, we're just going to try the x11 keyboard execution and we're going to launch that again another exploit here give that a few seconds or we can actually perform the normal Google search so that is also an option that we can do. So as you can see, that exploit failed there. Now let's go back into Nmap and let's see what else we can uh, we can exploit here. Let's look at another service that we can exploit here. For example, the Telnet. Let's try and connect to Telnet. So attack. We can look at uh, Telnet and the Telnet encrypt key ID. I'm going to launch that and we're going to close that old exploit uh, tab there. Let's try this one. Trying target. All right. So it's brute forcing the possible targets. Just give it its time. Um, exploit aborted due to failure. This system does not support encryption. Anyway, uh, that was basically how to use Armitage, uh, you know, to perform automated exploits and how to perform normal, you know, target uh, host scans uh, to get gather information about your target vulnerability analysis and furthermore automating the exploitation process. All right. So that's going to be it for this video. I'll be seeing you in the next video where we'll get started with Metasploit. Hello everyone and welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to be looking at MySQL database exploitation with Metasploit. So we've looked at how to use Metasploit. We've gone through everything we need to know about the Metasploit console. We've looked at how to perform a basic exploit. We've looked at uh, Armitage, which is the graphical user interface for Metasploit. And now it's time to look at one of the fundamentals of exploitation, which is actually exploiting a working database. Now, luckily for us, Metasploitable 2 does come with a, a MySQL server, which is perfect for practicing and understanding how everything just comes together in terms of exploiting a database. All right. So the most important thing to understand here is now everything comes together. All the sections that we've learned so far all come together really, really well. So now we're going to be performing some basic information gathering about a target. We're done here. I've performed an Nmap scan with Zenmap. If I just open that up on our target. So again, we're using Metasploitable 2 because it does come with a MySQL uh, database server and it is much better than going outside or out of your network and doing it illegally or actually exploiting a database that belongs to someone uh, whom you have no permission, you know, in doing it for. So that is also uh, something I would like to pass out. Please make sure that you are doing this in your virtual lab because you are still not competent enough to go into a real working network and to exploit or to actually perform penetration testing on working databases, All right? So it's very, very important that you understand that. So again, uh, by default, if we just go to the scan results and we go into the ports 
here that uh, it was able to find. Uh, one of them that we'll find here is the MySQL database uh, port, which is 3306. Uh, so you can see by default, it's running MySQL and the MySQL service version is right here. Now you can go ahead and look for exploits for this service version. But uh, there again, this might not be a viable option. All right. If you've performed your vulnerability analysis, it may not be an actual uh, vulnerability that you can exploit. Now, what we're going to be using is we're going to be using a brute force attack uh, with Metasploit, with the, the Metasploit console more specifically, where we'll be trying to brute force the login credentials. Now, since we haven't looked at password section of the course, we do not know yet how to create a word list or a password list in which we can use to perform the brute force attack using default usernames and password combinations. So by default, I'm just going to be using a singular uh, username, which, uh, as I said, is used by default on MySQL databases, which is the root username. All right. So the username is actually root. Now, by default, Metasploitable2 uh, does not have a password for the MySQL database. So it is essentially a blank password. Now, I know you might be thinking to yourself, well, why exactly are we exploiting this uh, if, you, you know, the, the credentials don't actually exist? Well, in theory, if you use the same method, you can actually exploit a real working database if you had created a word list or a password list, which we'll be looking at in the password section of the course. All right, so let's get started. Now, as we know, the by default, the IP address for uh, the Metasploitable 2 virtual machine is 192.168.1.106. Yours might be different on your network. All right, so we're going to open up the Metasploit console. And now we have to actually use the search command because, as I said, these all come together really well. And this is where you'll find all of these sections in the course coming down, you know, really, really well. So essentially, now we have to search for the MySQL module. All right, so search for MySQL. All right, and we're going to hit search. So it's going to start the database and just give that a few seconds to bring out the results. There we are. Now you might be asking, well, what exactly, what module here are we using? Well, the most important one that we're going to be using is the login module here. All right, so it's the auxiliary scanner uh, and the MySQL login module. So by default, it is a scanner module. It's not an actual exploit, but it does give you the option. Uh, you know, we're going to be performing brute force attacks with it. So it is in theory an exploitation, but it does not actually carry out the exploitation for you in the sense that it does not log you into the MySQL server. It uh, rather gets the credentials so that you can do it for yourself. All right. So that is the difference there. So we're just going to copy it. And now you might be asking, how do we get to using this? So all we have to do is hit use and we paste that in here, or you can use the control plus shift plus V key on your keyboard and it will paste it in there by default, or you can right click and paste it. And uh, we just hit enter. And by default, it'll tell you, yes, you're using the auxiliary, uh, more specifically the scanner and the MySQL login scanner. All right. So now what we do, let's clear this up. So we have a great idea of what's going on and we use the show options command. All right. So show options. And now you might be asking, well, what do we need to change here? Well, there's a few things you need to change here. One of the most important things that you need to change the username, the default username, as I said, we're going to be using a default username, which in this case you can specify here. All right. So a specific username to authenticate as the description. So we're going to say set username. All right. And I can just auto complete that. And I'm going to say set the username as root. All right. So that is the default username that is used on my SQL databases. Now in the real world, obviously it's going to be changed, but what you would do is you'd use a user, you'd use a password file. We will be looking at generating and you would use a user file that contains usernames. And obviously the password file contains passwords, which you can then brute force against. And then uh, depending on your success rate, you can either get the credentials or if the credentials do not exist within the word list or the password list, then uh, the uh, the exploitation of the brute force attack fails. But in this case, we're going to set the default username as root and I'm going to hit enter. So yes, we do. We have set that. Now we need to set, we need to look uh, and set the R host, which is the most important as well, because we need to set the IP address. So R host, as you can see, that exists right here. So R hosts, all right. So R hosts, and that is 192.168.1.106. And I'm going to hit enter and it's going to set the R host. Fantastic. Now we need to set uh, the blank passwords because we do not have uh, any passwords that we want to specify and we do not have a password list. So as you can see, it's going to try blank passwords for all the users. Now, again, as I said, uh, by default in a real world, this is not going to be the case. But in that case, you would have a password list or a password file that you can specify. 
Okay, so we're going to say set a blank, we're going to say set blank passwords, and we're going to set that to a value now. Now that is very, very important. We're going to set it to a value here, which in this case, the current setting, as you can see, is false. So we're going to change it to true because we are, you know, using blank passwords. So once we hit that, uh, we've essentially set the, use, the default username as root. We have set the R hosts. We have actually, uh, you know, set the value of the blank passwords to true. So it's uh, going to use blank passwords. And now you might be asking, what do we do? Well, it's really very simple. We just hit run or we can hit exploit. All right. So if we hit exploit, let's see what we get. All right. So I'm just going to hit exploit and it's going to start the process. And as you can see, it's already got the result. So uh, by default, the username is root. Now, again, I specified the default one because as I said, Metasploitable 2 is, you know, designed to be vulnerable. So now you might be asking, well, yeah, we've got the username and we know the, the password is blank. Well, how do we get access to the database? Well, that can be done by going into a terminal, a separate terminal. And uh, we can just open that up here. Let me just minimize this. And what we do now is we need to log into the database, the MySQL database on our host, right? So that can be done by the MySQL command. So MySQL. And now we specify the username, which in this case is root as we know it. And since there's no password, we do not have to specify a password. Uh, so now we specify our host, which is 192.168.1.106. Fantastic. And we just hit enter and we should be into the MySQL database. Fantastic. So you might be asking or you still might be skeptical uh, and you might be asking yourself, well, how do I know this is the actual Metasploitable database? How do I know this is running on your local server? Well, that's really simple. All I have to do is I just have to show the databases. So that can be done if you're familiar with uh, the MySQL syntax, that can be done by show databases. So once I hit enter, there you are. As you can see, you have the damn vulnerable web application, Metasploit, MySQL, uh, OSAP, uh, your Tiki week. All right. So in the next video, we will be looking at client side attacks where we'll be using the BEF for browser exploitation. So I'll be seeing you in the next video. Hello everyone and welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to be looking at client side exploitation. More specifically, we're going to be looking at client side exploitation with the beef framework or the BEF framework, depending on how you want to pronounce it. All right, so you might be asking yourself, well, what exactly uh, is client side exploitation? Well, simply put, client side exploitation is the process of attacking a client, uh, more specifically attacking the operating system and the programs that are installed on the client's computer. All right, so essentially what you're, you're doing, what the main objective is, is to find uh, the, the exploits that run on the client's operating system and more specifically on the programs installed on that operating system and to exploit them. All right. So now you might be asking, well, what exactly are we looking at in this video? When in this video, we're going to be looking at how to use BIF uh, to essentially exploit uh, the browser vulnerabilities. All right. So you might be asking yourself now again, what is BIF? Well, BIF uh, essentially allows you to find uh, and exploit vulnerabilities uh, in browsers. All right. So it is a fantastic exploitation tool that allows you to hook browsers and then to exploit those browsers on the client operating systems uh, and computers. OK, so it is a fantastic phishing tool. Uh, uh, it is a fantastic tool that allows you to perform phishing attacks. Uh, and uh, it, the fantastic thing is that it runs on a web interface. All right. So now we have to look at some very, very important terminology and some prerequisites for the video. OK, so uh, by default, we're going to be running this now on a client. All right. So what do I mean by this? We're not going to be running this on a server. So no Metasploitable 2 this time. We're going to be using a Windows operating system. More specifically, we're going to be using Windows 7 and we're going to be exploiting or hooking the browser, which is in this case Mozilla Firefox. And we're then going to be finding exploits that we can run on the browser. All right. So BIF is a fantastic penetration testing framework that allows you to test for vulnerabilities and exploits on browsers. Uh, so let's get started. Now, by default, as I said, we're going to be using Windows. You can use any operating system, any Windows operating system or computer that is running on your network. OK, so this is going to be performed on our local layer network. So if you want to use uh, BIF on computers or clients that are outside your network or in simply put terms, computers that are you know across the world uh, via the Internet, you then need to set up port forwarding. But that is an advanced topic that we'll hopefully probably discuss in another course. But for now, we're going to focus on performing this on our local air network in a in our virtual lab.
Okay, so by default, uh, the Beef framework is uh, pre-installed on Gal Linux, which is fantastic. All you need to do is just update your repositories and update your packages and have it uh, installed uh, to the latest framework. So it is usually found on the dock here. So on your left, if you just go to the, this cow image here, uh, by default, you have the Beef uh, cross-site scripting framework. So that is what XSS denotes. All right, so it can also be found in the applications menu. If you go to the applications and you go to exploitation tools, you will find it under the Armitage. Uh, you'll find it there, uh, Beef XSS framework. So you can start it directly from here and it's going to start the Beef service for you. Or instead, you can go to the uh, the user directory and the uh, the actual Beef directory and start the service from there. So I'm going to be showing you two of those ways of starting it. So if we start it from here, if I just click on this, or you start it from the dock, it's essentially going to start the beef services. It's just going to display some information here that is very, very critical. So I want you to leave this terminal open. And once it's done, it's going to open up beef in your browser. So give it a few seconds. There we are. And welcome to beef. So now it's going to display to you this authentication uh, screen. Don't worry about the username and password combination. We'll get to that in a second. So that is the first way of launching beef. The second way is going to the directory, which can be found at CD user share and the beef uh, cross-site scripting folder. So if I click on that uh, and I just list the files in here, you can see we have the beef executable. So if we just launch it by using the uh, the shell execution here, so uh, we just type in beef and just hit enter and it's going to start up beef from there. All right, so we have already started it, so we do not have to do it that way. Now it's going to display some information here that is very, very important. And we need to look at some of the terminology before we get started. So you might have heard uh, of me saying things like hook. All right. So the most important thing with beef is hooking. All right. So you might be asking yourself, well, what exactly is hooking? What is the hooking process? All right. So the hooking process is essentially getting the client to click on a link that contains the JavaScript file, the hook JavaScript file. And then that JavaScript file will be processed by the client's web browser and then it will tie their browser back to the beef server. All right. So simply put, essentially what the process of hooking is, is getting your client or your target to click on a link that contains the JavaScript hook file. That JavaScript hook file will then be processed and then uh, that browser will be hooked or tied back to the beef server. All right. So that is the hooking process. So you might be asking, how do we go about doing this? Well, as you can see, the information provided to you, uh, firstly, is the beef server URL or the interface URL. As you can see, it can be found by going to HTTP 127.0.01. Uh, the port is 3000 and UI panel. So if we go back to the browser, you can see that indeed it is running on that. So that is just the beef framework. Looking at the hook.javascript file, you can see it right here, all right? So it's going to give you a hook right here. So the hook, this is very, very important. It, it is essentially a JavaScript file that you would include in a web page, all right? So now you might be asking, well, how are we going to actually emulate this on our virtual environment? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to start a local web server here on our Kali Linux machine. And then we are going to incorporate this, uh, the JavaScript, uh, this script right here into the header section of the web page. And then we will then send the IP address to the browser that we want to hook and it's going to open the web page. And furthermore, the browser will then be hooked. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is we're going to be using the Apache web server on Kali Linux. All right. So that is very important. The second thing we need, as you can see, if you look at the script right here, it's going to give you an option to enter your IP address. Now, the IP address that it's asking for is the IP address in which the Beef Framework uh, server is running on. In this case, it's running on the Kali Linux virtual machine. So we need to get the Kali Linux uh, IP address, in this case, the local IP address. So we're going to click on a terminal and we're just going to hit IF config. All right. And once we get the local IP address right here, which is 192.168.1.106, that is what we needed. All right. Fantastic. So we just need to keep that in mind. And now, we, as I said, we need to start the uh, the local web server, which in this case is Apache. How do we start that service? We go to service Apache to and start. All right. So very, very simple to how we started our network services. So I'm just going to hit enter. Fantastic. So now the web server is started. Now we need to actually edit the web page file that is hosted on our web server. So that can be found by going into your file explorer and going into other locations, going to your computer, uh, going to your var folder, into your www uh, folder. That is where your web server files are going to be stored, your local web server files. 
just click on that and then you'll find an HTML folder. Click on that and then you'll find an index.html file in here. If yours is empty, just create an index.html file and we'll, we'll add some code into it to just make it a simple web page. Okay. Uh, so if you do not have any files, just create one. If you have uh, any files, just get rid of them and create a new one. All right. So I've already created one. So what I'm going to do is we're going to edit it with our text editor. So I'm just going to open up, uh, I'm just going to open it up with leafpad. All right. Fantastic. So once I've opened it up with leafpad, you can see that I've just created a simple uh, HTML template here. If you're familiar with web development, you know, this, this is a very, very simple website. Essentially what's happening here is it's going to uh, essentially display welcome to the site and it's going to say this is a hooked server. So we know that this web page has been opened successfully. All right. So as I said, uh, by default uh, in HTML, any JavaScript code is supposed to be included in the head section of the web page. All right. So it's supposed to be included within the opening and closing tag, uh, the opening and closing head tag. All right. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go to the information that uh, was provided to us here and we're going to copy the script file. All right. So we're just going to copy it like so, and we're going to paste it in the head section here. Now we need to change the IP address to the IP address or in which the B framework server is being hosted, which in this case we saw as uh, the Kali Linux IP address here. So there we are 192.168.1.106. That is the INET address there. So we're just going to change it to that. So 192.168.1.106. And you want to make sure that the port is 3000 and it is using the hook.javascript file. Fantastic. So let's save this. And uh, now essentially what happens is when anyone will access this IP address here in which we have the local host or the local web server, it is going to execute the hook.javascript file and that will tie the browser to the uh, or will essentially hook the browser and will be able to access and exploit it uh, from the beef uh, framework uh, web interface. All right. That we already have opened. OK, that was a mouthful. Now let's get to actually executing this on, on our, of our browsers. So uh, once you've hit, hit save, uh, so you can just save it and I've saved it. So we don't need to worry about that, about that now. Pardon me. So now what we need to do is we can close that and we can leave this open. Now we've started the Apache 2 service. Now we need to log into the Beef uh, framework um, uh, user interface. So the default username is Beef. All right. And the default password is Beef. Fantastic. That's quite simple, isn't it? So we're just going to log in and welcome to Beef. Now, by default, the interface uh, that you will get if this is your first time running it will be pretty much the same apart from having information here. So, for example, I already have been performing penetration tests with Beef before. So uh, I already have an IP address or a browser hooked here. So don't worry about that. Essentially, what uh, if you look at the basic interface here, it's really, really simple. Uh, on your left tab, you have your hooked browsers and they're sorted in terms of online and offline. In this case, I have an offline hooked browser here and I have no online browsers, but we'll be getting to that in a second. You have your getting started guide here and you have your logs here. We'll be looking at that in a second. Fantastic. So we've started the beef framework. Now we need to actually run uh, the HTML file on browser. In this case, we're going to be running this on our Windows 7 operating system here. So this is a fantastic, uh, you know, a fantastic opportunity for me to actually demonstrate what a client would do. So for example, now, if I just opened up my browser, all right, and I send my client or a target that I want to attack, I sent them a link that contains the JavaScript file. So in this case, the link is, uh, it's hosted on our local service, which uh, is in this case, 192.168.1.106. So once I hit enter, it's going to load up the local server and it's going to display the HTML file that we created and the file that contains the hook.javascript file. So once I hit enter, as you can see, it's going to display the information that we uh, added to the web file, which is welcome to the site. This is a hooked server file. Now you might be asking, well, what is that exactly has happened? Has this browser been hooked? The answer is yes, it has been hooked. If we go back to Kali Linux and we open up our Biff web interface, you can see if we go to online browsers, it has been hooked. And the IP address is 192.168.1.110. So you might be still skeptical and you might be asking, well, how do I know that's the correct browser that has been hooked? So let me just go back and I'm just going to run an IP config command here to just show you that that is the correct IP address. So let me just open a command prompt, IP config. And as you can see, the IP address is 192.168.1.110. Fantastic. So we have hooked a browser. Now you might be asking, well, what do we do now? Well, fantastic. We have actually hooked a browser. How do we get to exploit it? 
Well, the first thing we need to look at is we click on uh, the hooked browser here. It's going to display some information here, which is very, very important. It's going to display information about the browser. So by default, it's going to display uh, information about the browser. So you have your browser version, uh, the browser string, which in this case is information about the browser. In this case, it is running Mozilla. We have uh, the browser language, the browser platform, which in this case is Windows 32 bit. Excellent. You then have the window size in terms of uh, what is the resolution of the window of the browser. We then have the browser components. So is it running Adobe Flash? So that means we won't be able to exploit any Adobe Flash uh, vulnerabilities. So again, information gathering is also a part here. Okay, so we then have uh, information like session cookies. Interesting. So that means we can actually uh, get some session cookies. Very, very important thing to keep in mind. You then have information about the hooked web page, which is the web page we created. Uh, you then have information about the host, which is the operating system and the hardware, which in this case we have not been able to get. It will also display uh, useful information like whether or not the device is uh, a touch screen. In this case, it's not. So now it's time to look at some basic exploitation. Now we have looked at already how to hook the browser. Let's look at a very, very simple exploit process. Now by, by default, I just want to say something. Not every browser is going to be uh, a fully vulnerable browser in the sense that all the major browsers th that you'll find out there, for example, Mozilla Firefox, Google Chrome, will have expo exploits patched or fixed. So it's going to be very, very difficult or very tricky to find exploits that are not already patched. All right, so you can only get a certain amount in, of information. If you're lucky uh, and a browser has not patched a certain vulnerability, you can you can essentially get information from there. All right, but by default, Beef can be very, very powerful if you actually find a vulnerability that works. All right, so we're going to go into commands. All the modules can be found in commands. All right, uh, the rest of these sections are more of an advanced feature that we'll probably look at uh, in an adv advanced course. But for now, let's look at some basic exploitation. All right, so what we can do is uh, if we look at the modules here, they're sorted in terms of browser Chrome extensions. Uh, that is if you're running a Chrome, if, you, if you're hooked a Chrome browser, you then have your debug, your exploits, a Metasploit, you can run Metasploit exploits on it, you can perform social engineering, etc., etc. All right, so now looking at information that we can use here, we already knew that we do not have Adobe Flash running, so it would be pointless trying to, uh, to actually run uh, any Adobe Flash exploits. Okay, so looking at some of the modules we can actually run, we can play a sound, we can remove the hook element, we can unhook the browser, we can uh, you can take pictures using the webcam. Now by default, as I said, this might not work depending on the browser that you're using. Most of, if, they, if your client is running an, uh, an outdated browser, then it might work, but by default, it'll not work, all right? You can look at the visited uh, URLs. So if you check for a URL here, so let's say if I tested uh, something like, uh, let's say we wanted to know if our target has visited uh, a website like www.bbc.com, we would enter that in here and we would hit execute, all right? And once we hit execute, what would happen is a command would be stored in the module results history section here that will log the commands that you've entered. And as you can see, it's going to give you the command results. So in this case, it's going to tell us that uh, did the uh, client browser, did it access bbc.com? Uh, it's going to return it as false, which means that no, it did not access that uh, that URL. So that is an exploit that works and you can test it out for yourself. Looking at things like the webcam, uh, this uses Adobe Flash. Uh, so, you know, essentially you, you, you can use your social engineering text here. If it had uh, Adobe Flash installed, what you would need to do is actually uh, allow the webcam module to be installed here. So what we can do is we can just change the text here. So let's change the text to something interesting. We can say, hello, you have been hacked. All right. Something really, really simple like that. And let's see whether it is actually able to exploit or and run this social engineering text. By default, it is not going to be able to take any pictures with the webcam because as I said, the browser is not running Adobe Flash. All right. So we'll change the title to say you have been, been hacked. And if we hit execute, we can go to the Windows 7 operating system and we open up uh, our browser. And as you can see, you have been hacked. And for some reason, I misspelled have there. Uh, let me just change that and make sure that that is correctly spelled. 
and we can execute that again. So you have been hacked. Let me execute that again. And voila, as you can see, it displayed a message. Now by default, it's supposed to ask you to install or to enable the webcam to take pictures. And by default, a user will be smart enough to understand that that is something uh, very, very dangerous to do. So it's really about social engineering and getting the client or the user or your target to click on things that uh, will eventually exploit or get their browsers exploited. So that was uh, exploitation with the Beef framework, more specifically client side exploitation. And it's really, really interesting to see how, you know, these exploits can be readily done and performed even uh, on a small scale on your local area network. All right, so that's going to be it for this video. In the next video, we'll be looking at client side attacks, this time using the social engineering toolkit. So I'll be seeing you in the next video. Hello everyone and welcome to this video. In this video we're going to be using or actually looking at client side exploitation with the social engineering toolkit or the set toolkit as it's so called. All right, so you might be asking yourself, well, what exactly is the social engineering toolkit? Well, the social engineering toolkit is a tool that was designed to create social engineering based attack vectors. The social engineering toolkit can create custom attacks very, very quickly. You can create malicious payloads. Uh, you know, you can create partial attacks. And there's a lot more you can create. Now, when it comes down to actually exploiting a system, you can start up a browser locally on your host operating system. You can create malicious code and then use Metasploit to deliver the payload or the exploit. All right. So it's really, really vast uh, in terms of the, the types of attacks you can perform. Now, in this video, what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at setting up a fake site. And uh, essentially, the attack vector we're going to be using is the credential harvesting method. All right. So this will essentially allow us to create a fake site, send it to the our target or our client. And then uh, from that, the client client enters their credentials and the credentials are sent back to us and they realize that that was not the actual site that they think they were visiting. All right. So for example, let me explain the process with a simple example. So let's say we use the credential harvesting method. We clone the Facebook website, the login page for Facebook, and then we host it on our local web server and we use the credential harvesting method uh, with the social engineering toolkit. And uh, we essentially now send our link that in which the cloned website is hosted on. And we send that link to our client and the client uh, clicks on it thinking that it is a valid website or a, a valid URL. And once they access it, they see it's the Facebook page and they think it's the legitimate Facebook page because we have cloned the legitimate uh, Facebook page. And uh, essentially what happens is they enter the credentials and the credentials are sent back to us, uh, therefore giving us access to their Facebook account, which we can then log into and lock them out of. So again, you can see how dangerous this attack is, how much damage it can do. So I do have to pass out caution. Please do not try this without any written permission or, you know, there are consequences to using this for, uh, if you know, for malicious intent. All right. So uh, in this video, we're going to be performing this on our local air network. And more specifically, we're going to be running this on our Windows 7 virtual machine. So this is going to act as our client or our target. And I'll show you exactly how everything works. All right. So we're going to go back into Kali Linux. And by default, the social engineering toolkit is pre-installed. So that is awesome. It's our client or our target. Okay. So it's pre-installed and it's pre-configured. So you do not need to do any setup process. All you need to do is just launch it up, uh, similar to what we saw with Beef. All right. So uh, the only thing you need to do probably is just update your repositories and your packages and you should be running the latest version. So uh, if what you can do is uh, it's not hosted on your dock here. It is hosted in your applications menu and your exploitation tools. So it is under your applications and exploitation tools. So you'll find it there. It is the SET or the social engineering toolkit. So you can launch it from there or you can launch it from your terminal, which is what I personally prefer. And to launch it, just hit SET toolkit. All right. So set toolkit and just hit enter. All right. So once you hit enter, it's probably going to ask you uh, to read the user agreement and then hit yes to proceed. Now, since I've already run this before, it didn't ask me that. But for you, if that was your first time running, it's going to ask you to whether or not you agree to the user permissions to which it'll prompt you to enter yes or no. Uh, obviously hit yes and it should take you to this menu. So welcome to the social engineering toolkit. I'm so excited to share this with you. All right. So as you can see, it's going to display information about the social engineering toolkit. And then you have your menu right here. So your menu is really, really simple. It is sorted in terms of your number sorting allows you to select options. So option one is social engineering attacks. Option two is penetration testing. Uh, option three is third party modules. Uh, num uh, option four is update the social engineering toolkit. So if you want to update it, just hit four on your keyboard and hit enter. 
All right. Uh, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using the social engineering attacks because the attack vector that we're going to be using, which is the credential harvesting method, essentially belongs under social engineering attacks. So we're going to hit one. All right. And now uh, what we need to select is, as you can see, there are plenty of options here that you can go through yourself. But the most important thing that we need to select here is the website attack vectors because we're going to be using a website as an attack vector. So we're going to select option two. Fantastic. And now it's going to give you the sub menu here. Now selecting your target method. All right. So you have your Java applet attack method. You have your Metasploit browser exploit method, which is not really powerful because I've used it before. It's really dependent on the browser and the operating system you're running. Now, the awesome thing with the credential harvesting method, which as you can see is option three, is that it works on any operating system. It works on any platform. It can work on your iOS devices, Android devices, uh, Windows, uh, Linux, Mac OS, etc, etc. You don't need to worry about the operating system and the program or the browser that is running. All right. All you need to do is just socially engineer uh, the URL or the link so that it looks realistic and the user believes that it is indeed in this case as we're going to be using the Facebook page. Uh, and then obviously they enter their credentials and uh, you know the credentials are sent to us. So as I said, we're going to be using Facebook as an example because it is a fantastic way of understanding the real damage that this can cause. All right. So again, let's get back to the uh, to selecting the third option, which is the credential harvester attack method. So we're going to hit uh, option three. And now it's going to ask you to select the option here in terms of uh, how you want to clone, whether or not you want to clone your website. If you're using a web template, if you're using a, a custom import where you can import your own web templates or your, your sites that you've created that you want to use for your social engineering. OK, so what we're going to be using is the site cloner because we want to directly copy the Facebook web page so that it looks as real as possible and as authentic as possible. The only thing that's going to be different is the URL or the link, which will be the IP address of the local server in which we've hosted it. In this case, it's going to be the Kali Linux IP address, all right, because that is where we are hosting the cloned website. OK, so we're going to hit uh, option two, which is site cloner. Now it's going to ask you the IP address for the post back. Uh, so in this case, it's asking you what is the IP address of the operating of the computer in which you want to receive the credentials in this case. And by default, it will show you the IP address that you should use. It is simply your Kali Linux IP address, which in this case is 192.168.1.106. You might be think, saying to yourself, is that really true? Well, we can check it for ourselves. So we're going to open up a new terminal and we're going to just perform the ifconfig command. And there we are 192.168.1.106. So we do know that it is correct. So we're going to enter that right now. All right. Now, the great thing is you do not need to set your target IP address. That's because your target is going to send your, their credentials to your IP address. All right. So that is the basic process behind what's going on here. So I'm going to hit enter. And now it's going to ask you to enter the URL of this website that you want to clone. In this case, we're going to be using the Facebook website. So the Facebook URL is HTTPS, all right, uh, which we can enter just right here, HTTPS www.facebook.com. And once we hit enter, it's going to start cl the cloning process. So as you can see, cloning the website, HTTPS login.facebook.com. And uh, the cloning process is complete. And as you can see, the best way to use the attack is if the username and password form fields are available. All right. So we do know that they are uh, available because it has cloned the login page for Facebook, as you can see right here, the login.facebook.com, uh, login.php. So yes, that is going to be the page. So uh, the credential harvester is running on port 80. So it's done. All we need to do now is open up the IP address uh, of the Kalinux uh, virtual machine on our client, or we can actually use uh, different cloaking methods or URL changing methods. Like we, we can use link shorteners to, to manipulate how the link will appear to the user, but that's for another video. That's really in terms of uh, the social engineering and how you would, up, you would make the link more appealing to the user. But in this case, we're looking at the process of exploitation. So essentially in theory, if we go to our Windows 7 operating system here and we open up our, our browser, all we need to do is enter our uh, Kalinux IP address and it should open up a Facebook page. All right. So 192.168.1.106. Uh, the actual Facebook login page is hosted on uh, the Kalinux operating system or virtual machine. So a user would click onto this. And as you can see here, it's going to take them. If we just go back, it's going to be hosted in this language. So I'm not sure what language this is probably Swahili or something. So uh, by default, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to enter my details. So this is probably your email address. So we're just going to hit something like test at gmail.com. 
and we're going to hit the password as uh, we're just going to call it test one two three all right and once we hit uh, log in uh, it should take us to the original facebook login page where the user recognizes that they haven't actually logged in so you might be asking yourself now well what has happened here have the credentials been sent well yes they have if we go back here as you can see let us just go back slightly up here and you will see that the credentials were entered this is because we reloaded the page so let's just go slightly up to the top here uh, there we are uh, slightly up to the top here and if we scroll down here uh, we reloaded the page here several times so we're just going to scroll to the bottom where the results were probably uh, given to us as you can see here the email uh, the possible username and, and password field were found the email is test at gmail.com and the password is test at uh, test123 alright so that was how to uh, perform the credential harvesting attack method with the social engineering toolkit more specifically this is how to perform client side attacks alright so that is a wrap for section 5 where we looked at exploitation now let's look at a summary of what we learned in this section all right, so the first thing we did is we started learning about the Metasploit console. We looked at the Metasploit basics, uh, some terminology that was very, very important to use. And again, the syntax, we then moved on to performing a very simple exploit. And uh, that is how we learned the Metasploit console. All right, we then moved on to using Armitage, Armitage being the graphical user interface for Metasploit. All right, so again, there we performed some basic exploitation on our Metasploitable 2 virtual machine. All right, we then moved on to database exploitation with Metasploit. We very, very simply just, we exploited a MySQL database using the brute force attacks. Uh, we then moved on to client side attacks where we started targeting uh, clients. In this case, we used the Biff browser or the Biff uh, framework for, uh, to exploit browsers. And we looked at the hooking process, uh, how to actually intercept or how to inject the script into a web page and how to send that web page to your target and the target uh, getting their browser hooked. And from then on, as you can then uh, perform exploitation on the target that has their browser hooked. Okay, we then moved on to client side attacks uh, with the social engineering toolkit where I showed you how to generate a fake uh, web page or we cloned a web page and from that uh, we were able to perform the credential harvesting. All right, so that is going to be it for this section. In the next section, we'll be looking at uh, password cracking. All right, so I'll be seeing you in the next section. Hello everyone and welcome to section 6, password cracking. So let's look at what we'll be learning in this section. Alright, so this section is going to revolve around password cracking. So uh, different types of password cracking will be trying to crack all, you know, logins, uh, will be trying to crack raw passwords, etc, etc. Alright, so uh, looking at what we'll be doing in the first video, we'll get started by learning how to generate a word list. Alright, so we're going to be looking at how to generate a word list with Crunch. So Crunch is a fantastic tool that allows you to generate custom uh, word lists. We'll then move on to password cracking with John the Ripper. All right. So John the Ripper is a fantastic and extremely powerful password cracking tool. We will be looking at cracking passwords like uh, zip files or, you know, passwords on zip files or RAR files, etc., etc. We'll then be moving on to password cracking with Hydra. We will be trying to crack a, an online login profile or a page. And uh, from then onwards, again, using Hydra to crack that uh, using either a brute force attack uh, with a word list. We'll then be finally finishing off with Medusa. We'll be looking at cracking, password cracking again, an online or trying to crack login credentials, uh, similar to what we'll be doing with Hydra. So Medusa is a very, very similar tool to Hydra. So that should tie together with each other. All right. So that's what we're going to be learning in this section. And uh, let's get started. In this video, we're going to be looking at how to generate word list with Crunch. All right. So Crunch is a fantastic uh, word list generator. Uh, that generates word lists based on the criteria that you pass to it. So it's a fantastic password utility that is pre-installed on Gal Linux and it's excellent for generating word lists. Okay, so in the previous section, we looked at how to use word lists for brute force, uh, essentially for brute force attacks, but we did not look at how to create one and how they're used. In this case, I'm going to be showing you how to create your own word list with Crunch. All right, so as I said, Crunch comes pre-installed and pre-configured on Gal Linux, which is awesome. All right, now before we get started, I just want to show you guys something that, uh, you know, that is really, really important for you to understand. And that is, uh, if you go uh, into your file directory, and uh, the point here is that Kali Linux already comes with some pre-configured or already comes with uh, some word lists uh, that you can use by default. Now, these word lists can be found in other locations. Uh, go, go to your computer and you go to user and you go into your share. 
and you just want to scroll all the way down or you can use your search menu here and just type in word lists all right so once you get that just open it up and as you can see you have your word list right in here that come pre-installed or that come with Cal Linux and the great thing about these ones is they are very very powerful and they are based on different types of attacks so for example you have your SQL map word list you have your nmap word list you have one of the most popular word lists in the world which is the rock you word list and uh, you know so on and so forth so these come really in handy when specifying uh, a word list especially if you do not want to generate your own this is a great starting point all right so you just select the working directory which is user share and word lists all right so let's get back to crunch and let's look at how we can uh, create our own word list all right so the first thing you need to make sure that you're working in the directory in which you want to store your word lists in all right so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to change my directory to my desktop so i'm going to change my directory to my desktop and now in here i'm going to create a folder uh, i'm just going to call it word lists all right so make directory word lists and i'm going to change my directory into that folder because that's where i want to store all my word lists so i'm going to hit enter and we can clear and now we can get started with crunch all right, so crunch is very, very simple to understand and it's very, very easy to start generating your own word lists depending on the parameters that you want to pass. Okay, so let's look at how to use it. So the syntax is very simple. You obviously start off with the, the crunch, all right, the crunch command. And you can also look at the help menu if you ever feel lost. All right, so as you can see, the usage is pretty much uh, given here. So you have crunch, the minimum and maximum value, and then you select your options. All right, so I'll explain to you what this means. So if we just clear this and we get started. So let's say, for example, we want to generate a word list that contains words uh, with uh, three or more letters, but the letters should not be less than three and not be more than something like uh, five. All right, so what would we do? You would say the minimum amount of letters to generate or work with in terms of the words to create is three. We then select the maximum amount. So the maximum should be... Um, let's see five okay so the minimum and maximum is specified now now we need to select the character set that you want to specify so a character set is pretty much self-explanatory it is the characters that you want to specify to be used in this word list okay so for example we can say a b c d e f g and only specify a b c till the a to g essentially and then we can also specify numbers so we can say one two three four five six seven eight all right so it will only use this character set to generate a word list now by default it's really not something that you would be looking at but it comes really in specialized situations when you want to generate word lists for uh, more specific types of cracking or approaches all right we're going to create this one and i'll show you the correct way of creating one or the way that i use to generate word lists Okay, so this is what the syntax is so far. So we have specified crunch, we have specified the minimum uh, amount of letters, and we have specified the maximum amount of letters. So we know that all the words in the word list will be more than three letters, but less than five letters. Excellent. We've then selected our character set, which is or the, the characters that the word list will be based off. So it's only going to use A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. All right, now you might be asking, well, how do we output this into a word list? Well, what we do is we use the O command, which specifies an output, and then we just type in the name of the word list that we want to give. So I'm just going to call this word list one dot txt all right the extension is very important you can use a dot lst extension all right which is also good or you can use a dot txt extension which is also going to work perfectly all right so i'm just going to hit enter and as you can see the crunch will now generate uh, the following amount of data and it'll give you the size or the amount of data in terms of the word list that is going to generate and as you can see I took only about four megabytes that's because this word list is relatively small because of the character set that we've provided remember if you do not specify a character set which is what we'll be looking at it's going to generate a, a word list that contains all characters okay so you can expect the size to be quite large as you can see the units specified here you have gigabyte terabyte and petabyte so you know things can get really really big and it's very very important to understand that Okay, so let us look at the word list file now. If I just go into my word list folder and I look at the word list one.txt, if I just open that up, you can see it's going to take a while to open up. And there you are. So you have characters uh, you, with the character set that we have letters with the character set and the words that have been generated. So you can see some three letter words. If we scroll all the way down, you have your four letter words, five and so on and so forth and it continues all the way down using all the character sets and the combinations that are possible now you can see that this word list is extremely large and uh, you know likely so it is a very very powerful word list in its own way okay 
So that is how to generate a word list in proper theory. So now let's look at how to create a word list that is actually quite powerful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say crunch again. Let me just clear the terminal. So I'm going to hit crunch. Okay, crunch. Now I'll specify the same amount of the same range. So I'll specify the minimum of three and a maximum of six. This is uh, usually about a good range to work with, especially when you're trying to crack, uh, you know, services like SSH, uh, you know, your telnet port, etc., etc. Now, uh, I would not uh, specify any character set. That's because I wanted to use the entire character set and therefore it is it becomes even more powerful because the amount of combinations have increased and therefore there is a higher chance of you actually getting the password that you're looking for. So now all I have to do is I just have to output the word list. All right, so I'm just going to call it word list 2.txt and uh, once I hit enter, it's going to output this word list. So I'm going to hit enter and as you can see, this one is slightly larger, significantly larger. It's two gigabytes bytes all right so now it's going to generate uh the following number of lines as you can see it's going to tell you and of course because of uh, the the size of it it's going to take quite a while so as you can see crunch eight percent completed generating output so this is a really 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 huge word list now something else i want to explain is you can generate word lists using crunch all right so it's a fantastic a password utility to generate word lists. Now, most of the powerful word lists that you'll find online and more specifically word lists like uh, the ones that Kali Linux already comes with, which you can find in the user and you can find it in share. And if I just search for it here, I want to explain a few things while Crunch is generating that large word list file. All right. So let me just uh, open that up. Now, the thing with these word lists, uh, more specifically the Rock U word list is it contains uh, leaked or stolen credentials, actual, you know, passwords. It actually contains passwords that were leaked or stolen from a website and then were, were released to the public. So this is why these word lists are considered much more powerful because they actually contain real password combinations that are likely to get you into a system. Now, by default, using something like crunch is like shooting in the dark. That's because you might be able to crack a login or, you know, for some reason, if the word list was not good enough or did not contain the correct character set, you might end up with a failed exploit or a brute force attack. Okay, so we, we looked at performing a brute force attack in the previous section when we were using Metasploit and obviously in the WordPress section where we are trying to brute force the login of the WordPress site, you saw that when using a word list, it does work if you have a fantastic character set. Now, by default, this word list that we're generating with Crunch, as you can see, is quite large, more specifically two gigabytes, uh, but it is quite powerful in the sense that you are likely to crack services like uh, the SSH or Telnet, uh, you know, really, really basic types of services. All right. So, the word list is generated and now we can just open up our folder and the word list 2.txt. Now this uh, obviously depending uh, on its size will take quite a while to open up with my text editor. Uh, and there you are. So now as you can see, it is still calculating the amount of lines that it contains, which just proves to you how large this word list is. Okay, so even if we scroll all the way down, you can see the number of combinations that you can find here. And we've not even hit the ones that have numbers or contain characters. So that was how to generate a word list with Crunch. It is a fantastic password utility and it's always good to know how to generate your own word lists with your specific uh, character sets or user preferences. All right, so that's going to be it for this video. In the next video, we'll be looking at cracking with John the Ripper. All right, so I'll be seeing you in the next video. Hello everyone and welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to be looking at password cracking with John the Ripper. All right, so you might be asking yourself, well, what exactly is John the Ripper? Well, John the Ripper is a fast and feature rich password cracking utility that is designed to work on many, many different and uh, different systems. All right, so it's a really, really powerful tool. Now, uh, in this video, what we're going to be focusing on is we're going to be focusing on cracking Linux passwords. All right. So the Linux users uh, passwords, and then we'll be looking at cracking uh, encrypted zip and RAR files. All right. So some really, really interesting stuff in this video. Uh, now, as I said, John the Ripper is a extremely powerful tool. But one thing I just want to point out is when cracking for passwords, depending on the complexity of the password, it can take quite a while. Now, to be honest, if you're cracking a zip file or a RAR file with a password that is more than eight letters long or has more than eight characters, it will take quite a while. I just want to throw that out as a warning or as a precaution. All right, because password cracking takes a while. That's essentially what I want to just put across to you. All right. But uh, having said that, let's get started. 
Uh, so what we're going to be doing first is obviously we're going to be cracking the Linux passwords and more specifically we're going to be cracking the Cal Linux user passwords. But you might be thinking to yourself, well, uh, how do I even add users to Cal Linux? It's really very simple. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to add users to Cal Linux and I'm going to show you how to crack the passwords. Uh, so by default on uh, Linux, uh, the passwords are stored in the etc and the shadow file. All right. So they are stored in the etc directory in a file called the shadow file. Now by default, you have to crack this file and the hashes to get the passwords. All right. So this file contains the hashes and then John the Ripper, uh, it essentially cracks the hashes to get the passwords. All right. So that is the process that is going on here. All right. So let's get started. Now, as I said, by default, if we just open up the terminal here, it's very, very important that we understand the process. So what we're going to do first is we're going to create a user. So you might be asking, well, how can we do that? Uh, and how do we do it really, really simply? Well, to do this, we use the command user add, all right? So user add, and uh, we're going to be creating our own user. Now we use the M command to add the username because we want to go through this really, really quickly. And the username will just create a random user. Let's say, uh, let's say Alex, all right? A username called Alex or a user called Alex. And now we need to specify the password. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say a uh, password pass uh, WD. All right. And uh, we're going to specify the password uh, for the user Alex. All right. So password Alex. And once we hit enter, it's going to ask us to enter a new Unix password for the uh, username Alex. So let's just create a very, very simple password because uh, again, uh, to understand the cracking process, as I said, it's going to take a while if you enter a complex password. But for the sake of me demonstrating the cracking process, let's go with a simple password like uh, 123456. All right. I'm going to hit enter and I'm going to retype it. 123456. I'm going to hit enter. All right. So the password has been updated successfully. Excellent. So we've added a user. Now, how do we get to the cracking process? All right. So let me just expand my terminal slightly here so we have a great idea of what's going on. So as I said, uh, we're going to be using John. Now, uh, the hashes for the passwords of the users on Linux are stored in the, the shadow file, which is in the etc directory. By default, you can easily crack this with John. And you can do that by going into John. And now we select the directory of the file, which is etc and the shadow file. All right. So we're just going to hit shadow. And once we hit enter, it's going to start the, the password, uh, the hash cracking process, and then it'll give you the password. All right. Now let me explain what has happened here. Okay. So at first it's going to start the hash uh, cracking process. So what is going to tell you here by default, if this is the first time you've run this, it's not going to give you this result here. Now I have uh, about three users on this computer and I've cracked their password hashes. So as you can see, loaded three password hashes with three different salts. All right. So what this is saying is uh, you have already cracked these password hashes and you know the passwords. So we are not going to crack them again because it's a waste of time. OK, so uh, it saw that one user, which we have just recently added, Alex, has a password hash and it's not cracked it. So let's crack this password hash and it did crack it. And as you can see, it got the password as one, two, three, four, five, six, and it gave you the username as Alex. Fantastic. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, how do we know this is actually working? And how do we know what you've just told us is the truth theoretically? Well, we're going to add a new user. All right. So we're going to say user add. And this time we'll give another name. Uh, let's see something really, really like Trevor. All right. We're going to just add a user called Trevor and we're going to add a password. Let's see. Uh, this time we're just going to use a simple alphabet. So A, B, C, D. All right. So we're going to specify the user and now it's going to ask us to enter a new Unix password. So we'll just say A, B, C, D. All right. A, B, C, D, E. Let's make it a bit complex. And again, we'll enter the password is A, B, C, D, E. All right. Now you can see that I'm going with sequences. And that's because, as I said, uh, depending on the complexity of the password, it will take a while. Now, believe me, I've, you know, I've cracked passwords before. Uh, and uh, one of the examples I can give you is at one point I had to crack a password for an administrator on his computer because he had forgotten his password and, you know, it was the administrator account. So uh, essentially what needed to be done was to crack the password. And, you know, the cracking process is, was fairly simple as I'm showing you right now with John. You know, everything I'm showing you is how I used it in the real world. Uh, so essentially what happened was the password was about uh, 10 characters or letters long and it was a combination of letters, the alphabet, characters and numbers and it took about 8 hours to crack. So you can see that yes, it will take quite a while uh, if the password uh, complexity is very, very high. 
So let's try and crack the Trevor password. Now, as I said, we've already cracked uh, the password hash that belongs to Alex, the user account Alex. So you will see that it will not do it again because we've already cracked the password hash. So uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to say John again, John ETC and shadow. All right. So once we hit enter, as you can see, it's going to start, it's going to say that loaded four password hashes with four different salts. So that means yes, those password hashes were cracked. And as you can see, it's going to crack the password hash that belongs to Trevor, which in this case is ABCDE. Fantastic. And that is how to crack Linux passwords. Excellent. So that was something that, you know, is very, very important that you understand how to do. Now, you might be asking yourself if you did follow along with me, I've created these users, but how do I get rid of them? Well, I'm just going to show you a quick tip to get rid of users. You use the user delete command. So user delete and we select uh, the R command and we select the username. In this case, we're going to start off with Alex and we're going to hit enter and it's going to get rid of Alex. The next user we're going to get rid of is the Trevor. All right. So Trevor, when you say user Dell, there we are. Fantastic. So that was how to crack Linux passwords. Now it's time to move on to cracking uh, encrypted zip and RAR files. Okay, so this zip file right here on my desktop is an example of this. So if I try and extract it here, so I'm just going to say extract here, and I'm just going to say extract to my desktop, and I'm going to hit extract, you will see that it requires a password. Now, the truth of the matter is I don't even remember what the password is. So it'll be really, really interesting to see how we can crack this. So I'm just going to close this up and uh, we can get to using John to crack uh, this file. Now, by default, uh, if I just open up my terminal, the most important thing you need to understand here is we need to crack the password hash. All right. So the first thing we need to do in this case is we need to get the password hash. How do we do this? Well, we need to get the password hash from the zip file. And the way we do this is from a utility that is pre-configured with John. And that is the zip to John. Now, that is the utility that we're going to be using. Uh, many people make this mistake of using the same uh, utility when they are cracking RAR files, all right? If you're cracking a RAR file, all you have to do is just change the zip to RAR, all right? So RAR to John, and uh, you carry on from there. So that is the utility we're going to be using. In this case, we are using a zip file. So we're going to say uh, zip to John, all right? And now essentially what we're doing here is we're saying we need the password hash. So you're using zip to John to get the password hash for John. And once you have the password hash, you can then use John to crack the password hash and get the password for the zip file. OK, so this can be done by using zip to John. And now we select the encrypted file, which in this case is test.zip. Now, one thing you've noticed is that this file is on my desktop. So I have to change my directory to my desktop. All right. So change directory desktop and I'm going to clear that up and we're going to get started. So zip to John, we select the file that we want to get the hash from which in this case is test.zip. And now if I hit enter, you can see you will get the hash file right here. All right. So don't worry if it gives you this little error here. It's going to give you the hash file from here uh, all the way from here to the end here. Hash files usually start with the dollar sign and end with the dollar sign. But the thing about this, even if you copy it, this is not a very, very convenient way of storing your password hashes. So the ideal thing to do is to actually uh, export your hash file into a TXT file. So that can be done really simply by going to zip, zip to John. All right, zip to John and we specify the file. So test.zip and now we're going to say export and to export we use the greater than sign. And now we essentially select uh, the file that we want to export it to. So we're just going to call it zip dump. All right, zip dump .txt. It's very important that you give a uh, you give an extension. In this case, we're saving it to a txt file. So once I hit enter, it's going to create a, a zip dump .txt file that contains the password hash. As you can see, it belongs there. It exists in there. So now we can actually get started with John to crack this zip file uh, because we already have the password hash. So to do that, we use the John command. And now the syntax is very simple. Now we just have to specify the file format. OK, and after we specify the file format, we then specify uh, the hash, the password hash, or you can specify the file that contains the password hash, which in this case we have. All right. So now, as I said, we're going to start off with John. So just type in John. And now we specify the format. So we use a double dash to select format. And the format is going to be equal to zip, all right? Because the file format is zip. If yours is a RAR file, you can change that to RAR. And now you specify uh, the hash, or which you can paste directly, or you can just use uh, the file that contains the hash. So in this case, it is going to be zip dump. So once you have selected the file, just hit enter. And the password hash cracking process is going to begin and voila, it is completed. So as you can see, it's going to load the password hash and it's going to start the cracking process. 
And uh, by default, the password was 1234, which was relatively simple. As I said, I do not want to make this really, really complex because the time to crack the passwords will, will be much longer. So we have successfully got the password and the hash was cracked. Excellent. So now we can try and see if we can extract the file. So I'm just going to go to the zip file and I'm going to hit extract here. And I'm going to say extract to my desktop. I'm going to hit extract and we're going to enter the password 1234. I'm going to hit OK and it should have extracted. Uh, there we are extraction completed successfully. I'm going to close that up and I'm going to open up the file that we just uh, extracted. And as you can see, it had some random files that I just uh, compressed together. So that was how to use John the Ripper to crack Linux passwords and to crack a uh, zip or RAR files. The process is still the same. In the next video, we'll be looking at password cracking with Hydra. All right, so I'll be seeing you in the next video. Hello everyone and welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to be looking at password cracking with Hydra. All right, so you might be asking yourself, well, what exactly is Hydra? Well, Hydra is a fantastic login cracker and password cracking tool. All right now, the great thing is about Hydra is it allows uh, you to run cracks uh, in parallel. All right, so it allows you to perform the cracking of, you know, logins uh, or, you know, password cracking in parallel. This means that you can perform a various number or a large number of attempts every minute. And the great thing is that you can control these attempts with Hydra. So Hydra is a fantastic tool for cracking login protocols, etc., etc. Now, in this video, what we're going to be doing or what I'm going to be showing you is how to crack the SSH port on Metasploitable 2. All right. So this time we're looking at how to crack an actual port here, login port. As you know, the secure shell does require a username and password combination. Uh, and in this case, we're going to, I'm going to be showing you how to crack it. We're going to be showing you how to crack it with Hydra. Now, uh, again, make sure the prerequisite for this video is that you have to have Metasploitable 2 up and running, or in fact, you do not need it. You can have any Linux distribution running or, uh, you know, a Mac operating system because I'm not sure if Windows allows SSH connections to it rather than from it. So I would recommend that you have a Linux distribution available or, uh, you know, my opinion is to use Metasploitable because it will be much better in understanding how the process is performed. Now, one thing I do have to point out is cracking this password is going to take upwards and upwards of four hours. I'm simply going to be showing you the process of doing it. All right, the results will be the same if you're using Metasploitable and the time uh, for cracking will vary about two to four hours. I've done this before on Metasploitable 2 and it took about two hours and sometimes uh, depending on my internet connection and the computer I was using, it took about four hours, all right? So that is something I just want to throw out there. As I've said with password cracking, it will take quite a while depending on the complexity of the password. In this case, the cracking process is quite complex, so it's gonna take quite a while. Okay, so let's get started with Hydra, all right? So you might be asking, well, how do we get, where is Hydra? All right, so Hydra can be found if you just open up your terminal and you just type in high case. The cracking process going through this way is because I want to explain the commands, okay? The commands or the arguments as they were or the syntax is very, very important to understand if you want to really, really utilize this tool to its best ability or to its maximum potential. All right, so if you use the Hydra, you just type in Hydra, it's going to give you the help menu here. All right, now looking at the commands here, uh, essentially what the, the main thing that we'll be using is the L command, which allows us to log in. In this case, we are going to be logging in uh, or we are attempting to log in into the SSH port. All right, the next command we're going to be using is the file command. All right, the file command uh, is going to allow us to select a word list, which in this case, we will be using a word list. I'll be explaining very, very soon what word list we're going to be using. Uh, we will then be using the password file, which I've uh, already sh shown you. We'll be using a word list, so don't worry about that. Uh, we'll be using the SSH uh, service, which they do not mention here. Uh, but in all reality, we'll be just selecting a word list file. And um, furthermore, we'll just select our IP address and we will run the attack on that. Okay, so it's very, very important to go through this to understand what's going on. So by default, if you look at the example given here, ours is going to be pretty much very, very simple here with a few minor changes. Now, since we are going to be targeting the Metasploitable 2 virtual machine, we are going to need the local IP address for that. So we're just going to perform, uh, just go in here and I've already uh, typed in the ifconfig command and we know that the local IP address is 192.168.1.102. All right. So we know that the SSH port is running on port 22 uh, and that is very, very important to understand. So we're just going to clear this and we're going to get started with uh, using Hydra. 
All right, so uh, by default, we're going to be using the default word lists that uh, Cal Linux comes with. More specifically, we already looked at where the, they lie in terms of their directory, user share, word lists. All right, so word lists, uh, and if we hit enter and we list the word lists that are found here. We can see that these are the word lists that come with Cal Linux. The one we're going to be using is the SQL map. Uh, txt. All right, that is the most effective for this login cracking. All right, so we can just go back and we can get started. So the syntax is going to be very, very simple. We're going to type in Hydra and we're then going to select the username or login. So Hydra and we're going to select the L command, which means we're logging in. And then we're going to select the username, which in this case is root. The username is always going to be root. And uh, by default, once we've selected the username, we can then move on to select the word list. In this case, we specify the word list location. If you have created your own word list, as we saw in the earlier video with crunch, you can just go to user, user share uh, word lists. And we select the SQL map.txt. So that is the word list that we're going to be using. Uh, and now we need to select the local IP address. So we're going to say 192.168.1.102, I believe. That was the local IP address. There we are. So it is 192.168.1.102. Uh, and now finally, we need to select uh, the service that we are trying to target, which in this case is SSH. So I'm just going to hit enter. And once we hit enter, it's going to start the login cracking process. And as I said, this is going to take upwards of four hours. So the main thing I wanted to show you in this video is the cracking process and how you can use Hydra to crack logins. All right. Now, by default, you can also try this on services like FTP, Telnet, etc., etc. All right. Anything that has a login prompt, you can use Hydra on. All right. So I'm just going to type in enter. Oops. For some reason, we are getting an error here unknown service uh, giving us an error uh, saying the unknown that the IP address uh, is unknown service. Sorry about that. Uh, let me just see what the error could be. Uh, sorry about that. Yes, my bad. We actually forgot to specify that we're using a password or a word list. And that can be done by using the P command just before you, you specify the location for the word list. All right. So sorry about that. That was my mistake. So essentially, we're saying Hydra login. All right, we're using the L command to log in. We're using the username root, which is the default username. So essentially what we're cracking is the password. Okay, we're then going to select a, we are saying we want to use this word list here, which is uh, the default word list found on Kali Linux that can be found in user share word list. And furthermore, the uh, word list that we're going to be using is the SQL map.txt uh, file. And then you select the IP address uh, for your target and the protocol or the service in which you are trying to uh, perform the, this login attempt on. Furthermore, the login cracking process. All right, so I'm going to hit enter and now it should work. All right, there, fantastic. So the cracking process has begun. Now, uh, for some reason, we are getting a previous session found here. This is probably because I was I actually ran this before. All right, so as you can see, it's going to start attack the attacking process, and this will be denoted by the data section here. All right, so the data section will just give you data about the attack, and you'll be looking. Uh, it'll now give you another option here with the name status, which is going to show you the status of the attacking process in terms of the amount of tries that were run. And again, as I said, by all means necessary, uh, it's going to take quite a while. So uh, I've already run this before, and I can guarantee you that if you're using Metasploitable 2, the results will pretty much be the same. Uh, the password cracking process will actually take quite a while. So um, in, I'm just going to stop the video here because as I said, the process is just the same and the cracking results will be uh, exactly the same. Now, if you're trying to run this on another target or server, depending on the complexity of the password and the word list that you're using, it can take longer or it can take a, a much shorter amount of time. All right. So it's really up to you. So as you can see, the first status alert has come here and it has already tried 1,375 tries. And there you go. All right, so uh, that is how to use a Hydra for password cracking, more specifically how to use a Hydra for cracking the SSH port. And yeah, that's going to be it for this video. In the next video, we'll be looking at password cracking with Medusa. So I'll be seeing you in the next video. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to be looking at password cracking with Medusa. Now, you might be asking yourself, what exactly is Medusa? Well, Medusa really simply is a very, very similar tool to Hydra. It is lightweight and powerful. Now that's one of the things I like about Medusa is it's it's much more of a cleaner login cracker or password cracker. All right. So the thing I like about it is it's multi-threaded, which allows you to, you know, scan multiple hosts at one time. 
Now, the great thing about this is it works on many, many services. For example, uh, FTP, HTTP, MySQL, Telnet, uh, you have your SMBNT, you know, multiple services that are awesome if you're trying to crack them. Now, uh, in this video, we're going to be trying to crack the SSH port. Now, in the previous video, when we were using Hydra, I showed you how it's done the correct way. Now, uh, in order to show you that, uh, you know, tools like Hydra and Medusa work, in this video, I'm going to actually create a word list that contains the login credentials for the SSH port. Now, why am I doing this? Uh, the reason I'm doing this is I'm going to show you that indeed it can actually crack these passwords. Okay, so Medusa, as I said, is a really, really simple tool to use. It may have a lot of commands that you need to specify, but in the long run, I would prefer to use Medusa over Hydra. Now, Hydra is great for cracking, uh, you know, online portals and stuff like that. For example, if you integrate it with Burp Suite, etc., etc. But for services like FTP, uh, Telnet, MySQL, SSH, it is a fantastic tool as well. All right, so uh, let's get started with Medusa. Now, by default, it is uh, pre-installed on Cali Linux, uh, and uh, you can just launch it by typing in Medusa. All right, so Medusa, and once you type it in, you can see that we have uh, the help menu here that contains all the commands that we're going to be using. Now, by default, the commands that we're going to be using is the H. All right, this allows us to select our target host name or IP address. The next command we'll be using is we're going to specify the username, which, as I said, is root or MSF admin. All right, so once you crack the SSH service with Hydra, you'll find that the username and the password are both MSF admin. Okay, now, so sorry for telling you that, but it is very, very important for me to show you how Medusa works. Okay, so uh, these are probably the commands you'll be using the most. So we're going to be using the H, which allows us to select our target host name or IP address, or you can actually use a file that contains target host name. So if you have just come straight from the information gathering section of the course, and you gathered uh, your hosts or you added your hosts in a text document, you can scan multiple hosts, all right? So that's what I really, really enjoy here. You then have the username to test against, which we'll be using. You have the file containing usernames. Again, awesome that we have that option. You have the passwords to test, the file containing the passwords. Uh, you have your file containing combo entries, which is also quite powerful to use. Uh, the other command that we'll be using is the C command, which allows you, again, combo attacks. You then have your module, which allows you to select the module. Now, the module essentially uh, means the service or the port that you're trying to perform the attack on. So getting now to performing the attack on the SSH port on a Metasploitable 2 virtual machine, again, we just need to get the local IP address, which is the same as the previous video, 192.168. 0.1.102. Alright, so the cracking process is slightly different now because you have to specify a few things. So before we get to the actual cracking process, as I said, instead of using the word list that comes with Kali Linux, I've created my simple word list here that contains the credentials, alright? So it explicitly contains the credentials. Now this may not seem like a word list because it does contain the exact credentials. This will be more of a dictionary attack. But in reality, it is going to use the same technology behind using a word list where it's going to test against every combination, okay? So uh, by default, the username for the SSH port is MSF admin and the password is also MSF admin. I've just thrown uh, the rest of these uh, just to make it, you know, more authentic. Okay, so that is going to be stored on my desktop. So let's get started with the attack process. All right, so to launch it, we use Medusa. Now we select our host, which is H, and that is the local IP address of the Metasploitable 2 virtual machine, which is 192.168.1.102. All right, that is the IP address, as simple as that. Now we need to select the username, which in this case, the username we're testing for against is MSF admin, like so. That is the username that we're going to be using. Now we need to select the password file, all right? And that will be specified by using the capital P command as we look at in the help menu. And now we select the directory, which in this case is on my desktop, root desktop. Now, by the way, you can use the word list that come uh, already with Cal Linux, or you can create your own if that's what you're looking for. Now, by default, I already told you I know the credentials, so it's not really a cracking process. But if you are performing this on a real target or on a real server or you're performing penetration testing, I would recommend that you use the word list that come with Cal Linux. For example, the Rocky word list or the SQL map. All right. So in this case, we're just going to be using the one I created just to show you that the cracking process does work. All right. But it's going to go through it as a word list. All right. It's not going to use a dictionary attack. So root desktop, and we're going to select the name of the word list, which is uh, custom wordlist.txt. 
All right, and now we need to specify the module, which can be done by using the M. So the module is SSH, and now we specify the N command, which allows us to select the port, which in this case is port 22. That is the default port for all SSH connections. All right, so once we're done, let me just go through the command or, or the entire sequence here. So what we're saying is we are saying Medusa. So start up Medusa, initialize Medusa. Uh, we then use the H command to specify our host. Now, if you use a capital H command, you can specify a list of hosts uh, that you have saved in a TXT file. You then have your U command, which selects your username, the username you have to try against. You then have your P command that selects the word list uh, or the password or the list that contains the passwords that you want to test for against. Now you can also select a password that you want to test against and that you would use the lowercase p. You then select the module that you're going to be using, which in this case is SSH. You then have uh, the port that you're going to be using, which is port 22, which is the SSH port. All right, and once we're done, we can just hit enter and it should start the cracking process. There we are, just give it a few seconds. Now, as I said, it's going to go through it as a brute force and it's going to use it as a word list attack. And as you can see, by default, it went through all of them, the combinations that it could go through. And uh, there we are, username is MSF admin and the password is MSF admin. All right, so that was how to use Medusa for password cracking. More specifically, we were cracking the SSH service. And as you can see, we got the default username and password, uh, which is fantastic. All right, that is going to be a wrap for section six, where we looked at password cracking. Now let's look at a summary of what we learned in this section. All right, so the first thing we looked at was how to generate custom word lists with Crunch. And we also learned the default directory for the word lists that already come with Kali Linux, which are already powerful as they are. All right, we then moved on uh, to password cracking with John the Ripper, where we looked at uh, cracking Linux passwords. And then we moved on to cracking uh, archived passwords uh, or encrypted file passwords like uh, a zip file or a RAR file. All right, we then moved on to password cracking with Hydra, where we looked at cracking uh, at the SSH login on Metasploitable 2. And finally, we moved on to password cracking with Medusa, where we also looked at how to crack the SSH uh, port login with, again, port login. This time, we used a custom word list and a uh, default username uh, to achieve the cracking process. All right, so that is going to be it for this section. In the next section, we'll be looking at network sniffing and spoofing. So I'll see you in the next section. Hello everyone and welcome to section seven where we're gonna be looking at network sniffing and spoofing. So let us look at what we're gonna be learning in this section. All right, so we'll start off with network discovery. So in this uh, video, we're gonna be looking at how to discover devices connected to our network with a tool called NetDiscover. All right, we'll then get started with the network sniffing process where I'll be explaining the fundamentals of sniffing and we'll get started with a network sniffing tool called TCP dump. We'll then move on to the second part of network sniffing where we'll be using Wireshark, which I'm sure probably most of you have already heard of, which is a fantastic network sniffing and packet uh, capturing tool or program. All right. We'll then move on to spoofing, more specifically ARP spoofing, where we'll be looking at the ARP spoofing process and how we can do it using a tool called ARP spoof. All right. To achieve a man in the middle uh, position. We'll then finish off with looking at uh, how to actually use the ARP poisoning attack method to get man in the middle access with a tool called Etacap. All right, so that is what we're gonna be looking at in this section. So let's get started. In this video, we're gonna get started with network discovery with NetDiscover. All right, so this is a really, really important stage, especially when it comes down to network sniffing and spoofing. So uh, essentially what we're gonna be doing in this video is we're going to be uh, discovering the devices connected to our network. Now we looked at this very basically with Nmap where we could find out what devices were connected to our network and we could scan uh, for an entire range, all right, on our network. Now, as I said, we're going to be performing sniffing and spoofing attacks on our local layer network. So a net discover is a fantastic tool that will discover the devices connected to the network that you are connected to. All right, so uh, let's get started. Now by default, uh, net discover is already pre-installed and pre-configured with Kali Linux, which is awesome, okay? So it's really, really very simple to get launched. Uh, so just open up your terminal and you can just type in net discover. Now, before we get started, I'm going to use the help menu because I want to explain some of the commands that are the most popular and what they all mean. All right, so I'm going to hit enter. And as you can see, it's going to give you this wonderful help menu. Fantastic. Now, let's look at some of the commands that we're going to be using. 
one of the most important commands that you'll be coming across is the i command the i command allows you to specify the network interface or the network device that you want to use to perform the scan what do i mean if you have a wireless uh, adapter for example a, an adapter that allows packet injection you can specify that if you're using ethernet like what we were using and the, probably what you'll be using if uh, you're using a virtual machine you will then specify that you want to use uh, the ethernet zero interface or if you're using a Wi-Fi adapter, you can specify the WLAN zero interface. Now, uh, you might be a bit confused and you might be asking, well, how do I know what I'm using? Well, all you have to do is just open up a new terminal and type in ifconfig. All right. So uh, as you can see, this is our current interface. And as you can see, it's going to be labeled as Ethernet zero. That is the standard for all Ethernet connections, uh, especially on Linux distributions. So by default, we're using an Ethernet connection. So if I go to my interface here, and as you can see, I'm using a wired connection. Uh, so by default, on any virtual machine, uh, the default connection will be an Ethernet connection. So if you're using a wireless adapter, it will give you the interface name as WLAN0. Okay, so you then specify it from there. All right, so we'll be looking at that with NetDiscover. Now, moving on in terms of the commands, you then have the R command that allows you to specify a range of a network. So, for example, if we wanted to specify a range of only a certain amount of devices on our network or a range of IP addresses on our network, we can do that. We'll be looking at that as well. You then have your file command, which is not that important, but it allows you to scan a list of ranges that is contained into a given file. So, if you add a list of ranges in a text document, you can specify that text document to be scanned. Uh, using the L command. Uh, as for passive mode, this is again not very important. As you can see, this option is saying do not send anything, only sniffing. So essentially what this means is it's not going to send any type of protocol or any type of request to any device on the network to get more information about them. I'll be explaining this in a few seconds. All right. You can then specify a file with the M command that contains a known max. Now, in this case, if you do not not familiar with what a Mac means, Mac is essentially the media access control uh, protocol that uh, essentially whose purpose is uh, if you might be asking the media access control address is a unique identifier that uh, essentially maps the device on the network and uh, it acts as, as an identifier of a device on a network what do i mean so for example a mobile device could have a mac address and that mac address uniquely identifies it on the network all right so that the router or your portal or your gateway knows who it's communicating with so let's say your phone on your network sends a request to the router for a web page now your phone sends a request to the router the router receives the request from a mac address all right so now it, it knows that that mac address came from what ip address so it resolves uh, the the device on the network and then once it receives the web page it sends it to that mac address uh, and therefore it knows that device that mac address belongs to that device okay so it's very important to understand that so if you add a list of known macs you can also use that uh, as for the other commands, these are something that, that are not really touched in most cases, especially uh, in my case, since I've worked in a network administration uh, job before. Uh, some of the most common ones are the ones I've just specified. So let's get started with some basic network discovery. All right. So main principle or aim here is to discover the devices connected to our network. Now, as I said, to get started, all you have to do is just type in net discover. All right. So net discover. Now we need to specify the interface that we're using to perform the scan. In this case, we're using the uh, I command and then we specify the interface name, which in our case is Ethernet zero. All right. And uh, if I hit enter, let's just perform this basic scan. What's going to happen is going to scan our entire network uh, for devices connected to the network with the Ethernet zero adapter. So I'm going to hit enter and the scanning process has begun and uh, just give it a few seconds. And there we are. So we have devices that are discovered. Now let's look at the information that is being displayed to us. So as you can see, it, it is going to be currently scanning and it will uh, continue scanning until you stop it or you halt the, the scanning process. And you can do that with the control plus C command on your computer. All right. So as you can see, it's going to tell you here that four captured ARP requests packets uh, from four hosts. All right. So if you're not familiar with what ARP is, ARP is the address resolution protocol. All right. So it is essentially an Internet protocol whose purpose is to map the IP addresses to the machine addresses. All right. So essentially what's happening here is you're receiving and sending ARP requests to these devices and they're uniquely identifying themselves or they're identifying themselves. Uh, as I said, it's using the ARP protocol. 
Okay, so the information being sorted out here is given in forms of the IP address, which in this case is the local IP, very, very important information. You then have your MAC address, which gives you the MAC address, again, vitally important information. You have your MAC vendor and host names given right here. Okay, so essentially, these are the names of the devices connected to your network. For more information, you can see that, uh, for example, here at the IP address, which is my default gateway, the 192.168.1.1 that is my router as you can see it is running tp link so that is vital information that uh, you know if gathered can give you insight into how devices are arranged or what devices actually connected to the network and how they are configured with each other all right so uh, again you can see that i have uh, other devices like for example this is my windows workstation uh, right here and this is the current uh, windows computer uh, and more specifically the Kali Linux computer that i'm currently using now, you might be asking, uh, well, how do we scan for a range of addresses? Now, that is the next thing we're going to be doing. All right, so we're just going to cancel. We're going to stop this scanning process by hitting Control plus C, and we open up the net discover command again. Now, to specify a range, if we just open up the help menu again, we can see that the option to specify a range is the R command. So let us do that right now. All right, so we're going to hit clear, and we're going to type in net discover. We specify our interface. It is vitally important that you always specify the interface you're using because you can choose to use a Wi-Fi adapter for your scanning, which will also discover other Wi-Fi uh, devices connected. All right. So a net discover I, which is Ethernet zero. We have selected our interface. Now we select the range. All right. So in this case, I'm going to scan my subnet that which is where my virtual lab is hosted. So in this case, you would find my Cali Linux virtual machine. And if I had any other virtual machine running, like for example, my Windows 7 virtual machine, we would also be able to discover it here. You'll also see that it will discover some of my mobile devices that are connected to my subnet. All right. So my subnet is 192.168.1.1. 1 slash 24 that is how you specify a subnet now your subnet may be configured uh, completely differently you, you could have configured it with a two or three or whatever you felt like in my case i have configured it this way all right so what i'm going to do now is i'm just going to hit enter and it's going to scan, scan the subnet of the ip range that i've specified so i'm going to hit enter and as you can see the scanning process has begun so just give it a few seconds and it's going to start gathering the devices that are connected to my subnet. Now, as you can see, I do not have my other router connected. I only have my default gateway, which is running on the sub subnet that I specified right here. So uh, 192.168.1.1, right? So that is correctly configured under our subnet. And uh, that is how to perform some basic network discovery with NetDiscover. It is a fantastic tool that allows you to get an understanding of what devices are currently connected to your network and what their names are, what their MAC addresses are. All right. So in the next video, we'll be looking at network sniffing with TCP dump. All right. So I'll be seeing you in the next video. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to get started with network sniffing with TCP dump. All right. Now, before we get started, it's very, very important to understand the fundamentals behind network. All right. And first and foremost, what is network sniffing? Well, network sniffing is essentially the process of monitoring data that is traveling over a network all right so you're just looking at the data that is being transferred around the network that is what network sniffing is all right so now you might be asking well what is tcp dump well tcp dump is a traffic sniffer or, an, or a network sniffing tool all right so these tools allow you to capture and monitor traffic on the network all right so that is their goal their goal is to allow you to actually capture and monitor this network traffic on your network all right and to capture packets etc etc all right, so in the previous video, we looked at some very, very essential terminology that uh, is going to come in handy, and that is the address resolution protocol and the media access control address, all right, which is the MAC address, uh, and we already looked at that. Now, TCP dump is a very, very powerful packet uh, capturing utility, all right? So it allows you to monitor any type of traffic, whether live or pre-captured. What do I mean by live or pre-captured? Live traffic means ca capturing it in real time. And you can also uh, monitor pre-captured traffic that was stored in a PCAP file. All right. So I'm pretty sure you're already familiar with what a PCAP file, what a PCAP file is. If you've used, you know, uh, sniffing tools like Wireshark, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So TCP dump, essentially, it's going to, it is a network sniffing tool that allows us to capture uh, network packets and uh, analyze them. Well, not analyze them, but understand them. All right. So let's get started with TCP dump. Now it is already pre-installed and pre-configured with Kali Linux, so that is the best part. Okay, so we don't have to install anything else. So all you need to do is just open up your terminal and open up the TCP dump. 
Now by default there is a help menu if you want to check that out, TCP dump. But uh, most of the commands that you should be looking at, sorry, if I hit TCP dump, it'll automatically just start capturing traffic or packets that are going through the network, all right? So we've not specified anything, but as you can see, it's just capturing random traffic. And essentially what's happening here is it's just going through all the traffic that's going through the network, all right? So what we need to do is we need to close this. As I said, it does come with a help menu, so you can check that out. So TCP dump. And if we just use the help menu like so, it's going to display uh, some help options. Now you can always refer back to this, but uh, most of the important commands are usually not found here because one of the things that you have to understand about a TCP dump is the commands are set up in a sort of pseudo code. And I'll explain as we move along uh, or we move further. All right. So uh, the other important thing to understand is that uh, the most crucial thing about TCP dump, if you want to get the best uh, network sniffing uh, results is that you need to use filters. All right. So what are filters? Filters will allow you to narrow down your sniffing to, to the services that you do want to capture. So there's no point, uh, you know, capturing all the traffic that's going through a computer. Instead, you can focus on, uh, you know, specific traffic, like what traffic is going through what port and you can specify the port that you want to read the or you want to sniff the traffic or the packets from. All right. So let's get started with actually performing some uh, some network sniffing with TCP dump. All right. So the first thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at how to filter or how to scan for an individual host IP. All right. So we're going to be uh, we're actually going to be sniffing traffic off a, an IP address or a, a target uh, for this matter. So in the previous video, we looked at network discovery. So hopefully you've, you've discovered what targets that you want to perform your sniffing on. In my case, I'm going to be performing the sniffing on my Windows operating system. All right. So I already know what the IP address is. The IP address is if you can just open up your command prompt here. Let me just do that as well. The IP address is 192.168.1.104. Excellent. So what we're going to do is we're going to sniff the traffic or the uh, the packets that are flowing through this Windows operating system uh, or this Windows computer for that matter. So we're going to open up uh, TCP dump and we're just going to clear that out and we're going to say TCP dump. All right. Now, as I said, the commands are going to be very, very specific to what you're doing. So TCP dump. Now we have to specify what type of target we are using. So we, are, we can say we are using a host. All right. So the host now we specify the host IP address, which could be or which is 192.168.1.104. All right. So it, once we hit enter, it's going to start capturing the traffic that is flowing through this IP address, which is, as we know, the Windows operating system. So I'm going to hit enter. And as you can see, it is gathering all the traffic that is going through. Now, as I said, these are network sniffing tools. These tools allow you to sniff the traffic uh, that is going through a computer or through the network if you choose to do so. All right. So uh, when we'll be looking at more advanced tools like Wireshark, you can look at how to analyze them or how to actually get information from the packets of data. Uh, now, this is where, you know, hackers or black hats would go through. And this is what they would target is they would try to get credentials like emails or passwords uh, while monitoring the, the traffic, obviously finding the most important bits of the traffic that they want to uh, that they find is crucial or has sensitive information. All right. So that is how to uh, sniff traffic of a single IP address or a host for this matter. The next thing we're going to be looking at is how to scan. As I said, we are going to be looking at a lot of filters. All right. So one of the filters that we can use is specifying the ports, for example. All right. So what we're going to do is we're just going to clear this up. And uh, let's say you wanted to get only the TCP traffic. All right. How would you do something like that? What we would do is we would type in TCP dump. All right. And we would say uh, TCP. All right. So we wanted to get TCP dump at uh, TCP. That is the protocol that we are following. Now, the most important thing that you need to understand here is, as I said, uh, TCP dump uses a pseudocode uh, when generating commands. So what you have to specify now is you have to use the and command, right? So you're saying TCP and for the host, which in this case, we're going to be using the normal Windows IPs, which is 192.168.1.104. All right. So what's happening here is we're saying TCP dump. By the way, I made a small typo there. What's happening is here is we're saying, uh, all right, we're saying start up TCP dump. We then want to only get TCP traffic from the host 192.168.1.104. All right. So I'm going to hit enter. And as you can see, it's only getting the TCP traffic. Fantastic. So that is another way of filtering or, you know, really narrowing down what type of traffic that you want to sniff or what type of traffic you want to analyze. So that is fantastic. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to close this up. 
and uh, we can move on to you know using ports or using spots to specify your sniffing or the, the sniffing process all right so we're gonna say tcp dump and uh, let's see what port do we want to use um let's use port 80 which is where all the traffic goes through so port 80 and again you have to use the and which is uh, you know pseudo code and you have to specify the host now so we're going to say host 192.168.1.104 now as you can see this is getting really really interesting and it is very very user intuitive in the sense that you can understand the command and what it's doing so you're saying tcp dump we want to get only traffic uh from port 80 and from the host uh 182.168.1.104 let's hit enter there you go it's going to start getting all the traffic from port 80 now because i'm not currently doing anything on the windows operating system in terms of traffic incoming and outgoing it's not going to capture anything all right so that was how to specify that was how to specify the fact that you want to capture data you know from a certain port and we've looked at services you can always change the port that you want to capture data with and you know tcp dump is a very very extensive tool in which you can customize almost every aspect of okay so the next thing we're going to be looking at is how to output the recorded traffic into a pcap file all right so let me just close this up now this will require a lot of uh, understanding now now as i said you know traffic files or you know captured packets are stored if you want to store them they're usually stored in a pcap file you can analyze them or read or go through the traffic at a later time obviously because you've saved all the results in a file with popular tools like wireshark which uh you know offer the user a graphical user interface which as i said uh, makes the user feel more comfortable which we'll be looking at in the next video but let's look at how to actually output some of this network sniffing into a pcap file so the first thing i'm going to do is i'm just going to change my directory to my desktop so i actually save the file on the desktop and now we can get started so tcp dump now you have to actually specify the w command which means write out w and then we specify the name of the file that we want to output this stiff network or uh, packets all right so the name can be something like results right so results.pcap all right that extension is very very important now the other extension that was used in in the earlier days was the cap file but now it is the pcap file all right so uh now we need to specify obviously uh if we want to specify the sniffing process so we can say we want tcp traffic or we only want uh, you know traffic from a certain port but in this case we're not going to specify that we're just going to say and host which is 192.168.1.104 and once i hit enter it's going to or oh, for some reason we've actually got an error here all right so uh if you get this error uh that is uh, my bad the syntax is wrong i do not need the and command there all right because we are not adding any more uh, options to the scan so as you can see it's going to start it's going to start listening for the traffic. It's going to save all the results in the PCAP file that you can see here is stored on the desktop. All right. So, uh, yeah, that's how to actually export your network sniffing uh, packets or your captured packets into a PCAP file with TCP dump. All right. So if we just close this up, um, and as you can see, the icon is a Wireshark icon. So if I double click on it, it'll probably not open because you have to actually open it up with Wireshark. All right, so there we are. As you can see, Wireshark is open and I have two instances. So I'm just going to close one of them for some reason. There we are. Let me just hit OK. And as you can see, this was the captured traffic that was we were able to get, which is fantastic. And uh, now with a tool like Wireshark, you can analyze the packets that you captured. All right, so that is going to be it for this video. In the next video, we'll be looking at network sniffing with Wireshark. So I hope you're excited and I'll be seeing you in the next video. Hello everyone and welcome to this video. In this video we're going to be looking at network sniffing with Wireshark. Alright, so you might be asking yourself, well what exactly is Wireshark? You showed us a bit of what it was in the previous video. So can you tell us what it is? Well Wireshark simply put is one of the best network sniffing tools out there. Alright, so its primary purpose is to monitor and to capture traffic and packets. Alright, on your network. So it is very very similar in terms of its functionality to what TCP dump does. Alright, but in this case it is the best. It is like the top of the line uh, piece of software that you use. You know, for example, it's a piece of software that almost every network administrator is supposed to know. All right. Now, one of the most important things that you need to understand about Wireshark is that it's a very complex tool in the sense that it's going to take a while to learn everything about Wireshark. But it's good to have an understanding of how it works and how to navigate around the interface. 
Okay, so in this video, I hope to cover a lot. For example, we're going to be looking at protocol filters, we'd be looking at IP filtering, etc, etc. Now, as I said, I'm not going to be able to cover everything in one video, Wireshark would require a course on its own. So I'm just going to try and do my best to give you everything in one big package. Alright, so let's get started. So what you want to do is, uh, and by the way, I forgot to tell you Wireshark is completely free and it comes pre-installed and pre-configured with Kali Linux. All right. So you don't need to do any downloading or installing. So uh, you can launch it uh, directly from your applications menu right here and you can just search for it and just type in Wireshark and just click on it and it's going to open up. Now, uh, if it gives you this little error, that's because you're running it from root. Don't worry if you're running it from root. This is just a small little warning that is giving you. So I'm just going to hit OK and we can enlarge it. All right, fantastic. Welcome to Wireshark. Now, as I said, it is a very, very advanced tool and there's a lot to look at. It can be really overwhelming, but don't worry about anything here, okay? It's a really, really simple tool when it comes down to doing what it's supposed to do, which is capturing traffic, okay? So the first thing it's gonna ask you is, it's gonna ask you to select the interface in which you want to start capturing your traffic. So what it's saying here is, what interface do you want to use to start capturing traffic? So do you want to use your ethernet, which in this case, we are going to use our ethernet because we don't have any other adapter. Or if you add your Wi-Fi adapter, you can also use that. So you can just click on ethernet right here and it's gonna give you this little chart here showing you that there is activity on the network. So I'm just gonna click on that and now it's going to start reading all the traffic on the network, all right, from all the devices. So as you can see, there's a lot of traffic being captured and uh, the information is displayed as follows. You have your time, your source, destination, the protocol, the length and the information about the traffic that is being sent to and from, all right? As you can see, you have information here. Now the interface is sorted in into these three sections. Here you have your scan results or the packets are being captured. You then have some information about each of the packets. So if I select the packet right here, you have uh, information about, uh, for example, let's look at a TCP or a UDP. Oh, we have an ERP request here. So as you can see, there we are. Uh, if we just click on this, if you look at the frame, it's going to give you information about the packet. And uh, again, this is more of an advanced feature that I'm not going to cover in this video because this is again going more into the speciality of Wireshark. All right, so that is how the interface works. Now, one of the most important things about Wireshark is to learn how to stop uh, and start, obviously, and restart a scan. So that can be done by going into the stop capturing packets. All right, now once you've stopped, you can also start again, and you can also click on this cog option to go into your capture options. Now your capture options allow you to select the interface you're using, your output, if you want to save it to an output. As you can see, you can use your pcap file here, which is awesome, and you can hit start. And uh, yeah, that's what lies in the capture interfaces option. All right, now going back to capturing packets, as you can see, there's a lot of packets that have been captured here. Now the most important thing to do is to learn how to sort them out depending on what type of uh, packets we want, uh, really. So as I said, this is one of the most important things that you need to learn in network sniffing is how to get what you want. All right, so let's say you were looking for TCP traffic. How would you do that? So Let's look at some of the protocol filters that we have. Now, your protocol filters, as we were looking at with TCP dump, they allow you to specify what type of traffic you want to go through. All right, so what I mean here is, let's say you only wanted to get TCP traffic like we used on TCP dump. Where would we do that? Well, it's really very simple. We just go to the display filter here and we just type in TCP. All right, and once we do that, we just hit enter and it's going to display all the TCP information here. All right, you're not going to find any other piece of uh well, any other protocol really. So uh, as you can see, you can scroll all the way down and you have your source IP addresses, the destination, etc., etc. All right, so that is really, really simple. You then have other protocols like the HTTP. All right, your HTTP protocol are, you know, self-explanatory. As you can see, we did not capture any HTTP protocols packets. So, you know, there we are. Uh, we At least we know that. The other protocol filter that you can use is um, UDP. Right, so UDP is pretty, pretty good. And again, it's used for applications, uh, you know, that need to uh, transfer information really, really quick. However, there, you know, the flaws of UDP are there, are that it, uh, there is a lot of packet loss. All right, so you can again, check for UDP packets and there you are. All right, so there's a lot of protocol filters that you can use. Now let's look at something which makes a little more sense. All right, and that is how to use IP filtering. 
right now ip filtering is simply as it states is sorting out the packets that you have captured in terms of the ip address so let's say you only wanted information or packets that were captured from the ip address uh you know 192.168.1.104 which is my windows operating system so to do that you go into your display you go into your filters section here and you just type in ip dot address all right uh, and you can see i've already been doing that so ip address and you use a space and you use your double equals and then you specify the ip address all right so 192.168.1.104 all right so i'm going to hit enter and as you can see now it's going to display packets that belong to the ip address 192.168.1.104 note you're still seeing packets like 192.168.1.103 that is because we've only selected packets that irregardless of of where they are going or coming their source or destination they're either going to our target ip or they're coming from all right now if you only want to get information regarding source and destination what we would do is we would say something like ip.source.src is equal to 192.168.1.104 all right and this would actually just give us the ip address from the source so if you click on it, as you can see, now the source is only 192.168.1.14. And from here onwards, you can see what the destination packets are and where they're going. So for example, you have the destination here, which is an external IP address. You have uh, one going to my other Windows workstation. And you might be asking yourself, well, why are they communicate with each other? That's because I run a local file server and they always communicate with each other because I'm constantly copying files, you know, back and forth. Okay. So as you can see, that is how to specify a source packets. Now you need to look at how to specify the destination packets. So uh, to do that is really very simple. We use the ip.dst or destination is equal to 192.168.1.104. All right. So I hope you're getting the idea here. It's really, really easy to customize your the network of the captured packets depending on how you want them. All right. Now, remember, we have currently stopped the sniffing process or the packet capturing process. That's because I wanted to show you that we can also go through the results that we have captured and we don't need to do it live. OK, so as you can see now, the destination IP address is uh, changed to uh, 192.168.1.104. And now you can see coming connections. For example, the source of this packet was from this IP, which is an external IP. And you get the idea. All right. So that is how to select your source and your destination packets, how to basically sort them uh, depending on the IP address you've chosen. And yeah, that is going to be it for this video. Now, before we go, I can just show you if you want to restart the packet uh, capturing process is going to prompt you here. Uh, do you want to save the captured packets before starting a new capture? You can go ahead and say save. All right. And it's going to save and it's going to prompt you where you want to save your packets, your captured packets. So I'm going to go into my root and my desktop and I can just call it um, results and I can save it as a PCAP file. So as you can see, you have different options here. I would recommend sticking with the default, which is the Wireshark TCP dump PCAP. I'm going to hit save and Voila, it saved the results.pcap. And now uh, it's going to start capturing new packets. Now, as you can see, it's currently using the filter that we selected and it's only going to capture information like that. Fantastic. So it can actually sort out the packets that you want in real time, which is awesome. All right. So that is going to be it for this video. I hope I covered enough to uh, get you started with how to use Wireshark and how to utilize it for network sniffing. In the next video, we'll get started with ARP spoofing, which is going to be really, really interesting. And we can perform a lot of cool stuff from there. All right. So I'll be seeing you in the next video. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to be looking at ARP spoofing with ARP spoof. All right. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, I've, I've heard of the ARP protocol. Uh, what is ARP spoofing? Well, the first thing you need to understand is the spoofing process. Right, so simply put, the spoofing process is simply impersonating a device on a network in order to get in the middle of the communication between the router, all right, and the device you are impersonating, all right. So we will be using ARP spoofing for this, all right. So this will allow us to tell the host or your target to send its traffic to us, all right. Now the reason it's going to send this tra its traffic to us is because we are going to be impersonating the router, all right. And then we are going to impersonate our target and tell the router to send the traffic or the packets back to the target. But the router thinks that we are the target and it sends the packets to us. And that way we are able to intercept the communication between the target and the router. And this is also known as a man in the middle attack, right? Because essentially speaking, you are a man in the middle between the communication between your target and the router or the access point. 
okay so we are going to be using a arp spoof all right so arp spoof is a fantastic tool that allows us to perform this now arp spoof is pre-installed on kali linux but if it's not it's part of a larger package called deansniff all right so you can just install that but by default it should be installed so update your repositories and your packages all right so now let's get started with the whole process of arp spoofing or arp spoof all right so Let's get started now. The first thing we need to do is we need to understand that we need to enable the flow of packets, all right? Or we need to forward packets. And this can be done really simply by opening up your terminal, right? So just open up your terminal. Now, essentially, many people usually perform this step at the very end after they've impersonated the router and they've impersonated their target. But I would consider it very, very important to do it before you start performing the RP spoofing attack, all right? So what you want to do is you want to use your system control. And we say we want to edit the W, uh, so we want to edit the net.ipv4. We want to forward uh, the flow of packets, so ipv4.ip, and we want to change this to IP forward, and the value should be equal to 1, all right? So we're allowing the flow of packets here. So I'm going to hit yet, enter, and this should be the result. All right, fantastic. Now we need to understand what we are doing. So the essential thing that we are trying to do is we are trying to intercept the packets, all right, of our target and the router. It gives us a much better position because now we can, in, once we inter, in, intercept the packets that are being sent from and to the router from our target, we can then get valuable information. All right. Now, what you do with that information, up to you. Uh, but I'm going to be explaining the process. So in this case, our target is going to be the Windows 7 virtual machine here. Now, you can use any operating system on even a mobile device if you want to. All right. And we're just going to be performing some simple browsing. So as you can see, here I have this browser, so we're going to be just browsing the, the latest, just be opening sites, and I'll explain how uh, everything is done. Okay, now the most important thing with the ARP spoof is you need to have multiple terminals open. All right, so the first step that we need to do is we need to tell the target that I am the router. All right, so we need to do that. So how do we do this? We do this with the ARP spoof, so ARP spoof. All right, and now we select the interface, which in this case is going to be uh, Ethernet 0, so that can be done with the command I and we select the interface. Now you can be doing this on Wi-Fi, so you'd select your wireless uh, interface, which in uh, most cases would be WLAN 0. All right, now we need to select our target IP address. All right, so we're gonna say T, uh, we use the T command, and now we need to enter our target IP address. So to do that, we can use net discover for network discovery, or I am just going to go into the Windows 7 uh, virtual machine, and I'm just gonna open up command prompt here. So I can get the IP address really, really quickly. All right. So IP config and there we are. The IP address is 192.168.1.102. Excellent. So we'll go back and add that. So we're adding the target address now. All right. And now we need to add our default gateway, which is the router's IP address. By default, you can check this by going into IF config. All right. So IF config and you can just look for your default gateway here. All right. So once you've got your default gateway, in most cases, it will be 192.168.1.1. All right, so that is your default gateway. Now, we are done with that. We can go back here and enter in our default gateway. So after you've entered in your target, you can enter in your router's IP address, which is the default gateway, 192.168.1.1. That is my router's uh, IP address. And now essentially what you're doing is you're telling the target that you are the router. All right, so once you've entered that, just hit enter and it's going to start the ARP spoof process. All right, now we need to open up another terminal and now we need to act as the router, all right? Or we need to act as the target, sorry about that. We need to tell the router that I am the target. So we can do this by going into ARP spoof, all right? And we can then select the interface, which is Ethernet 0, and we select our target, uh, or actually in this case, we select our target, which is the router IP address, which is 192.168.1.1, and then we select our targets uh, IP address which is 192.168.1.102 and once that is done all we need to do is we just need to hit enter and the ARP spoof uh, process is now uh, complete so if we open both of these terminals you can see that uh, they are now both um, impersonating each other and the flow of packets is we have enabled the flow of packets so now what we need we can do is we can analyze the packets that are being sent to and from the router and our target by using a tool like TCP dump, all right? So you can say TCP dump port 80, TCP dump port 80, so port 80, like so, and we just hit enter. Well, for some reason, uh, that is not really working. So I'm just gonna hit TCP dump, and we can just use the port 80, port 80, and there you are. So now it's going to list all the packets that are flowing to and from 
and as you can see we have captured packets uh, so these are the packets that are going to and from the router and our target and you can intercept them from here you can also use other network sniffing tools like wireshark for more of an advanced analysis of the packets that are going through and yeah that is how to perform uh, arp spoofing without spoof so i hope you really found value in this this is a very very powerful attack that you can use in the next video we'll be using etacap uh, to perform man in the middle attacks which is going to be much more advanced and you'll actually see it'll be much easier to capture packets or to perform the man in the middle process hello everyone and welcome to this video in this video we are going to be performing man in the middle attacks with etacap right so etacap is a fantastic tool for performing man in the middle attacks and the fantastic thing about etacap is that it provides you with a graphical user interface as opposed to the command line all right so etacap does have a command line based utility but the GUI version is really, really great, all right? And it is a fantastic alternative to ARP spoof, all right? So let's get started. So by default, as I said, it comes pre-installed with Kali Linux. So you can just launch it or you can search for it. So you can just hit Etter Cap, all right? And it's going to be the Etter Cap, Etter Cap Graphical, all right? So just click on that. And as you can see, welcome to Etter Cap. Uh, it has a fantastic logo that looks like a spider with a router on top of the spider. Fantastic. So, uh, well, it looks as dangerous as it is. Now, what do we need to do first? The first thing we need to do is we need to go into the sniff and we need to select unified sniffing and that's because we're using a virtual machine. So I'm going to hit unified sniffing and uh, it's going to ask you to select your network interface. So you can select your wireless interface if you're using one. Uh, since I'm using the ethernet uh, interface, I'm just going to hit ethernet zero and I'm going to hit okay. All right, so now it's going to start the unified sniffing. The next thing that we need to do is we need to go into our targets and we need to select targets, all right? Now, if you're going to selecting your target, you have the option of uh, selecting the MAC or the IP address, IPv6 address and the port, but that's the long way around it. What you can do is go into your targets and go into current targets, and now it's going to sort out your targets into two sections, similar to what we had with our spoof. On one side, you will have your, your access point or your router IP. On the second side, you will have your target IP address. Now, in this case, we are going to be performing the man in the middle attack uh, between our target, which is the Windows 7 operating system and our router. All right. So what we're going to do is this time I'm going to use Wireshark to show you that indeed it does record the packets that are being intercepted in terms of the man in the middle attack. So what we're going to do now is we want to go into our target one and we need to add our router IP address here, All right? So I'm going to hit add and I'm going to just add it. So 192.168.1.1. So that is your default gateway. The next uh, target two is where you add your target IP address, which in this case, as we did in the previous video, 192.168.1.102. All right. And we hit OK. So once we are done here, that's it. We essentially do not have to do anything else. What we now have to do is we need to go into man in the middle and we can select the ARP poisoning attack, all right, which is what ARP spoof was helping us to do. Uh, so once you're ready, just hit uh, ARP poisoning and just click on that. And now you want to make sure you select sniff remote connections. Make sure that is checked and just hit OK. And once that's done, as you can see, it's going to say uh, it's going to give you this little log here saying the ARP poisoning victims are group one, obviously which is the, the router IP address and group two, which is your target IP address. Okay, so essentially once that's done, you have essentially performed the ARP poisoning attack, or in this case, you have man in the middle access. So how do we actually monitor the packets? Well, I said in the previous video, we used TCP dump. In this video, we will be using Wireshark, All right? So just open up Wireshark and uh, I'm just gonna hit uh, okay. There we are. And we're just gonna open up ethernet zero. And uh, by default, now what we need to do is we need to go into Windows 7 and we need to just open up a web page here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go back into Kali Linux and I'm gonna, just going to add a filter here. I'm going to select HTTP and we're going to go back into Windows 7 and we're going to click on a site like Reddit and let's see if we were able to intercept. There we are. Fantastic. So as you can see, the source is 192.168.1.102. The destination is Reddit's IP address and so on and so forth, the sending of packets, uh, so on and uh, the sending of packets back and forth uh, from Reddit and our target. Now, in this case, we can see that the man in the middle attack was successful and we are able to intercept uh, the packets that are being sent to and from the router and our target, which is fantastic. So there you are. That is how to use Etacap to perform man in the middle attacks, more specifically the ARP poisoning attack to get us the man in the middle access. As you can see, uh, using Etacap, uh, the GUI version of Etacap is really fantastic because it's a much more easier for you to understand what's going on and you get a great user experience.
All right, that is going to be a wrap for section seven, where we looked at network sniffing and spoofing. So let us look at a summary of what we learned in this section. All right, so the first thing we learned was network discovery with NetDiscover. So NetDiscover was a fantastic tool that we used to discover the devices connected to our network. We then learned the basics of network sniffing and we started sniffing with a tool called TCP dump. All right, we then moved on to advanced network sniffing where we looked at how to use a, a tool called a Wireshark and we looked at IP protocols and filter protocols. We then moved on to the spoofing process where we learned what spoofing was and what the ARP protocol meant. And then we got started with ARP spoofing using a tool called ARP spoof to give us man in the middle access. All right, we then moved on to use a tool called Etacap that allowed us to perform the ARP poisoning attack that also gave us um, a man in the middle access and we were able to intercept packets between a target and the router. All right, so that is going to be it for this video and that is going to wrap up the course. Thank you so much for joining me in this course. I hope you've learned a lot about penetration testing and ethical hacking in this course and I wish you the very best. Goodbye.